Committee noon for our committee meeting. I've been joined by to my right, council member and our vice chair, Byron Amos, to my immediate left, council member Norwood, followed by council member Boone, and us four constitute a quorum. I will make a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second by council member Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. Please vote. Vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. The adoption of the agenda has been approved. I will make a motion to approve the meetings of the prior meeting. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. The minutes have been approved. Before we move to public comment, we do have a communication that we have to take uh, first to be respectful of someone's time, and that is item 22C5135, item number one under communications. If you could read that. A communication from Pierre Gaither, Executive Director of the Atlanta Board of Education, submitting the appointment of Chief Ronald Applin to serve as a member of the Public Safety Commission. Chief Applin, come to the podium and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your willingness to serve. Good afternoon. I am Ronald Applin, the Chief of Police for Atlanta Public Schools. I, am, I was born and raised in Atlanta. Um, I, I grew up in southwest Atlanta. I went to school in Atlanta. I went to Charles Lincoln Harper High School. I graduated from there. I attended Mercer University. I got my bachelor's degree. I attended Troy, Troy University, which was had a campus here in Atlanta. I had a master, got my master's degree. Um, started on my PhD in criminal justice. Got to dissertation, and I got this job. Didn't get a chance to finish it, but um, we'll get back to that. Um, I've been in law enforcement since 1989. I worked for the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, um, served in several capacities there. I was, my last position before I retired was um, the commander of the law enforcement division. Um, I left there. I spent a little time, stayed in, stayed in law enforcement, um, doing a lot of things with um, instructing and teaching. Um, I got started with this position in 2016, and I've been there ever since then. Um, been the best job I've had in the 32 years of law enforcement. Right, thank you, Chief. Yes. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Yes. Second by Council Member Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Four yeas, zero nays. The item is favorable. Thank you, Chief. This will move on to the Committee on Council and then the full Council, but you do not need to reappear. You will hear from our Municipal Clerk's Office uh, once this is confirmed. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. This time we have been joined by our Mayor, Honorable Andre Dickens, and would like to uh, speak to the Committee. Mayor Dickens, welcome. Good, good afternoon. Thank you, Councilmember Hillis. Thank you members of the city council and uh, the one or two people that applauded. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you for this opportunity to speak directly to the city council and uh, directly to the public safety committee. Uh, I am here because I take public safety very seriously. And rather than do a press conference to talk about public safety and to talk about all things, I decided to talk to my colleagues talk directly to you and also talk directly with the public in this process. Um, as you know, for years I sat beside you all right here in this seat, so I understand the challenges and dilemmas and the options that you weigh each and every day as you go about doing the great work of a city council person of this city. And I wanted to just share with you a lot of what's all happening and then later, of course, during your committee meeting, uh, Deputy Chief Peake will give you your, uh, your briefing that he does every two weeks along with Chief um, Interim Chief Shibum. So thus far, we have hired uh, over 100 police officers this year, and 155 of the, those uh, 155 individuals 
are in training right now towards our 250 goal. The homicide clearance rate in the city of Atlanta is 64 percent. The national average is 54 percent. And this weekend, we had a number of incidents that we want to talk directly about. Um, all summer, we've had a good summer, a good summer at our parks. Uh, it was a safe place to be. We opened all 12 swimming pools and made them free for the whole summer. We've had events after events after events. We've had midnight basketball. We've had police athletic league at Promise. We had a lot going on in our parks. But this week, as Councilmember Boone knows, I mean, last week on Tuesday, a murder happened in Wilson Mill Park, the park that we shared as a kids growing up. And then yesterday at Dunbar, we had essentially a mass shooting where six individuals were shot, uh, two are now deceased. And that happened at a city park uh, on a Sunday. That is alarming and disturbing. Uh, we have hosted several large-scale events in our city parks without incident. Um, and we know a lot of our parks are being used daily for a number of great activities, day and night. Um, and we have world-class parks, and we even have a new uh, commissioner of parks and recreation that has taken us to even higher heights. We've installed cameras in the parks. And we've tied, uh, tied those cameras to our real-time crime-fighting center so that we get on-time uh, on updates. We also are allocating today. You all will see and comment and vote on legislation to allocate $750,000 um, for post-certified officers to work in our city parks. So this is on top of our summer safety plan where we have officers in our parks. We are now adding that to, th that was just an implementation by the administration, but this is now putting $750,000 towards post-certified individuals to work in our parks to further keep our parks safe because we want those to be safe havens and active places for community. So just go through the data, the numbers. In 2021, we had 57 part one crimes by this time. Now we've had 49 at parks, and that's a 14% reduction year to date in crimes at parks. And I wanted to now go down the path of talking about youth, which is very near and dear to my heart and a very important part of all of our activity sets for moving Atlanta forward and also for public safety. The city's results from the summer youth engagement, the employment program. You will get those results as the summer is just now ending, but it's been a huge success, and from programs like Midnight Basketball. But since I'm talking specifically to the Public Safety Committee, I wanted to just tell you what youth activities have not occurred in our city due to us making sure that we had them on a positive path. In 2021, last year, there were 102 youth juvenile arrests. This year, only 80. That's a reduction of 22% in youth-related crime in our city this year to date. In 2021, just in June and July, and those are the months when youth are generally out of school. So in June and July last year, 34. This year, 23. That's a 32% reduction. We tie those things to the activities that we've done and with the community. The various things that we've done, like at Promise Center, midnight basketball, summer employment for the youth, and our water sales that we've, that we've tried to reduce as much as possible and push them into meaningful, helpful activities, that has resulted in this reduction in arrests and crime by youth. APD has seen a significant reduction in the calls for service regarding water sales in both the year-to-date and in the summer months. The reduction for this year uh, held through 8-1, uh, held through August 1st, there were 929 last year, 929 calls talking about water sales. We call them water boys, but a lot of them are adults or, bo or bo boys, men. 929 last year, 651 this year. That's a 35% reduction. In 2021, in just June and July, we had 327 calls for service. This year, 229. That's a 32.3% reduction. And that's just in June and July. 
So what we are putting in place, ladies and gentlemen, is working. It's working. We said that we had to have a balanced approach to crime, a balanced appro approach to public safety. We wanted to make sure that we had people give them opportunities, and that's what we did with the youth in this city. And when we do it for this city, pretty much we're doing it for the whole region. Because the individuals that come into our city to sell water or to do whatever, they may not be an APS student, uh, Chief Appling. They are coming because the opportunity is in Atlanta. But what we've done together is reduce crime and arrest for those youth because of putting them on the right path. We are arresting individuals that won't comply. And we are sending the youth to, to services that they need to be able to get into the proper position. And we're talking to parents about all of the activities that we have for their youth to be on the right path. Today, I want to now talk squarely and straightforward about ACDC, the Atlanta Detention Center. Over the course of the last week, several members of the city council, many of you took a tour of ACDC. And some of you have taken tours in years past, and, so, and then also you took tours of the Fulton County Jail this last week, and even some today. It is evident that there is a humanitarian need when you walk through that facility. We're not in the jailing business. That is not what Mayor Dickens wants to be in. I do not want to be in the jailing business. The city of Atlanta has the aforementioned things that we are focused on. However, when confronted with hundreds of men sleeping on the floor throughout the hallways, the humanitarian response to that is to do something. Do something immediately. We are not in the jailing business. I do not want to be in the jailing business for long. That is my personal constitution, and that is what I'm bringing to this administration. But nonetheless, we find, we find ourselves where we are today. There are severe penalties for any extension beyond the four-year extension that you see in the documentation that we provided today. We've baked into this ordinance into this offer four years and no more. Extreme penalties if, if anyone needs to stay any longer than that, if they want anyone to stay any longer than that. We will be out of the jail and business immediately. Revenue from that agreement will be used to fund our diversion and wraparound services, drug addiction, mental health, housing insecurity, homelessness, and of course, youth services and the general um, administration of the facility. There is no question, again, that I draw circles and I don't draw lines. I am trying to help us serve our population, all of our population in this region. Within this ACDC circle, there is a line that must be drawn, though. And that line is where the responsibility is for overcrowding. And that overcrowding is a county issue. It's a county issue. It's Fulton County's issue. The vision for repurposing ACDC has been set. I have heard from all 15 of our council members and the council president, and the agreement is reflective of what we all want to see. So the reason for 700 beds is that this is a humanitarian need. I came into this conversation with much less than 700 beds. Through conversations with you all, I got to 700 beds. This is because that's the need. I want it to be much less than that. But of course, the need has pushed us to where we find ourselves with a situation where there's women, 250, actually 300 women, more than 250 that that facility should have, 300 women on the south side, and now hundreds of individuals on the floor at Rice Street. More than 80% of the individuals at Fulton County's Rice Street facility are from Atlanta. The crimes occurred in the city of Atlanta. 80% of the individuals that are at Rice Street, the incident happened inside of our city limits. So regardless of what they may or may not have done, uh, they, are still hum they are still human beings, and this requires a humanitarian response. And our moral obligation is for everyone's health and well-being, regardless of the choices they may or may not have made. So now, once this is in place, should the council pass it, then we begin the process 
of having individuals come into ACDC at the same time we start the process of putting out a RFI, a request for your inquiries, request for individuals to companies to say, put their plans together for what the future of ACDC can be. Imagining from the documents that we've already put together in the past, start putting together the process for the financing of it, the architecture of it, the construction of it, and the operation of it. That is not a tomorrow turnkey operation. That takes time. That takes planning. That takes just as much planning as it would for us to build a new city hall, to build a new park. It doesn't happen in a week. It takes time. So therefore, this RFI gives us the opportunity to gain more community input, gain more city council input, and to go out there and, pre and present in four years, once we cut off this process of having uh, inmates at ACDC, then we turn ourselves into what the next future is, which is not with us in the jailing business. Now, I know there's, after that, there's an uh, additional piece of legislation as uh, Council Member Waits walks in. This is about her legislation. So it is my understanding that there are some additional legislation that's being introduced uh, by our great Council Member uh, that serves in the seat that I served in, Council Member Waits. And what I say is we've had a great conversation about it, and I am interested and encouraged by what she suggested. However, we have to wait, have this process take place first for that process to take place. Because if we're looking for the RFI, we want to make sure that we get the full, everything that we can, having her input in it, your input in it, all of the things that we want for the go forward plan for ACDC takes that into consideration. And so I think her legislation is a smart piece of legislation. I think that this comes first, then that. Therefore, you have the steps in the right order that we carry ourselves forward. Now, moving on. There are too many illegal guns on our streets. You know there are too many illegal guns when some individuals, well, everybody's talking about how many illegal guns there are. An overwhelming majority of homicides in Atlanta are linked to gangs, drugs, and the use of illegal, illegally held firearms. The vast majority of the perpetrators are repeat offenders. And so that's why we stood up the repeat offender tracking unit. So let's talk about crime in general in the city of Atlanta. Because when you read the news, when you watch the news, read the news, and get your social media, you would think that everything is on fire. That we are down in every category over the last 28-day period. We have had a three-week decline in crime. The One Safe City Plan is a whole-of-government approach to public safety in Atlanta. And we just launched a new website, onesafecity.com. So everyone listening can stay up to date on what we're doing to keep Atlanta safe. And the results of our efforts are on that website so far, onesafecity.com. So my message to the residents of Atlanta and the visitors is clear. Our city is open for business and enjoyment. You and your families are safe in Atlanta, and we are working across our government and our communities to invest in our policing and non-policing initiatives to protect and promote the quality of life in our city. I also have a clear message for those who want to perpetrate a crime in our city. If you pull a gun in this town, you are going to jail. We got a 64% clearance rate and I'm really, really hopeful. And it's better than the national average, but it's my hope it gets even higher. You pull a gun in this town, you go to jail. If you're a gang leader, you will be caught and you will be held accountable. And finally, if you're carrying an, an illegal firearm, you will face the consequences. So far this year, we've we seized thousands of illegal firearms already this year. And that continues. We find them over and over and over again. And those are the same guns that are used in robberies, burglaries, shootings, aggravated assaults, and also homicides. So we know who our adversary is. It's gangs, it's guns, it's 
illegal firearms, and it's repeat offenders, violent repeat offenders. When argument happens, people are choosing guns instead of their words to solve these problems. Anger and a gun is a bad combination right now all across America. Anger and a gun has led to people killing their loved ones, their family members, their friends. We even had a senior high rise, a senior citizen killed the lease in the office agent, then went across the street and killed himself. Anger. So we have a lot of resources in this city right now. Our Office of Violence Reduction is at our disposal, Ms. Jacquel Clemens. We have clergy that is willing to talk to every community member, every nonprofit organization, how we can engage on de-escalation, on conflict resolution. Because most of the crimes that we're seeing that are leading to homicides, a lot of them are the inability for people to resolve their conflicts. But when we talk about these other property crimes, we are talking about violent repeat offenders. So modern, effective policing, repeat offender tracking unit, the summer safety plan, the summer heat wave, which you guys get reports on that we are, I mean, a whole lot of guns and a lot of drugs are being, um, are being captured because of that. We got mounted patrols, FUSIS, the Connect Atlanta camera network, public safety training center, community-based policing, supporting police personnel, hiring 250 officers, providing raises and bonuses to retain our, all of our public safety uh, staff, and good police leadership. Those are the things that we've been using to reduce crime in our city. The non-police interventions. We have violence reduction initiatives, diversion programs, the nightlife division that we've stood up, and our nightlife advisory council. Midnight basketball, the light of the night campaign. We're now at almost our halfway mark on all of the 10,000 cameras, that, I mean, lights that we're installing. The at promise centers, housing interventions, like what we're doing at uh, placing people from Forest Cove into safe and secure housing, summer youth employment program, our re-entry job programs. And just last week, I visited the ATF, the Atlanta Field Office for uh, the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and I met with their special agent in charge. We also started Atlanta Fulton County Court Watch. We've been aggressive against gangs, and we have good state and federal partnerships. Together, the community is empowered to help us. That's where the violence reduction comes from, the engagement with the nightlife and our Atlanta court watch. We've had the world's largest 10K Peachtree Road race go down without incident. Three days of Jazz Fest, 70,000 people in our city park, no issue. Our West Side Park, our Cook Park, these parks, all these activities are going on without issue restaurants and people are going places each and every day being safe. We are on our way to making sure we prove to everyone that we are a safe city. One to one and a half million people go to Lenox and Phillips Plaza every single month and we haven't had one violent incident in 2022 at those places. Over and over again where large gatherings are, we are safe. So what we saw yesterday was a lot of things that I wish we did not have in this city. But I also want to make sure when they put a microphone in your face and try to scare you into believing that this is an unsafe city, the fortitude of a council member and the administration knows the difference. Now, the last couple of things I'll talk about is nuisance properties. Nuisance properties must be resolved. And those are not just bars and nightclubs. It could be any person at any place that this place feels unsafe. In fact, we're also seeing results from our nightlife, uh, our nightlife division, and our nightlife advisory council. We have held two quarterly meetings, our training days already, and we've had other meetings with the nightlife team, uh, about three of them over the last three weeks, to make sure we talk about nightlife and ways to improve it. Communications with our nightlife leaders have gone a very long way. Now that we have all the right departments at the table, including police, fire, the solicitor's office, planning, watershed, and others, we're able to address some of the bad actors much more quickly than we were a, a, just a half year ago. So we now know how to differentiate and how to make sure that bad actors become good actors or bad actors that want to stay bad actors are eliminated from being able to have the permission to operate in our city. 
It is not a right. It is a permission. That's what a permit is. And so the good actors can continue to operate. And so the solicitor's office continues to bring charges against problematic properties, and either the property owners are kicking the tenants out and locking up their doors, or we are locking their doors for them. We want to make sure that everyone have safe experiences at our, at our restaurants, at our bars, at our clubs, at our gas stations, convenience stores, nuisance properties. It's not just nightlife. It's any nuisance property. So I'm agnostic to whatever you guys choose. You do two incidents in 24 months, that's your decision. We can talk about it with the committee, with the team of people at the Nightlife Advisory Council. If it's four in 24 months, if it's three in 18 months, all of those are up for discussion. And the Nightlife Advisory Committee, they are going to meet on Thursday and, and have 100% attendance. And the Nightlife Advisory team, by the way, is everybody from operators like Live Nation to Blue Flame. Operators, as well as promoters, as well as lawyers, as well as individuals that are property owners, all of them are a part of the Nightlife Advisory Council. But again, this nuisance property um, legislation that, I'm, that, I, that, that I think I'm, that you guys have before you today, that uh, from what I can tell in that ordinance, you're talking about nuisance properties, not just nightlife. And so. I came here in support of y'all making sure that you work together with the advisory council, the advisory team. They're going to meet on Thursday. Um, and you guys work out. Two and 24, three and 18. I, those are the, those, that's where government gets to make the difference in how we communicate with the public and understand what's the best. But what we do want is to make sure that operators operate the right way and that bad actors get dealt with in a way that either makes them become good actors or they act in somebody else's jurisdiction and not ours. So I'll pause there and just say thank you to my colleagues. Again, I wanted to go over public safety. Mr. Hillis, uh, Chairman Hillis, you and I both have served on public safety for many years. When I was a city council member and I had the honor and privilege to serve as the chairman um, in 2017. And I didn't want to do a press conference or anything where I'm talking to folks and you're not in the room. I wanted to make sure I talked to the city council about the things that's going on. And also, I know I have friends, neighbors, colleagues, um, and, 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 and folks that, are, and community members that are in this room, and they have concerns and input on all of it. And my team that's behind me, everybody from the COO, the chief of staff, the uh, senior advisor, to police officials, to nightlife coordinator, coordinator, to the film and entertainment office, the deputy COOs, to all of the above, police, fire, we stand here with you. We stand with the citizens of Atlanta, and we plan to continue to get it right. As you've seen, those numbers go down. Um, we we, we, we want to continue in that um, path and that trajectory. Today you have... Uh, some pieces of legislation before you. The council, uh, you have an awesome role to play. My administration has voiced our support of the ones that we want to see move forward today and the ones that um, we want more time to discuss. We've shared those with you as well. We hope you um, work with us on this. Thank you so much. Council members, I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mayor Dickens. Anyone? Uh, council Member Boone. Also, as the mayor acknowledged, we have been joined by Council Member Waits a member of this committee, and then also uh, Council Member Antonio Lewis. Council Member Boone. Yes, Mr. Mayor, um, thank you so much for your support um, during the incident at Wilson Mill Park. And I want to publicly thank the Chief um, of Police um, for coming out, walking with the neighbors and talking with them. Um, within 24 hours, he was on the ground. Uh, Ms. Burks, Mr. Otta, thank you all also for your concern. And it's unfortunate that that happened um, in southwest Atlanta. That's a very quiet park. And we look forward to working with you all so that that park can return to safety. Again, thank you um, for your support for that community. Thank you. Councilmember Byrne. Councilmember Waits. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for taking the time out of your calendar to join us. As you know, we have met uh, and discussed our concerns with respect to the jail issue, and I think that uh, we know where we both stand on that. But with respect to the nuisance law, 
Uh, I originally was a signer on this particular piece of legislation for the same reasons that you have eloquently spoke of today. And I think the headlines in the news speak to the fact that we need to do something. The phone calls that I have received, and I'm pretty sure most of us in the room have received, are with respect to properties that are located in districts that uh, are pro-development, meaning they feel that they have been somehow harassed by individuals who are utilizing this as a tool uh, to put them out of business. So I'm not here to speak to whether or not that is true or not. But for me, that gives me pause in terms of making sure that this legislation does not have unintended consequences. So I won't be labor because I know people are waiting for public comment, but I will say this. Uh, I believe that there was a mugging in Lenox Square Mall this weekend. And my feeling is that when it comes to Lenox Square Mall, they're not going to be treated as a bad actor, meaning they are a business that is operating and things around them happen. I, I, I didn't need the, the claps up I, because the mayor also understands both sides of the issue. But, but we, this is a complex situation, and what I believe is that, that we need to figure out how we protect those small mom and pop business owners, uh, because my feeling is that this particular tool may be weaponized against them, and they don't have the high-powered attorneys to protect themselves. And so for that reason, so I am a no only for that reason, but I will say to you, for that reason, I also signed on because I agree with you that we have some very serious challenges, and your presence here means a lot to me today. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Waits, for for, uh, all of that because I, I, um, you know, I value your input and that's why we meet and share ideas often. Um, and so to go to all of that, so specifically, it's nuisance properties. It's not just nightlife. In fact, our nightlife activities, since we've put in place the nightlife division, we've gone out and done a number of assessments of properties, north, south, east, and west, um, go on to these establishments, help them with their safety plans, help them look at their lighting, their cameras. What are their de-escalation um, uh, procedures? What are their procedures if a mass shooting occurs? Many of them have been grateful for the assistance of police and fire and, and knowledgeable uh, subject matter experts coming in there and helping them fortify their places of business so that people can enjoy them but go home safe. And a lot of times they're thinking about the patrons, but also their staff. They're thinking about how to do, you know, how to manage all of that. And so I'm happy with the progress of the nightlife division because we've seen a significant reduction in crimes that have occurred at nightlife, notwithstanding one or two very notable incidents that have happened. But we went about 45 to 60 days without one incident happening at our nightlife establishments. I'm proud of that. That's not meaning that we're coming to penalize that. We're coming to lock arms and partner with that. So therefore, those individuals that are calling saying this is the right direction, they're showing up to the training day to get training on how to work with neighborhoods. Because that's also part of the training is neighborhoods call and say you're too noisy, how to deal with that. Neighborhoods call and say can you use the patio, can you not. All those things, we're helping nightlife establishments in that regard. And also how to protect your property with APD or with private security. What is the right number of people for your configuration? All that is in the works to be a partner with nightlife, and that partnering has led to a reduction in crimes at nightlife establishments. I stand here saying we are on the right path. Nuisance properties are every type of property, as you mentioned. If Lenox Mall has 50 incidents or 40 incidents or two in 24 months, as you would suggest, whatever you come up with as the rule, that rule is established for every operator. And so does the appeals process and the, re um, I would say, the uh, restoration process. It is not to simply th th lock you up and throw away the key, so to speak, and cancel your business. It is to... Make sure that if you are not in compliance with the rules, you have to set aside time to get into compliance with the rules. That could be a shutdown for X number of days that we all should discuss. That's the work of the council and, and the administration. Is it 30 days? Is it 10 days? Is it 45 days? That is the work of us to decide how long you need to sit down because people are dying in your facility or people are getting shot in your facility. That is called decency and respect for victims. Conversation throughout this public safety committee has to use the word victim every now and then. 
There is a such thing as a victim. And so a victim that happens twice in a month or twice in whatever number we come up with, they have rights. They need to see justice occur too. And so when we see a bad actor, whether it's Linux or not, whether it's name your favorite hotel that may have something going on and something happened, they have to come sit before a body and explain themselves and say what or is there a way to get back on track. That's what, that's what my understanding of your legislation is, right? So with that, it's not to hurt mom and pops and keep the non-mom and pops going. It is a process. And so if the Chevron in District 12 continues to have shootings at it, I don't care who owns it. It's time out for that Chevron. Because there's a victim on the other end, Council Member Waits. Right? And there are people who are victims because they feel unsafe going to that Chevron. So you victimize what you got shot. You victimize because you live in a food desert and you can't go to the Chevron because folks getting shot. I don't care if you're a mom, pop, or a conglomerate. The truth of the matter is in our city, it got to stop. That's how we vote. We vote on stopping things that we don't want in this city. We don't, we don't do that. Figure which way the wind blows. We got to stop the foolishness in our city. So if it's a Chevron that's owned by 10 or if it's a Chevron owned by one, I don't care. If a grandma got shot there my first month on the job and somebody gets shot there this month, I think the council got something to say about that. Or should. And then we got to sit them down and talk to that operator. And they, and they stop for a few, how many days we come up with? That's my answer. Councilmember Lewis. Thank you again, Mayor. Uh, I'm not on this committee, but I, I thought it was important to be here today, uh, just as you did, so I appreciate you for coming. Um, thank you for coming to speak to Council. I appreciate you for drawing circles. I always tell you, you draw circles. Um, but I'm a person who draw half circles, right? I haven't gotten there yet. I'm, I haven't <laughs> aged to the point where I draw full circles yet, right, around the lines. So you move in good faith, and I always tell people you're a deacon. I always say he's a deacon, so you got to remember that portion, right? But when we're moving with, uh, you have a well-developed plan to move out of the jail lease in four years. Uh, last week when I met with the sheriff, his plan was not the same. And so I want to see the sheriff move out of the jail. He won't, uh, the same way, the, the same kind of plan as he have it, to move in, he has a plan to ramp up. Like he won't just put 700 people in the jail overnight. He's going to get there over time. He won't just put all of his sheriffs in that jail overnight. He's going to get there over time. I want to see uh, if it's a one-year plan to move to 700 beds, I want to see a one-year plan to move out. Uh, I want to see that same intention uh, up front. And so that's why I would like more time on that jail uh, because, once again, I know you move in good faith, and I always make sure I say you're a deacon. <laughs> but I know I want to see the same type of intention to move into the jail to get to 700. I want to see him move down to zero the same exact way. I want to see that same plan on day, you know, before yeah. I give a vote, okay. like you would, uh, engineer deacon, uh, mayor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lewis, you are uh, astute. And um, uh, you know, a, a great, um, a, a great person at bringing the whole picture into play. A lot of times, you do that well, and I appreciate you for that. So, one clear statement: I ain't no sheriff of the city of Atlanta. We got a chief, we have a mayor. So that sheriff, where his thoughts are, he can he can he can share them with you. He can highlight them to you. He can put them on the news. Um, but we make the decisions around here. Full stop. He couldn't get to 700 like that. He's got to hire staff to be able to manage 700 people. So to get to 700, you have to hire. You have to manage. So it is a ramp up. And... So the first phase, um, and, and um, Ms. Burst behind me can make sure I'm right, the 250 women that are down, well, it's actually 300 now. So, so you start moving, so you ramp up, and then the ramp down is 
according to how well we are going to require them to improve their full criminal justice process. There's a solicitor, there's a district attorney, and there are judges. People should be moving through these processes a lot faster so that we don't have individuals in the jail for years on years on years waiting trial. That, in and of itself, is why we have an overcrowding issue. It ain't our fault, but it is our problem. We can't shirk away from the problem just because it's not our fault. The more we keep thinking that they tell us what to do, that's not how that's solved. What we're putting inside of this is a conversation about in four years, they resolve that issue of the, the judges, which we need to talk about, and how many cases they can see in a year. Um, and that's a, that, 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 we, we're starting to force that hand. I just wanted to make that clear. And I ain't even want you to go that far into detail. See, I appreciate you for uh, drawing the full circle again. <laughs> I know. I went a little far, but everybody here us, needs to know. And you gave us, uh, you, you talked, your plan, what you just gave was part of what I wanted to hear about how we get out of there because yeah. uh, just ramping up cases as well. Uh, like, like even God said something about the sheriff. It's his job to find beds for folks that are sleeping on the floor. Right. I got friends sleeping on the floor. And so... And when I saw those crates and I saw folks sleeping in those crates and I was able to go to ACDC and I seen the difference. I mean, I just want to make sure that the sheriff understands your vision because I'm team you. Right. I just want to make sure that happens. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Any other council members? Uh, Mayor, thank you. I will just briefly speak on the nuisance ordinance. Um, so that was my legislation that I work with your administration, uh, Mr. Donald on, so I appreciate that. And similar to your point, my goal in that, and my hope is I don't want this city to shut down anyone because I want them to work with us to better their problems that are contributing to crime. Um, just as an example, yesterday I reached out to you, I reached out to an owner uh, of a multifamily property because um, I was concerned about the crime. They had a homicide and had multiple part one crimes on, in their community that's been open less than eight months. So we're working to set up a meeting with them to see how we can help and how they can help their situation. So the goal is to not shut down anyone. Uh, the city has already shut down six businesses without this ordinance. We will continue to work that path with the bad actors who do not want to work with us. So I uh, just wanted to uh, give that two cents in and thank you again uh, for coming to address the Public Safety Committee. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hillis. And, and um, I'll get out of y'all way. I did want to just say, one, we have the uh, Nightlife Advisory uh, Council. Um, a lot of those individuals are, you know, folks that you can reach out to and talk to. They are meeting on Thursday. And, you know, we'd be happy to have your input on that. Um, they are going to help, you know, come up with ideas with you guys on timelines and number of dates, uh, you know, how many, you know, how many uh, it, within a certain period of time. And then, you know, what's the uh, correction process, the curing process. Um, and so, you know, but also be reminded that you all, along with us, put $20 million in the hands of small businesses plus $10 million for the resurgence grant, plus more and more money from this administration for small businesses um, over and over again. We're showing our commitment as a previous small business owner of a retail location. I understand uh, the challenges of being a small business owner, but also that through our support financially and Invest Atlanta and others, we have support for them. Um, but as far as nuisances are concerned, that's a problem for all of us if they don't get into right standing, um, no matter if they're small, medium, or large. Uh, we want to make sure that people operate with their permit, permission that is granted, that they operate uh, at the standard that every citizen deserves. Um, so thank you all. Take care. Thank you, Mayor Dickens. And on the point of the just to. On the point of the nuisance legislation, just wanted to let people know if there's anyone here to comment. The intent of myself as the author is to hold that legislation pending the meeting uh, of the Nightlife Advisory Council that Mayor Dickens uh, mentioned. Uh, so that is going to be held today. 
<laughs> so at this point, I will first recognize we've been joined by Council Member Michael Gillian Bond. Welcome. And now we will move on to public comment, and I will first call up uh, Fulton County Commissioner Natalie Hall. Good afternoon. I'm a little bit hoarse, and I can't speak as loud as the mayor, but I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Thank you, Mayor Dickens, for drawing those circles of inclusion. That's one of the reasons why I'm here today, and thank you to the Atlanta City Council for allowing me to speak directly following the mayor and his words of encouragement. I'm your Fulton County Commissioner of District 4, Natalie Hall, the Fearless Four. And with me today, I have Michael Schultz, the Deputy Chief of Staff to sure. Fulton County Sheriff Patrick Pat Labatt, and my Chief of Staff, Anita Harris. So there are two reasons why I'm here today. One is because of the ordinance that was introduced by, I don't see him, um, oh, M Michael Julian Bond. And the second is the resolution introduced by Keisha Sean Waits. And I'm here to tell you that we need both of them. And the reason why we need both of them is because of the overcrowding in the Fulton County Jail. As a mother of two adult sons, and many of us who are parents know that we never want to get that phone call that our child is being taken to the Fulton County Jail. And for those of us who have loved ones who live in Fulton County, you never want to get that call that a loved one is in the Fulton County Jail. But even beyond that, because of the conditions within the Fulton County Jail, you don't want to ever have any loved one or yourself be locked up in the Fulton County Jail. It is an inhumane environment. The overcrowding is just only one part of it. The jail is old. If you walk, many of you walk through the jail. I was told that uh, the sheriff actually um, had you tour the jail and you were able to see these conditions. It is horrific. And I don't care if somebody is in the jail, locked up, they should still be treated humanely. They should still be treated as a human being. So the current conditions in the jail are indecent. As you know, we have a mental ward in the jail, which is separate from the main population, the general population, but the general population is just as bad because we don't have enough room for all of those who are diagnosed by the psychiatrists and psychologists as needing to be in the mental ward of the jail. And, and let's just address this, this 350 number because I keep hearing this number of 350. Well, that 350 number comes from the number of misdemeanors that are in the jail. And let me just break that 350 number down. None of those 350 misdemeanors can be released out onto the street because 252 of them have additional charges that keep them in the jail. 134 of them have mental issues and then there are those that the judges sentenced and said no they cannot be released from the jail because of the things that they have done so we're not holding anyone in the jail that isn't supposed to be there so i want to make that very clear now as far as council member waits council member bond your ordinance, your resolution, I agree with both of them. But we need the 700 beds. We have people sleeping in boats. We have things going on in the jail that by law I cannot even express to you publicly. 
I cannot even show you publicly by law. And this is the reason that we need the 700 beds. Now, someone said earlier something about decreasing the number of beds that we lease from you, from ACDC. That can happen because the Board of Commissioners approved a feasibility study for us to know how much would it cost and what would it take for us to renovate the current jail or what would it cost for us to build a new jail. And once we get that at the end of the year, we'll be able to make a decision on how to move forward. We are going to make sure that we have a jail that is clean, that ha provides adequate services and programs so that people can leave that jail successfully. Not to continue, not for reentry. We are going to make sure that pre-arrest diversion works. I believe in that center, that John Robert Lewis Center for Equity. I believe in that. And as a commissioner, I've always fought for that. Devin Barrington Ward, I saw you here somewhere. I don't, are you behind me now? Devin has met with me and Zochi, Brevera, and Marilyn Wynn, and so many others for the past five years that I've been commissioner. And then before that, with the late county commissioner, Joan P. Garner, who I was chief of staff to for the six years that she was in this seat. And we have discussed pre-arrest diversion on many occasions. We have expressed our support and that we are thinking the same. We need to provide wraparound services for people. People should not be locked up in jail just because they have mental and behavioral health issues. And to our residents, please, Please stop being angry with the mayor and the members of the Atlanta City Council for not providing you with health and human services. It is not their responsibility by law. By law, the state mandates the county, Fulton County, to provide health and human services. And believe you me, we get millions and millions of federal and state dollars to do so. And that is why Fulton County is known as having the best programs and services in the state of Georgia, better than any county in this state. And so the collaboration is key. That is why I'm here. That is why I've talked to you. I've talked to pretty much everyone on this, this council because collaboration between Fulton County and the city of Atlanta is a must because we have the services and programs that you're all looking for in your communities to ensure that you're successful, the youth are successful, seniors, low-income families. Yes, we have housing. We have a workforce development department that provides jobs and jobs training. We have Fulton Fresh, which, which helps with those food deserts. And yes, for those of you who think that I don't have food deserts in my district just because I serve the city of Atlanta, I do have food deserts. That is any community that doesn't have a fresh produce grocery store within a one mile radius of their home. And there are many of them. So today I am pleading with you and I'm begging you, as the mayor said, for a humanitarian response that you all will come together and offer the beds that we need to relieve the crowding and the inhumane conditions in the jail, but to also work toward creating that center of equity. And we would love to be a partner with you to ensure that those services and programs are provided. And let's save some money. Why in the world would we double dip in our money and have you provide services and programs that we're mandated by the state to provide anyway? Save that money and give back to the community where the money belongs. It's their money. But we have to work together and we have to collaborate and we have to communicate. And I look forward to speaking with you in executive session.
Thank you so much. And thank you for your humanitarian response in advance. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner Hall. And just a correction to my previous statement. Uh, Commissioner Hall's comments fall under Section 2-105 of our city code, which are statements by elected officials, and they are awarded 10 minutes. Uh, so next, we will be moving to our public comment agenda. Thank you, thank you again, Commissioner Hall. Public comment. First, we have Sarah Kim. Hello. Sarah O. Kim here from Arbor ATL on Edgewood Avenue. Thank you all for yet another opportunity to speak. I would like to use this time to elaborate further on the few points I had raised last week. I urge the council members here to please take the time into consideration prior to making your decisions. First, the wording of this ordinance has been crafted to place the entirety of blame for rising crime on the backs of business owners and community leaders, when in fact we've pleaded with the city for years to reduce crime and give support for better patron experiences. One proposed remedy among many had been to create a pedestrian only zone, AKA an official nightlife district, similar to what we had been implemented successfully in other major cities. As such, this ordinance has been worded in a way that misleads the public and ignores the many years of pleading and requests for assistance from businesses to the city that have gone unanswered. Second, the apparent existence of a hidden watch list and nuisance list is alarming and concerning. It seems to imply an unwillingness to work with businesses fairly and without favoritism to large corporations and chains. Without these secret lists being made accessible to the public and updated at least weekly, how do you expect to demonstrate proper accountability and due process? This would at least mitigate the risk of the bad actors slipping through as a result of racism, corruption, and other biases. At the same time, this also gives responsible parties the opportunity to proactively address their issues. Third, this one-size-fits-all punishment that the ordinance seeks to use is so drastic and crude that it seems to consider all violations the same with zero context to extenuating circumstance. Can the city council members please take the time to consider and implement a sliding scale system for new, with more nuance? Since this ordinance seems to be handing the city a very big hammer, I'm deeply worried that all the small businesses will just start looking like nails. Fourth, at what point has the business done enough? I understand that this is, that to define this standard, Excuse me. At what point has the business done enough? I understand that this may be hard to determine, but this ordinance fails to appreciate that most businesses are victims of the city's rising crimes themselves. Perhaps some businesses are indeed not doing enough, but that city needs to define that standard and hold to it in order for a fair social contract to take place between the city and its many hardworking business owners. Right now, businesses are just left holding the bag every single time, whether we did enough or not, whether the crime was enough or not, whether the crime was our fault or not. Can we agree that a business should not be held accountable for violence that can't be directly and reasonably traced to it? Just because it's the easy thing to do does not mean that it should be done when public safety and people's livelihoods are both on the line. Fifth, I learned at the last public safety meeting that the solicitor's office will perform a thorough investigation to determine if a property meets this nuisance requirements. With that said, when is the last time any of those officials walked or patronized any of the city's multiple nightlife areas after midnight on a Saturday night? I question how, with their lack of experience of Atlanta's nightlife culture, we can expect them to fairly and thoroughly understand and judge Thank these you. cases. Time has Next is Brother Anthony Muhammad. My art hotel that she as she and as she. I am Brother Anthony Muhammad. I am a spiritual man. I do no more believe in religion. I have no need for religion. Simply say, not one person in your book of the Bible, in all 66 books, not one person was born from a woman womb canal. Not one. I come here today to applaud the mayor, as I was watching George Gaines 
it is said that the city council, along with the mayor, contemplating a line of jail during this time of emergency with Fulton County to make rules for those dark people, majority of people in jail in the state of Georgia. Georgia, the fourth largest institution of dark people in the United States of America. But I ask this, why is it, as I heard Ms. Kawanza, Kawanza Hall where I make a comment, let's be human. We are the most warrior people on earth, dark people. We have an ancestry that was people able to do telepathology. They were able to breathe on the water. They created the civilization of all the earth. And here in 2022, we are the last person on earth to have access to economic empowerment. If you recall Queen Elizabeth in 1952 when you was installed, you was installed and you was given a right and power over 90% of the dark people, economic empowerment on the earth. I was born in 1952. So I'm asking you, members of this council, let's look towards the people that you say are nobody, never been nobody. Did you know you're looking at a warrior, Chief? Because I'm dark. I'm what you put up under that airplane. I'm the greatest conductor of energy in the world on earth. What is energy? 99.99% are we. And less than 1% is physical matter. But I call on the ancestors. I call on the Father to teach my soul consciousness every day. I want you to know our people have to wake up to the knowledge they are the power. You have a 306 degrees access to power. But you got to be taught that you got to know your ancestors and know how they was working in unison with the Ma'at principles. Modern principles represent balance in the universe. But you can't continue to go along with this made-up world. And everything you want to do, you can do it. And I'm going to end it with this. Please, I have a problem with the chief. I have a problem in my neighborhood because of dogs not being on a lease. Thank you. Your time has expired. I thank you for telling me my time is uh, Mr. So well, I appreciate the opportunity to joined by Councilmember Bakhtiari. I greet you as I come. Assalamu alaikum. Mayak Matriot Hotel. Next speaker is Lauren Knight. Good afternoon. I would like to delegate my time to Sarah Kim. Thank you. Fifth, I learned in the last public safety meeting that the solicitor's office will perform a thorough investigation to determine if a property meets the nuisance requirements. With that said, when is the last time any of those officials walked or patronized any of the city's multiple nightlife areas after midnight on a Saturday night? I question how, with their lack of experience of Atlanta nightlife culture, we can expect them to fairly and thoroughly understand and judge these cases. I am worried that they will unduly fear what they do not understand. Six, can we count on the solicitor's office to keep that same energy towards investigating the many illegal street food and alcohol vendors that are active around the city? Can we agree that these illegal street vendors are a public nuisance and getting them off the street can offer an immediate positive impact on public safety? Why target brick and mortar businesses who have gone through the permitting and the steps when there are so many irresponsible actors with zero training, accountability, and no oversight offering questionable food and alcohol to the public? Seventh, since this ordinance is pushing the responsibility of public safety within four feet, including on public sidewalks and streets, to private businesses, how will code enforcement identify and distinguish when the city has failed its own public safety responsibility beyond the four feet when an incident happens? How exactly does this address the issues of loiterers, the illegal street vendors, large gatherings, car clubs, and other bad actors who are who operate beyond the four feet while their activities might or might not encroach this imaginary four foot boundary. If unruly customers are kicked out of establishments but they stay outside and loiter, what do you officially recommend businesses to do? If they're angry enough to go back to their car parked on a city street to retrieve a weapon, how is that the responsibility of the business? At what point can we all agree that the lack of APD street presence and foot patrols has failed to deter crime? Eighth, this ordinance will only increase the use of 
in increase the use and importance of off-duty cops as security for private businesses. This is not only expensive for businesses, but a problematic trend overall. Let alone our own 35% rate of success when hiring off-duty officers, what more do you expect and de facto force businesses to do in order to uphold an arbitrary standard of quasi-public safety? This ordinance will only accelerate the use of off-duty cops for security, if only to serve as a safety blanket against the indiscriminate use of this ordinance. So will the city at least streamline and standardize this complicated and expensive process for retaining off retaining off-duty APD services? Ninth, what is the process for re rehabilitation in the event a business is determined to be a nuisance? What type of financial support will the city provide over the 12 months, and how will it be established? If the ordinance is truly focused on creating a safer and better Atlanta, it should focus on supporting and nurturing small business and minority owned businesses by offering them recourse, alternatives, and a way forward. Tenth and lastly, I'm a small business owner and a first time business owner, and I do not own the building I am a tenant in. This is the case for most small businesses in the city. Even with the amendment to notify both the landlord and the tenant, we can amend the ordinance to ensure that the landlord cannot weaponize it to threaten or even evict their tenants for their own financial gain. I would like to conclude by acknowledging how thankful I am for the opportunity to bring to you my concerns before you all and the work that the City Council has done and continues to do in their Tom efforts to start. create this better and safer Atlanta. Yeah. Thank you. Next is Travis Lee. Travis Lee. Bikina Turner. Shakina Turner, Rashad Robertson, Good afternoon. My name is Rashad. I'm here with Hilliard Starkey Law. I actually wanted to yield my time to Attorney Hilliard. Good afternoon, uh, new Chairman uh, Hillis, members of the committee. I'm Hakeem Hilliard with Hilliard Starkey Law. Good to be with you this afternoon. Um, appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about this nuisance legislation again. And Chairman Hillis, I think it's uh, appreciate your uh, deferral of this action until the Nightlife Committee has a chance to meet. I think that's the right decision, and we appreciate that a great deal. I wanted just to share a couple of comments, and I'll be brief and kind of save the balance for that discussion that's happening later this week. Um, but I wanted to talk for a brief moment about the original ordinance that was adopted in, in, in uh, March or May of 2021 when you added these nuisance properties and establishments like this to the, to the definition of nuisance in the city ordinance for the first time. Uh, since that time, uh, as has been testified to previously, is there's been, I think, eight, eight businesses that have been set, set down pursuant to that ordinance. There's several others that are in the pipeline that have been served that are waiting for their hearings to take place. And then there's another list, I understand, that is, they say it's confidential, but as prosecutors, I think they don't want to disclose. But there's another list of, uh, of businesses to be served. So the current ordinance appears to be working to the city's satisfaction, as the mayor testified to earlier. Uh, and so we, there's, a, there's a little bit of confusion as to why we are proposing this amendment uh, to the ordinance that says t two violent incidents in a 24-month period. It's not just that it's those two incidents in a 24-month period. It, it directs the court uh, to close the business. So it takes all of the discretion away from the judge in evaluating these cases. I've sat in a couple of these nuisance hearings. Uh, in the municipal court, and the judge is very thoughtful. The prosecutors are very aggressive. Reigns Carter has his crack top deputies prosecuting these cases, and the judge evaluates the evidence, asks questions, and makes a fair decision. And so it's not just that we're saying in 24 months that there's two violent incidents. We're, the question is why is it that the ordinance purports to take all of the discretion away from the judge and it just evidence of those violations themselves uh, require the immediate closure of the property? Uh, and so uh, it may be, and I think you've heard several people speak about their concerns about uneven enforcement of this rule. Uh, the best way to protect against uneven enforcement is to eliminate all the vagueness in the ordinance. And there's several questions with respect to the ordinance that we have. How do you get on the nuisance list? 
How do you abate the nuisance? If somebody is shot within four feet of your business, as the ordinance contemplates, how do you determine whether it's the responsibility of the business? And if it does happen, how do you abate that nuisance? When two unrelated people, unrelated to the business, have a dispute within four feet of your business, how do they take responsibility to abate that nuisance? Uh, what is the formal notice that you get before you... What is the formal notice that you receive before you are served with the nuisance action that you have uh, opportunity to abate that nuisance and not be on the nuisance list? Uh, so there's several questions that we think could be resolved by amending this ordinance further and, and clarifying that in the law. So people that are worried about uneven enforcement and who have maybe been subject to uneven enforcement can feel more comfortable about it. I attend MPUs all over the city with businesses that are seeking alcohol licenses for different uses and many of them uh, it's very clear that when they walk in the MPU makes a, a decision to deny the application before they hear from the applicant because they don't want that type of business or they want that type of applicant in their neighborhoods. They have a right to make that decision but then those businesses that are here before you today have a right to feel a little uncomfortable comfortable about laws that are written that don't provide the clarity that they need to understand how it's going to be enforced. I appreciate the mayor's comment that, that Lenox Mall will be treated just as all the other businesses. And if that's true, let's make it clear in the law that that's what's going to happen, that it doesn't matter what type of business you are and everybody is going to be subject to the same standard. Everybody that has the potential nuisance gets notice in writing that your business is a potential nuisance. And here are the th reasons we th think it's problematic. And here's the time you have to abate it before you get on the nuisance list. And so I don't understand, and I think a lot of the businesses here do not understand what the rush is to pass a law that restricts the, the, uh, the, uh, the role of the court in deciding whether a nuisance exists or not. We've been talking about nightlife, but I think part of the discussion is about gas stations, and I'll conclude with this, and we talked about it a little last time. There's a lot of wisdom in the community about how to do these things. There's businesses that operate in nightlife establishments in this city for more than three decades. They've done it successfully without incident. And they should be a part of this conversation about how to resolve these issues. It's not just about punishment. It's how do you identify best practices and encourage that in the ordinances that you've adopted. Uh, that's true in the nightlife industry. We've got wisdom. But that's true in the gas station industry. The gas station industry actually has a manual best practices. How do you manage public safety issues at gas stations? Uh, and so let's talk to the folks that know it very, very well and share their comments with you so you can incorporate that into the law. But let's get this ordinance, give this ordinance some clarity so there's no confusion and we can eliminate the concern about uneven enforcement because our experiences here in this room are very different than some of the businesses and the experiences that they have in action. So appreciate the opportunity to be here. Look forward to participating in the discussion on Thursday and inviting some of those folks there and sharing their wisdom and hopefully coming back to you for more conversation. And we appreciate the time. Next is Donna Matthews. Donna Matthews. Next, Vincent Fort. Excuse me. Good afternoon. I'm here on an issue that some may say is a small issue, but it's a large issue to the people uh, in my neighborhood, the people who uh, live close to Camelton and Harbin Road. At that site, there is a uh, convenience store construction site. It is left open after hours and on the weekends. And there is nothing on Campton Road in that area but apartments with small children. And they walk by it every day. There's a 10-foot pit. There's a 10-foot pit on this construction site. We, and black children, walk by it every day. And nothing has been done over the last several months. I've reached out to the fire department and the police department, and they have done nothing. I've reached out to politicians. They have done nothing. I appreciate uh, Councilmember Waits responding to my queries last Thursday and Friday. I appreciate that. You know, a lot of politicians, a lot of city council members and others come down to Greenbrier, Hamilton Road for ribbon cuttings and announcements and town hall meetings. And then when a little black child needs some help, 
They don't care. You can't find them. Don't come down there no more, cutting a ribbon, and don't take care of this. Because, you know, I'm a hellraiser from way back. <laughs> Hello, somebody. And I put up a picket line in a New York second. I can assure you that the property owner, that the property owner, the applicant, the liquor store lawyer, the zoning lawyer, I can assure you that when they leave that location, they don't come nowhere near Camerton Road. They're going north, west, south, wherever they can go. But care about children. I know when I was 8, 9, 10 years old, I got into construction sites. I got into warehouses. Had no business being there. Young. Didn't know better. So I'm just asking you. I don't know how City, City Hall runs, but there used to be a time when a council member would say something, the staff would run down there and stand in front of the location. Now, the staff run the joint. You know, so I have some real concerns about that. Ultimately, y'all don't work for property owners or licensees or lawyers, zoning lawyers, or licensed liquor license applicants. You work for who? The people. And I would hope, because I'm going to give you another few days. I'm going to give you another few days, and then we're going to have to escalate. Because you got to, if this was somewhere else in the city, that place would have been closed months ago. I'm just appalled that the fire marshal and the fire department and the police, you had about 12 police down here a minute ago. Send some of the police down to Camelton and Harbin. Safest place in the city was right here at 1 o'clock. Let's make Camelton Road safe. Don't come down there showboating. The other comment I wanted to make was about uh, nuisances. Now, I ain't going to speak for against the nuisance bill because I don't know enough about it. What I do know is that some of y'all are proposing to help out some of the worst nu nuisances in the city. That's strip clubs. If you know the history, if you've been around for as long as I've been, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, you know that the worst corruption in this city, police corruption in this city, came out of strip clubs. Murders, child prostitution. There's a reason police are prohibited from working at strip clubs. Because, <laughs> don't tell me you go going to keep them on the outside. It's a matter about who writes that check to that police officer. They should work for the city and the city only when it comes to strip clubs. They can have other jobs. But to have a police officer getting paid by you think You think that arson this weekend at the strip club, you think that was coincidental? You think that was somebody smoking in the bed? No. You did, I learned years ago they cast something at the strip club called firemen. You know what a fireman is at the strip club? Somebody they let sleep overnight in the strip club so nobody will burn it up. If you look in the records, strip clubs have been burned every all the time. So to even imagine having police officers in strip clubs is, you talk about a nuisance. I don't know nothing about them nuisances these folk talk about, but I know <laughs> what been the shooting and cutting that go on in strip clubs. So I would hope that you would reconsider. I don't know. Maybe it's passed. I haven't been following it close enough. I haven't been following it close enough. So I don't know. Have you already passed that? So let them, please, don't do it. Because you, who remembers the 33 murder? The 33 cop, cops? Y'all don't remember? I know you do. You old like me. <laughs> <laughs> they went and killed the strip club owner. <laughs> they went and killed the strip club owner and tried to rob him. This is, this is just beyond belief. Talk about nuisances. You got a nuisance coming if you do that. And lastly, about the jail. 
I, I'm not as far informed, and I apologize, informed about the jail situation. I will be brought up, but I do know one thing. I do know this. Keep the promises you make to the people. Keep the promises you make. Don't, don't treat the people like they're stupid. People ain't stupid. They see when you tell a lie, and they see when you tell the truth. So, you know, all the presentations at this microphone for 30 minutes talking about, you know, crime. Uh-uh, I don't want to hear that. Just keep your promises to the people. The people should at least expect that from you. So I appreciate you so much. Uh, God, I'm going, I got three minutes left. I have to, I, I'll come back and say, use the rest some other time. Thank you and God bless you. <laughs> Jeanette Jackson. Hello, my name is Jeanette Jackson and I'm here. I'm not feeling very well, but I'm here for you to hear my daughter's name, which is Alani Lenore. She's been missing for nine days and I know where she was taken from, which is building 1660 Peachtree Luxury Apartments. The police, I'm here really because I want to speak to the police department, Atlanta Police Department, that has done almost nothing in communication and transparency. I'm here to thank Mrs. Boom, Councilman Boom, thank you for, for, for showing me some kind of compassion and caring. I'm here to address that the police need some more training in how they deal with, with people who are, are hurting because I was turned away and I'm pleading that my daughter's missing and I have no answers until I got on TV. I shouldn't have to use all the resources and do all the grassroots. We are human beings. You should care about us. But she is a little brown girl in, in, in the inner city having a good time. In Midtown, she was taken. In Midtown. And I'm upset and appalled that at, after I'm on the TV, now you want to reach out to me and give me some trash. There is a video with my daughter going into this location. And I have been asking for, I have the right to know what happened to my daughter. I know who she was with. I know the three people. I've talked to them. And there is, she's been abducted. She ha she's not missing. She wouldn't leave. I knew all that she was and all that she is and all that you will try to say she was. Nobody deserves to disappear and you do not care. And Atlanta Police Department has not been transparent and forthcoming until the news came and they still haven't given me an answer about that video. And I, and I am not going to spend the time saying what was said to me because it's not pretty. It's not what I won't want the snapshot here, but I am saying that these police officers need to be trained from sergeants to lieutenants all the way up. And I heard the mayor talking, then do your job. Force their hand to do the right things in this community because she's not the only brown girl that's missing. She just happens to have parents that care about her and we're not gonna stop fighting to find her. So don't forget my daughter's name is Alani Lenore and that I will not stop. And I will be visiting each and every one of you, knocking and making you keep saying her name because she's been abducted. Vincent Harper. I yield my time to Dewan Mooley. Um, chairperson, I have about um, nine minutes. I have um, myself, I signed in, and um, Lance Irvin in um, pregame. Who um, is the, third, the second person dedicating their time to you? Um, Lance Irvin um, and the gentleman from um, pregame. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Nine minutes. Um, I would like to speak to um, start out with um, what former Senator Ford said about the strip clubs. Um, when he said that those are white strip club owners, I don't think uh, many people who are not from Atlanta or young people are aware. Uh, Tony, you're little, I know you're young. I don't know if you even know this, man. Just in the 60s, a black cop 
black cops were not allowed to even carry weapons. They had to get dressed on bank hit at the Boys and Girls Club. They couldn't get dressed with the other white cops. So black cops were not even allowed in the strip clubs on Vincent Ford. So they couldn't protect them. So any violence or corruption was going on was white strip club owners back in the day because black people couldn't even get a license in the city of Atlanta. Let that be clear. Um, second thing, when it comes to the jails, um, so one thing happened um, in Atlanta when Maynard Jackson was mayor. Um, it was different time, white versus black. So Maynard had to galvanize. Everybody had to go with Maynard. When Maynard left, it was Andy Turner and so on and so on. But what happened was there was not a, enough voter education. People don't understand how politics work. So the sheriff, Labatt, has nothing to do with people getting locked up. Your judges and the DA's office has something to do with mental the people getting locked up over there. The sheriff, only the sheriff is saying, hey, we need extra bed because people are living in humane conditions. We need this space. So whatever promises was made, I'm not here to talk about that, but let's be clear. We need those beds and we need that jail. So whatever, anything else going on, the city of Atlanta and the West Atlanta own enough property to donate this space and create whatever everybody else is arguing about. But people are living in humane condition because of the overcrowding of jails. You have one judge seeing 49 people. You got another judge seeing 200 cases. Y'all need to get on them judges over there who not seeing enough people to get them out of them jails. That's the overcrowded problem. It ain't the sheriff's job. The sheriff's job is saying, hey, listen, I recognize a problem. I need your help, city of Atlanta. Now, back to this nuisance thing. I like attorney here said, we do need to define that. And my problem is Atlanta, um, this go talk with mayor and everybody up here, the problem we have in Atlanta is we are too clickish. We are too clickish. Um, Councilman Boone represents on Wilson Mill Park, so that's near and dear to her. Her and the mayor grew up playing over there. If something happened over there, it's going to get hot ticketed quick. A.D. Williams, where I'm from, born home, something happened, ain't a damn thing going to happen over there because ain't nobody going to call and escalate the situation and care about the little black boys over there in the Bankhead District. Let's just be clear. And that, and that nuisance bill has to be clear because guess what? We know y'all are not going to bring Arthur Blanks down here, Mr. Bernie Marcus, if something happened because they are billionaires in this city. I understand that they get a special phone call to the mayor. Guess what? He's going to answer that phone. Any one of y'all going to answer that phone too. But the local business owner who may need a little help that don't know y'all, phone call won't get answered. So that's the first thing we got to stop in Atlanta is who we do it for and why we do it for. We understand a lot of these people donate to campaigns. You know what I'm saying? There's some little leeway in there. We understand that. But to change Atlanta, we have to stop that. And we have to stop splitting hairs between black and white. That's the younger generation because they don't live in a racist society um, as anybody who 40 years and older. I'm from Bankhead, so by the time I grew up, white flight had already taken place out of Atlanta. I didn't see a white person in Atlanta or Bankhead until I went to Cumberland Mall or Lenox. I just didn't grow up with it. So, that, so guess what, um, Ms. Norwood? I don't have a problem with white folks because I didn't grow up in that time. So I could stand on my ground and say, Mary Norwood, I support you. You look me in my face and say, hey, the one I want to help you help your, no, I'm saying your people. I can go for that because I don't have that. The young people don't have that. It's the older folks like Vincent Ford and everybody else who want to continue to divide. We can't have that in Atlanta if we're going to move forward. But when you get up here and speak about the strip club, we can't do that, Mr. Ford. That's dividing, though. That's dividing, my friend. But when you do that, you divide, though. Not have any back but when you do that, you divide, you. though. And I, send, I stand on it. But you divide when you say it's strip clubs, though. Don't lie. Don't lie about me. Listen, listen, so like I said, we have to move forward in Atlanta and stop the division. And like he said, if you're going to say something to people, stand on it. Don't back away from it. Don't get up here and do that. But we have to stop this in Atlanta in order to move forward. It has to be some realness and all that fake stuff. Y'all got to stop double talking and saying one thing and don't want to stand on it because the mayor get up here. He from Atlanta. He has to do better. His team, half his team is born and raised in Atlanta. We have to do better. We've had nothing but black mayors in Atlanta since 74. Ain't no way Atlanta should be number one in America for income inequality. You know what I'm saying? When all we had is a majority black city council and a black mayor, there's no way. 
Your daddy fought hard for this. Your daddy fought hard for this. There's no way. There's no way. We got to just stop that. It's a simple fix. Y'all got the money. We the people need help. No, so we got a lot of billionaires, 100 millionaires that live in the city of Atlanta. We can get things funded that we want to. When you want to get something funded in your district, it happens. If the mayor wants something funded, and we got to stop. And there's another narrative that we got to stop believing. No mayor, no police chief, no police department stop crying in no city. It happens from people in the community like myself who born and raised here, who plead with young folks and say, hey, man, don't you do that. Hey, man, don't you do that. You know what I'm saying? This man here from um, um, Cleveland Ave. Can you imagine the conversation this man have all night long trying to help these young folks? You know what I'm saying? We got a young guy from Oakland City, a little baby, that bought out the whole West End Mall, you know what I'm saying, the school supplies for the whole city of Atlanta. He did that because he can afford to and he give a damn. Nobody else, he didn't wait for nobody else to help him. So true leadership is when you want to do something, it can happen. You know what I'm saying? When you get out here and you ask him for, you know what I'm saying, people to vote for you and give you money to campaign, man, you say everything in the world. You say everything in the world. You, man, some of y'all darn near cry. But when you get up here, they got to beg you to do what's right. No, man. And like he said, that nuisance got to be clear. It has to be clear. And Mr. Reigns, you got a reputation of being hard and doing the right thing. So I'm not worried about that because everybody said your reputation precedes you. Everybody said you hard and you do the right thing. But we have to do the right thing. And we have some things from the nightclub owner that we asking. And uh, majority, and we can sit down and talk about it, is, hey, once you've had the conversation with nightclub owners, you ask them, do they supposed to do? We ask them for a fine. If something has happened inside that nightclub after that first fine, hey, maybe seven days closure. Hey, if it's a second, third time, hey, maybe 14 days closure. We don't ever want to get to the point of shutting them down unless there's probably a fourth instance. And we're talking about, we're not even saying a murder. We're just saying situation that happened inside the nightclub. And there's a third party that um, I think um, the police department, um, a good friend over here, um, Peter Amon, is working with um, that, um, that would take the, the ownership from the nightclubs is the third party, the ones that hire the APD, the same rate from the nightclubs, but they take the ownership and the blame from the nightclub on if you hire the third party who's contracting with APD. There's only four black companies in the whole state of Georgia that have state security license with the yellow card. All the rest of them just have LLCs. So the nightclub is saying, hey, that helps us out a lot. If we can contract with this third-party company uh, who the city have made get a $10 million insurance policy, let them hire APD directly. So therefore, if something do happens, the nightclub owner are held blameless. It's on the third-party and APD or um, Pat LeBot Sheriff, they want to help in and start uh, helping because guess what? Uh, 911 is down. Uh, um, APD saying, hey, we having a hard trouble coming. Um, if it's an APD officer and something happened, he or she have to call for backup. But guess what? Fulton County Sheriff can take you directly to Rice Street. You don't have to call 911. You go straight to Rice Street. But it alleviates the blame on the nightclub owners if the third party, which APD have already approved, hires APD, uh, hires the sheriff um, deputies, something do happen, the nightclub owners are not held blame. So that's the main thing that we need to focus on, the taking the blame away from the nightclub owners and just putting the blame on where it is because every city in America is facing crime right now. So please, we ask y'all, we humbly ask y'all, you know what I'm saying, to this, take consideration of those things that we're asking that's fair for everybody. Like the mayor said, not just nightclub owners, Lennox, Georgia Dawn, World Congress Center, etc. Thank you. Next is Doc Allen. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Um, it's kind of disturbing because a week ago this time I was speaking in front of you. We was talking about nuisances and the nightlife and how it's a problem in the city of Atlanta. Um, I really didn't know what to say this morning, but it's an extremely difficult conversation I, um, I have to have with my 11-year-old daughter because 
in her eyes, and she's very coherent of what's going on. In her eyes, it says, you guys are attacking the nightlife division. And she wake up, she watches the news every day. So as taking her to school this morning, her question to me was, how could they attack you guys when I watched the news every day and there was a kid killed yesterday and there was a kid killed the day before. There's been a murder in this city for the last seven days and no one has attended nightlife. So it's an extremely difficult conversation I have to have with her about things happening. Sometimes you just have to let it play out to the way it is. Um, Ms. Waits, I appreciate you dissecting the situation was going on, and it's um, it's a good. I appreciate that. The first thing I want to speak on is I speak on facts. I speak on numbers. So I want to speak on the fact of what you talked about. How do you police the other entities in these cities as Lennox and such as other places? Let me give you a couple things I did. I put an open records report in the city of Atlanta. Let me tell you what's going on. So the nuisances that they're doing, a lot of the black businesses are being targeted. And it's kind of, it's good that I see Lieutenant Carter in here today because he's over the permits division. Let me give you a few instances. And I'm going to speak on. Zari, it's a restaurant in the city of Atlanta. They received a citation one night. Um, They've been to do calls on the citation. Another business on Roswell Road, not going to name it, predominantly white business, received the same citation the same night. Hasn't been to do calls at all. Nothing has happened. I'm going to get even bigger when we talk about these corporations. That's why I appreciated what you said earlier. These corporations, February 2022, Whole Foods received a citation for serving alcohol to an underage minor. Open records, pull it up. Let's get even better. You have two years to serve a due cause. Two years ago, 2020, Whole Foods sold alcohol to an underage minor. Nothing has happened to Whole Foods. That's the conversation we need to be having instead of targeting these black businesses. You put people in these permits department, such as Lieutenant Carter, he goes around, targets the black business. He's not gonna, he's on the hot seat right now. He don't wanna be on the hot seat. All-star, I stood outside of one of my establishments. They came to the establishment. I was arrested because it was too many people on the sidewalk. I say, listen, I can't control the sidewalk. That's the city of Atlanta, that's a public easement. What you, you can do is you can come inside and see if I'm over capacity. They went inside, wasn't over capacity. They said, well, there's too many people in front of your establishment. Took me to jail. They said, well, what you going to do, close it down and go to jail? I said, well, I can't tell these people out here what to do, so I guess I got to go to jail tonight. That shouldn't be a decision I have, should have to make as a taxpaying citizen in this, in this city. You know, I've heard a lot of things about it's been problems going on or things going on in this city. It's been problems and crime going on in this city for the last 10, 15 years. It wasn't an issue until it got to Buckhead. When it got to Buckhead, now it's a problem. And uh, Ms. Norwood, I'm not attacking your district. Guess what? I live in your district. My, own, my home is only your district. 1.7 million, I live in your district. I didn't move out once the crime got bad. I stayed Sir, there. I stuck with you. Your time is well expired. I thought this was the previous timer, but this is your timer. So, uh, thank you. He's yielding his time to me. Well, I need to know that beforehand. All right, if you look at the... So, who is yielding? Uh, Frank Turner. So, let's do this. Everybody on this committee, instead of... I'm not asking you guys to kill the bill. That's the first thing. What I'm asking you to do is just let us be a part of the conversation collectively. You have a nightlife division that has been um, allotted by the city. Y'all have people in place that 
from the city of Atlanta is making decisions on the nightlife. That's not, that's not fair to us. Let some people that are part of the nightlife make those decisions and try to help you guys. None of those people are club owners. None of those people are operators. None of those people. Get some, we're forming the, the group. Let us help you guys. We're not asking you to kill the bill. Just let us be a part of the conversation. That's all. Let's collectively figure this out. Um, personally, I can say, and anybody that's on this district, and they know me, personally, whenever I've got a call, whether it's been back to school, Christmas, turkey drive, whatever it's been, I personally pulled up, but whatever. I haven't sent nobody. I haven't done anything other than that. Me and my 11-year-old daughter, we pulled up. We stood there. We passed out toys. So instead of pushing the back against the nightlife, push forward and help. Let us help you guys. And, you know, I, I do want to speak on one issue that is kind of, and, and I know we have some honorable APD officers in here, but this issue bothers me a lot because the, the administration has dangled the carrot of we will let, you know, officers work at the strip club. The issue with, and I'm quite sure all you're familiar with, and it's an elephant in the room, don't nobody want to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it. The issue with Atlanta Police Department not working at strip clubs is because we had, as Mr. Fort said, it was some dirty cops that were working at the strip club that were following people home robbing them. And it didn't become an issue until somebody white got killed. So once somebody white got killed, they said, no, y'all can't work at strip clubs anymore. That's unfair to all the businesses. The businesses hired the police department to protect their business. Those dirty, dishonorable cops, they're the one that made it a problem for the businesses. So that was stripped away from the businesses. It shouldn't be like that. Those cops, I'm quite sure they serve their time or doing whatever, but you can't penalize the businesses for what a dirty cop did. But it's a black eye that the Atlanta Police Department will have to forever live with. And that should, we shouldn't be, as business owners, held accountable for that at all. They should be willing to work with us. There's nothing we did wrong. We asked for their assistance. Thank you. Your time's expired. And they went outside the guidelines. Okay. Someone needs to tell me that, not a council member. I'm going to just be brief. I don't need much longer. No, no. Is, do you have any more yielded time? If yes, not. sir. Tell me your name. Um, no. No, no. So. What's the first name? Did you sign the sheet? I asked for about 30 more seconds, and then I'll be out of your ass. So I say to this, um, Mr. Hillis, and, and I have always pushed back against you. And we, you know, we, we have a very big project in your district. I ask that instead of us being, you know, on the op opposing side, when I try the west side open up, which will be next month, I ask you to be there with me and cut the ribbon. You got 143 homes that will be allotted to the affordable community. You, need, you should be there. I want you there. So I'm asking you to let's not oppose each other. Let's work together as allies. That benefits your community. And that money for those affordable homes, that came from the nightlife. This is not a nuisance or whatever. We took, like, as I explained before, we took, back, we took the money back. We gave back to the community. So I ask that you be respectfully there when we cut that ribbon, and let's work together as we always have. Don't push back on us. Let's work together. I'm extending the olive branch to everybody out here. Let's collectively work together. I appreciate y'all. Y'all enjoy y'all day. Daniel O'Toole.
Uh, Council member, we have a, a noted Atlanta architect here um, who has a meeting to get to. Can I swap speaking spaces with him? I have six minutes. He has nine. Can he speak now? Uh, Bill Day, say Auburn. What is it? Just a second. What are we doing here? Can he speak now? And I'll speak when he's uh, when his time comes. What is comes your up. name? Dan Sorry. O'Toole. Daniel O'Toole. Oh, I need his name as well. Bill. Bill D. St. Aubin. I'm on the list. Bill D. St. Aubin. He's on the list a little further down. And he had nine minutes. Could be okay, I'm not seeing anyone who's allocated time. I signed it in. Uh, he signed in. And then the allocated, time. Uh, the allocated time came from. Yeah. Uh, Greg. Bonner, Gerard Maddox, or uh, Jill, Jaquila Rouse. They signed in right after me. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. He's got nine minutes. I apologize. My name is my last name is complex. It's D. St. Alban. Um, I, I work for a Sizemore Group. I'm an, uh, we run a, an architectural and planning firm. Uh, that's been involved in Atlanta for 40 years. And it's an honor to speak here. And really, it's uh, Keisha's legislation that brought me here. But hearing the speakers ahead of time and knowing the mayor a bit, it's really, I'd like to draw a circle around both those legislations and make them happen at once. I think Natalie Hall said a lot of what I was interested in saying, but I'll speak from an architecture, uh, architect's point of view. Uh, also, as a, a uh, person... 30 years ago, I worked for a firm that did uh, prisons all over the country. Uh, it was Fab at Boston International, worked for Cecil Alexander. And, um, and it kind of always took me back um, when I when I drive around the country or drive around this, uh, this region and look at Gwinnett County and the tallest building in Gwinnett County was a jail. What does that say if you came from another country or another world and came and visited? What does that say about our society that the tallest building is a jail? Um, and I saw that in DeKalb County. I saw that all over the country. For my work for made a lot of money doing prisons. Um, I don't work for them anymore. I work for a firm that builds towns and cities and, pl and places people love to live. And I'm now the CEO of that company. And I, I, I was uh, fortunate enough to go on the, the link trip uh, three times in a row. I don't think I deserved any of those, but, but, but I learned a lot. And the last one was in in Austin, Texas. And Austin, Texas was speaking to, the mayor of Austin was speaking to, you know, 120 leaders from Atlanta. And he could talk about anything. Here he is talking about his great city to another great city. And he chooses to talk about the homeless situation. He said, get your, get your hands around it before it's too late. I've been to Portland and Seattle. It's, it's huge. As your city becomes a technology city, as incomes go up, people can't afford housing. Um, and we've also, I went from that to an AIA conference in Chicago where uh, I uh, spent all morning learning about what they were doing at Bellevue in New York. 300,000 square foot used to be a mental health institution, and they're transforming it into uh, a facility just like Keisha has been describing. And they said it would be the largest shelter in the world. Well, the jail is bigger than that. In Atlanta, in my experience, especially coming from uh, the background of Cecil Alexander, Atlanta has always led, uh, led the um, American a lot of ways. And when I think back about the last uh, civil rights movement, some of the leadership Atlanta has done, and I think you have another opportunity here to do that uh, with, with how you treat that, that jail facility, how you transform it into a beacon of help, of, of hope for a lot of people that really need it. And uh, it's, it, it was really the narrative that the mayor of Austin said just kind of hit it home. We, you know, they, in, in Austin, they were locking up people because they couldn't afford a home and they didn't have anywhere to stay. They didn't have family. And it, that was just law, you know. You, you can't afford a home, you're going to get locked up, you know, because you're sleeping on the bed. So they decriminalized that. And we did decriminalize a lot of things in our society, which we probably should. Um, and uh, but that doesn't that hasn't solved the problem. So people like my church and other church, I, I, I can relate because we would build uh, we would put backpacks together and give it to homeless people. People are giving them tents in Austin. 
they are giving the homeless people tents and all this beautiful riverfront along Austin, which I really like, is became Tent City. And, and so the, the governor stepped in and said, we're not going to allow Tent City. So they made that illegal. And then he gave them seven acres away from uh, downtown, and it, and it, and it turned into a, a really mess, a really big mess. And uh, they've, they've worked through it. Um, they have a huge budget that's dealing with that. They went from like 50000 a year to $7 million a year in four years uh, trying to treat, uh, trying to deal with the situation. And I think what, I, what I've seen uh, Keisha describe and the vision she described um, with the John Lewis uh, Center for Equity could really be a model that you can export all around the country. And I think Atlanta should lead. I think this is a great opportunity. Now let me think, let me talk practically about as an architect. Um, our firm is known where there's a lot of different kinds of architects. Some do, you know, hotels, some do office buildings. Um, we do a lot of planning with a capital P. When the Olympics came to Atlanta, we were honored. We master planned all the Olympic venues. So I understand exactly, and the, the mayor and I both went to tech, but I understand what he was saying. It's going to take some time. It's a three-year process to really figure out what to do at that building. It involves a lot of stakeholders, a lot of consensus building, a lot of analysis of the condition of that building. And at the same time, Fulton County has an issue uh, with, um, with the jail. So I think you can combine those two things, but start right from the beginning with a combination so you can build the long-term vision and become that, that beacon of hope. Uh, I have looked at it a little bit. I got a tour. The staff at your jail is amazing. Um, I met, I think it's Lieutenant Michael Holmes, um, and he said, you know, the people, the people that get locked up here come back just to be rescued it, because they're, they're, it, and he can just see them come back to life once they've gotten water and get back on their medication and stuff. And, um, what if you were proactive about all that and had a facility that could really help people and give them a hand out? You know, it, it is complicated. I design a lot of courthouses. You've got to separate uses. You've got to make sure uh, you don't lose any certifications for what you're trying to do in that building. So it's not a, it's not a quick process to try and figure this out. Um, but a lot of ways you do that when I design uh, courthouses, you do it separate circulation systems. You might have to add... Uh, different circulation systems to it, and when I say that, elevators, um, it, it's a it's a complex undertaking. But I've toured the whole building, and I could see it. I mean, I could just see that that would be an amazing uh, opportunity for the city of Atlanta to kind of lead again as we kind of transform our our uh, society from you know lock everybody up to help everybody out. That's that's all I really. I know I got two more minutes, but I'm not really a speaker, so <laughs> I don't know what else to say to tell you the truth. I think it's a great opportunity to get, get great leaders here uh, that want to do something, and uh, I'm in full support of what you know the two are trying to do together. Thank you, Daniel O'Toole. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Who did you um, indicate I was apologize. yielding you time, Mr. O'Toole? I'm sorry? Who did you indicate was yielding you time? Um, <laughs> signed in right after me, it was, I think, uh, Jaquila Rouse. Is she present? Well, maybe not. Okay, then Can I get the remainder of Bill's time? You have six minutes. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, council members, I apologize for the confusion earlier. Thank you for the accommodation. Um, I'm here because I'm afraid you're about to make a $1.1 billion mistake, uh, which I will explain in just a minute. Um, last week, council members Bond and Waits introduced papers governing what's to become of the detention center uh, with both proposals offering temporary short-term housing to Fulton County. Uh, immediately following that meeting, Mayor Dickens issued a press release stating that he'll be requesting ideas for what to do after that ends. Now, I find that a little odd because Councilman Dickens submitted the paper creating the ACDC task force, and that group spent $150,000 studying this and creating a 110-page report outlining exactly what to do with the building. In addition to that, over 160 stakeholders throughout uh, Fulton, Atlanta, and surrounding counties 
have been working on this issue and they pretty much have it squared away. The work to convert that building has been done. It's done. We have architects here that designed all 29 venues of the Centennial Olympics um, willing to work on this. We're ready for this building. Atlanta residents want and need this building. Now, I stand here to urge you to combine the papers that both Councilmember Bond and Councilmember Waits submitted um, in order to provide that temporary housing that Fulton County needs, but then also tie it to converting the building to the John Lewis Center for Equity with all the services that we need in that, that combined building. Now, where did that $1.1 billion come from? CVS Health has indicated that they're willing to create a job training facility, uh, training center right in the building. And with that facility, they would train over 6,000 Atlantans a year and then slot them into jobs within the CVS Health network. If you just take the average or even a below average uh, wage from that, 6,000 residents times 15 bucks an hour times a full year, that's $183 million a year for every graduating class going through in terms of wages. That Every year this project is delayed, that's another $183 million that residents are missing out on, Atlanta residents are missing out on. Now, Mayor Dickens was here earlier and he said he doesn't want to be in the jail business and he wants to give people opportunity. How can you give, like, this is an amazing opportunity to give Atlanta residents. To, and if, uh, as Bill was mentioning about the homeless issue, one of the best ways to solve the homeless issue is to get people trained and put them in jobs. And we have corporate sponsors and partners that are super excited about this and they want to get to work as soon as possible. In addition to CVS, some of those other stakeholders include Grady Health, who need rooms, temporary occupancy rooms, to um, get people out of beds that they can't discharge because they're, for whatever reason, they can't just discharge them to the street with no home to go to. We can create hotel-style rooms that they can use, which will free up space in Grady. Emory uh, is one of the partners who is um, interested in this, along with the Georgia Justice Project, PAD, and others and they have put thousands of hours into this already so it would be a complete slap in their face to put more poor people in jail without directly tying it to creating a public services building namely the john lewis center for equity now you know we again every year that this is delayed is 183 million dollars in wages that are lost to people who need this so I encourage you combine create a work group combine these papers reduce the uh, intergovernmental agreement to three years instead of four because that's about the amount of time it will take the work group to finish parceling out the building getting construction drawings getting bidding doing all that um, and in that time we can be helping Fulton County with their over uh, crowding issue but we can also be creating the services that would keep people from going to jail in the first place and the services that would get those people out of jail once they're there. And there's a number of people in jail that are just there because they are waiting for substance abuse training programs. They're not available. If they were in that building, they wouldn't be in jail anymore. So, uh, again, I encourage you to combine those bills and if we had this building, that would be a national model for the rest of the country and what to do uh, to have all these services under one roof, including, uh, you know, warrant clearing center, uh, temporary housing, drunk tank and all the uh, drunk tank, um, sobering services and everything else uh, under one building. In, again, we would be a national model and Atlanta should, quite frankly, be a national model for the rest of the country on a number of different issues. So uh, the mayor also mentioned, or maybe uh, Mrs. Hall, that 80% of the people on Rice Street come from Atlanta. So Fulton's overcrowding issue is really Atlanta's overcrowding issue. The true humanitarian response, uh, I'm sorry, I'll finish up, uh, would be to create this building, have the jail space, but have this building so that you get people out there in the services they need. Thank you very much. Next is Honorary Jordan.
Give me unto the Spirit of God to everyone that's here. He that leadeth in the captivity shall go in the captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints, Revelation 13, 10. When you seek to bring someone into captivity, you shall go into captivity. And God don't lie. When you lead a person into captivity, then you shall be led captivity, James Griff. This promotes death for you. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as the girdle, which is good for nothing, Jeremiah 13, chapter 10, verse. The lesson of the message is the same as the girdle was marred. So God will mar, wound Judas' pride. Do you want Jesus to wound your pride? And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians 9, chapter 25, verse. But the lowly need to be encouraged that they are exalted before God. Whereas the exalted need to hear a message of humiliation. Jesus says to rob me, it's asked for death. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Proverbs 27, chapter 28, verse. The toil of the miser is futile, especially when he toils only for himself. Those who seek to destroy ask for destruction. The law was created to treat one another justly, Investigator Jackson. I had a vision of what Christ would do to fight for me, but call on Jesus Christ when you get in that trouble because you know your deeds, your unrighteous deeds. David Jaffer. David Jaffer. Ron Shakir. Good afternoon, Ron Shakir. And I have uh, um, Eric Terrell. I have his amputee, and he had to make a little adjustment, and he hasn't got back yet. I hope I can have his minutes. He's been here sitting in the corner. He's been seeing him all day. Um, I just want to say that I came here to talk about public safety and the importance of uh, public safety is rooted in solid, stable communities. And when a child can't count on their mother or their father for a home, sweet home, they're going to be some broken pieces. And hearing the last two conversations about repurposing this jail, it draw me near to his to a subject where he spoke of other parts of the country where people was given tents by, by cities to live on. This is going on throughout the country. Do Atlanta want to give tents for people to live on? For sure, I think that we should have a place when people are arrested. But the biggest crime that has happened in Atlanta is legislators, legislators ignoring the displacement of people who come to the city, who came to the city under the leadership of people who love this city, who happen to be African Americans like Maynard Jackson, where Atlanta was a place that was attracting African Americans because they felt something that was going on good here. But for us to ignore gentrification and displacement, every piece of policy that come out of your legislators from this city council, Mr. Hillis, it should measure the impact of the displacement and the reorganizing of this city of Atlanta. And I would hope that we would do that and be very serious and purposeful of doing it. Because right now, we have had most, 
elected officials who have come from public schools, most of them from Atlanta public schools in recent history, but the housing in the communities are under attack. And that attack is causing people to be displaced in this city. And I think that we should not allow that to happen. And that is the biggest crime because for sure the public housing was a place of refuge that gave people in this city a place to start in safe environments and they produced and became a part of a good culture. And I think that we should look seriously about the housing that the gentleman just spoke of and try to do something to make that happen. But for sure, we don't need to fake ourselves out and think that we can push people out of public housing and then at the same time create something in the private market where we know, like Forge Grove, can be turned Here down. Time's expired. That can be turned up and turned down. Um, are you going to recognize the gentleman as an amputee who had to make if an they're adjustment? Not present, they cannot allocate time. Say again? If they're not present, they cannot allocate their time. Thank you. Well, I would just hope that you can run the meeting a little bit better because people have stayed here a long time and some people are sick and they cannot your just stay expired, here. And hopefully we can um, next is be Mr. here and meet your Terrell. requirements next time. Thank you. Eric Terrell. Mark Spencer. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Mark Spencer. I work for Emory and Grady and I'm here on behalf of my colleagues. I brought you a letter signed by 300 um, healthcare workers in just the past five days, growing every day. These include primary care doctors like myself, experts in public health, mental health, addiction, and so much more. I'll also email it to you so you can access the links for data. And for those of you who don't plan to read it, um, the summary is pretty simple. What you're doing in proposing to lease ACDC to Fulton County will undermine both public safety and public health and make our work harder, not easier. I want to address what the mayor said earlier. To be clear, to lease a jail is to very much so be in the jailing business. If you can get on the phone, with the sheriff and the DA and the courts at Fulton County to discuss the jail space, you can get on the phone with them to demand they solve the crisis they created by their addiction to punishment. Overcrowding is not new nor unsolvable. Fulton County needs zero beds and zero days to address their overcrowding issue. The mayor mentioned humanitarian crisis. What of the humanitarian crisis of incarcerating mentally ill patients, of incarcerating people for drug use? of fighting a drug war despite 50 years of evidence stating how harmful it is that kills more than the drugs kill themselves, of incarcerating for crimes of poverty, the ongoing crisis of wealth-based detention, the crisis of diversion-eligible people being ignored and stuck in cages. What of the humanitarian crisis of affordable housing, of underfunded schools, of underfunded and short-staffed hospitals and health departments? of extreme and growing wealth inequality in this city. To talk of humanitarianism in terms of only the number of cages for human beings is quite something. Demanding punishment is not the same as accountability. My colleagues and I care deeply about safety. Safety and health are deeply intertwined and 80% of health outcomes for everyone in the city is determined right here by policies you make. Your choices for public safety are not more or less jail space, but are instead limitless. It's your lack of extensive funding of alternatives that's holding you back. The mayor's words might sound good, but this might as well have been the 1970s. If you watch the speeches of Maynard Jackson, he said the exact same things. Tough on crime rhetoric is just that, rhetoric. We have 50 years of evidence of the ineffectiveness of more police, more jail cells, in identifying that as public safety. This tunnel vision will get us nowhere. Police and incarceration got us here and it will not get us out. My colleagues and I will meet with you anytime to discuss evidence-based public safety measures. We want all of our jobs to be made easier and more importantly, communities to be safe and healthier. We will not support policies that will lead our patients to experience preventable suffering and premature death. Thank you. I'll leave these here for you and also email. Ann Coons. I 
yield my time to Devin Franklin. He can get one additional minute, but he is already at nine minutes. So, Devin Franklin, you have nine minutes. Sure, Devin. So may I ask a question? We, uh, so, we are here on behalf of the Southern Center for Human Rights, and we, uh, rights, and so we actually ask for everyone who's yielding time to my staff to yield first. But we'd like to go into order starting with my public comment. My name is Tiffany Roberts. Oh, I just have to go, it's already confusing enough with all the yielded time that wasn't documented, so I just have to go in order. So is Devin Franklin here? I wasn't before anyone else. Nine minutes. <laughs> she was first on the sign-in. I am the first person. She was the first, first person to sign out. So I'm not sure what word you have. What is your name? Tiffany Roberts. Okay, you have nine minutes. Oh, these masks. All right, so good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Roberts. I am the public policy director at the Southern Center for Human Rights. We are a nonprofit law firm committed to decriminalizing race and poverty in the Deep South. Uh, and this is the first time I've been before this body in person uh, since before the pandemic. And I have left public comment for you all while you were meeting in a virtual setting. Uh, but I am very disappointed to be here today to speak to you about the intergovernmental agreement that is proposed between the city of Atlanta, Fulton County, and the Fulton County Sheriff. Uh, I'm disappointed because what it, what it demonstrates to us uh, as people who have been willing partners to the city of Atlanta and Fulton County, what it demonstrates to those of us who have spent over a decade studying and working on this issue and hundreds of hours working with this city on this issue um, is that you are committed to enabling Fulton County's pathological abuses of human rights and overcrowding. Um, the county does not take jail depopulation seriously. Uh, Dr. King is often quoted as saying, justice delayed is not justice denied. Unfortunately, today I'm before you because it is very clear that there are members of this council who very much intend for justice delayed to come to denial. I would like to spend some time reminding you uh, that Council Member Bond was the only no vote on creating the task force to reimagine the Atlanta City Detention Center. And I say that not to call out Council Member Bond, but to name that many people who are still on council today were in favor of the work that we did on behalf of the city and our community. After that legislation passed, my dearly departed comrade, friend, sister, Marissa McCall Dotson and I served on that task force alongside our then executive director, Sarah Tatanchi. Uh, we worked with the city law department and others to draft recommendations around policy, how the already small jail population could be even lower. Other working groups worked on architecture and programs, hundreds of hours in the city service because we were in fact in our community service. Thousands of minutes away from our families because we believed that we were building something that would benefit all of our progeny. Millions of moments when we could have been doing anything else. Because the beacon of light coming from Maryland Wind and Women on the Rise was too bright for us to ignore. We heard the mayor say a lot of things and take credit for a lot of things, but what I find really interesting is that the city takes credit whenever something positive happens and never gives community credit. But when we are in a bad way, you blame your constituents. We never say thank you to community for stepping up. We told you all in the beginning of the pandemic that you would see crime go down as people became employed, housed, and cared for. We told you that national experts were telling you not to act rashly during this crime wave because the pandemic had an impact on gun violence. I even did the welcome at St. Luke's Episcopal Church on behalf of my church at a, at a forum about gun violence as a public health crisis and then Mayor Dickens vowed to take the public health approach to curing gun violence. But right now we're asking to give Fulton County a blank check four more years. Four years that once passed Mayor Dickens' first term gives Patrick Labat a blank check. And I want to go into the language of the agreement that I have. And perhaps it's been amended since I laid eyes on it. But if it hasn't, I want to, to enumerate for you 
all of the problems that we found beyond the carceral footprint that you are enabling Fulton County to have. You'll also hear from my impact, my impact litigation director at Southern Center and several others who, are Southern, who have been at Southern Center long enough to see Fulton County's habit of using the city of Atlanta's jail and other facilities in the metro to compensate for their unwillingness and inability to effectively partner to de depopulate their jail. It's important for us to understand that the talking points about sleeping on boats are talking points that we raised time and time again. In fact, in the beginning of the pandemic, we pulled together national organizations who were willing to bail people out of Fulton County who cannot afford their bail. Those efforts were, were thwarted by members, people who are employed by and elected in Fulton County. We have always been there. We have been there for the children who are incarcerated. We have been there. We have been there for the people sleeping in boats because it is us who visits them. We don't rely on talking only to the jailer. We talk to the jailed. And what I heard Mayor Dickens talk about over and over again is the way you government actors are talking to each other. I have not heard one talking point lifting up the necessity of speaking with subject matter experts because if we're going to be serious, your understanding of criminal legal process is superficial and unsophisticated. I'm going to go through some points about this intergovernmental agreement that are really, really concerning. First, it gives Sheriff Labatt full discretion to, to define overcapacity. What does that mean? That means if he says Fulton County is not overcrowded until it reaches 3,200, then you're going to have a 3,200 person jail and 700 people at ACDC. One month he could say it's 3,000, the next month he could say it's 2,000. That is in the letter of, that is within the four corners of your document. As needed basis is defined by Patrick Labatt. The agreement also deprioritizes the most overcrowded facility. You say you're concerned about what's happening on Rice Street. I was a public defender. I stayed at Rice Street until 2 o'clock in the morning visiting my clients. I am not unfamiliar. I visited at the, over, of the, of the overflow facilities like Bellwood. It was even there once when the, when the locks stopped working. I stayed put and talked to my client. I wasn't afraid of them. Right? So we also understand how to treat people humanely and not stoke fear in order to, to perpetuate the remnants of chattel slavery, which is in fact what we are doing when we are increasing, increasing an incarceration footprint. Article 5 of this provision only allows the sheriff the unilateral authority to terminate the agreement. He can do it for any reason or no reason at all. The city of Atlanta, under this, under this uh, agreement, can only terminate this IGA if Fulton County doesn't pay. So if a Fulton County employee who you are shipping in without even looking at their personnel records or their disciplinary history, if they were to rape or assault someone in ACDC, that is not cause under this agreement. If they were to commit any act leaving the city of Atlanta open to liability, that is not for cause under this agreement. You have absolutely no authority to terminate this agreement and have not included any periodic reviews of the performance of this agreement through the four-year four term to give taxpayers, advocates, families of incarcerated people. You have not provided any pathways to evaluate this agreement for a community. It also requires the city of Atlanta to warrant that Fulton will be able to, to provide services in ACDC, but does not mark what the requirements of those services are. We don't even know. I have colleagues who have worked in Fulton County for a long time. A lot of those services that they say they offer, we are not aware of. You have not, if you do not know what they currently do, how can you assess the feasibility of this agreement? If you don't know the space required to operate these things, how can you say that there will be any revenue generated? Because $50 to us sounds like a pretty lowball figure based on what we know about national trends when it comes to what it costs to incarcerate a person per night. And the other thing that I'll note is that this, this agreement not only deprioritizes Rice Street, but it doesn't allow you to transfer people who are very ill, 
It doesn't allow you to transfer people with significant mental health disabilities, and it doesn't allow you to transfer children. And I think we all agree that our elderly and our sick and our young are most, among our most vulnerable. So what we'd like to present to you today as the Southern Center for Human Rights is the long history that Fulton has of this kind of malfeasance and the way that the city of Atlanta has enabled it. Yes, Council Member Bond, to see a problem and do nothing is a sin, but the larger sin is to see mass incarceration growing, to spread misinformation, and then expect for us to do nothing. Thank you very much. Devin Franklin. Councilmember Bond. Thank you. I just wanted to respond, and I appreciate your comments and the work that you've done over the years. Uh, but about my vote, about the panel that was impaneled to study what to do with the jail, I learned in January of 2018 that one of the first actions of the Bottoms administration was to do an analysis of internally in the mayor's office of what to do with that facility. That was headed by former planning commissioner Tim Keene. He came back and reported to the mayor that they couldn't do anything with that facility uh, unless they spent an estimated $120 million to refurbish it. If you recall the work that your, you and other citizens did and the four recommendations that you had, the fourth recommendation came back with a similar number to repurpose that facility. Having that knowledge six months later when the mayor surprised all of us who were serving with her that she wanted to move forward, I felt that the effort to impanel citizens, to have them study something that they already knew the result of was insidious. And I decided not to vote to support it. Am I to respond? Uh, I, I don't necessarily need to. Okay. Um, there, there were several, several recommendations regarding what could happen, including right, there were four. raising, yeah. right, building satellites. Tens of millions of dollars. This failing to act on this will cost us tens of millions of dollars. I, I can guarantee you that. So, yeah, we, we, we don't agree with decriminalization. We don't agree, we don't disagree, rather, on great, having diversion programs. What I've always disagreed with is doing it in that particular building. The city of Atlanta has hundreds of thousands of empty space that persons who want to provide programs, much like PAD has done, could have been providing programs four years ago up till now and still can do it. So we're not in disagreement with that. It costs taxpayers, if we listen to the proposals that have been introduced by their architects and others, it'll cost us $120 million a minimum to turn that building into anything else. I appreciate the symbolism, but there's empty space if services want to, if people want to provide services today uh, for folks to, to divert them from the criminal justice system or to provide services or to partner. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Next is Devin Franklin, who has nine minutes. I think I was next following Tiffany on the sign I have a sheet. list here. Okay. Changes. People yield time to each other. People leave. People come and go. I, I, I was standing behind so, Ms. Remlin in line, so I know she signed up before. I'm not saying she's not on the list. I'm going by the list I have, and I would prefer to go in order. And with all due respect, I'm saying that the order that we signed up in, the actual order. Well, there's different lists that are generated from. We have different lists that people sign up on. But again, state your name, and you can go. So. Y'all can just run the meeting, so whoever's next. Just before I begin, Caitlin Barnes ceded time to me. Do you have that on the list? What is your name? Christina Remlin. That's R-E-M-L-I-N. Yeah, you have six minutes. Okay, thank you. My name is Christina Remlin. She, hers. I'm the Director of Impact Litigation for the Southern Center for Human Rights. I'm from Atlanta. I'm a District 5 constituent. It's really nice to be before you all. I'm a proud product of our public school system here. I'm honored to speak today about the litigation history that we've brought in close partnership with our clients for unfortunately 28 years 
addressing problems inside of Fulton County's jails. We have always cared about the, per the people in Fulton County's jails, and we've worked in partnership with them. Acquiring the South Fulton Jail was supposed to help with overcrowding, but instead it invited a new lawsuit. Now Fulton is again trying with the ACDC. The time is right for solutions, not more bed filling. In 1994, we joined a lawsuit, Stinson versus the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, and made the case that overcrowding and poor conditions were the result of too many people of limited means charged with minor crimes waiting to go to court to resolve their case. It sounds familiar. At that time, Fulton County paid appointed lawyers $50 per case to represent people charged with misdemeanors. Their representation did not even begin until the defendant was brought from jail to court. Every incentive was provided to encourage the accused to plead guilty to get out of jail and go home. Routinely, these people spent more time languishing in horrible conditions in the jail waiting for court than they would have been sentenced to serve. We settled that case with a consent order in 1999 which required Fulton County to ensure that people received legal advice within three days of arrest, to provide adequate resources to the public defender program, and to make good faith efforts to ensure that the defender's offices had more manageable caseloads. This settlement and other pressure from the Southern Center and advocates across the state fueled the creation of the first statewide public defender system in Georgia. But following the Stinson settlement, Almost immediately, we brought another case because of the conditions that were so horrifying inside the Fulton County Jail. In 1999, Foster v. Fulton County, we sued, honored to represent a class of people inside who are HIV positive. The case targeted the complete lack of appropriate treatment of their physical health needs and resulted in a consent decree for preliminary injunctive relief entered a week after the case was filed in 99. The result of that consent decree led to the replacement of the jail's for-profit medical provider with one that offered HIV specialist, effective medications, and improved medical care. And all that, the outcome in that case was life-saving. The effort to monitor that case revealed an unfathomable level of county-sanctioned indifference to human suffering inside. The court-appointed expert in correctional medicine revealed hundreds of people languishing in the jail, again with minor charges, for weeks or months before ever making a court appearance or meeting an attorney. U.S. District Court Mark Marvin Schub oversaw the release of nearly 200 people who had served more time waiting for their court hearing than they would have served if convicted of their alleged crimes. In connection with the monitoring of that consent decree and settlement agreement, it became clear that the culture the jail allowed created systemic inhumane conditions affecting all of the people inside there, not just the class of HIV positive people at issue in our suit. As a result, in 2004, the Southern Center filed another class action complaint on behalf of people detained there. The Harper v. Bennett case grew out of the horrifying conditions exposed and allowed by the jail staff and their leadership exposed during the monitoring of the Foster case. That litigation, again, was re resolved by a consent order entered into in, de in December of 2005. But we spent the following decade monitoring the terms of that consent order and trying to get the conditions on the inside to improve in close partnership with our clients and partners who were experiencing the most direct consequences of those horrifying abuses. The consent order addressed understaffing, overcrowding, sanitation, maintenance of the jail's failing physical plant, medical, mental health care, and other issues. It was terminated in May of 2015 over our objections, despite the evidence that we provided at the time of ongoing violence and deplorable conditions. And just four years after, 
In 2019, the Southern Center, along with the Georgia Advocacy Office, and again, our very worthy clients, filed another suit regarding the South Fulton Jail, challenging their practices of subjecting women experiencing psychiatric disabilities to long-term isolation in solitary confinement cells in deplorable conditions, and discriminating against women by denying those found incompetent to stay in trial the same kinds of programs and services as men receive. The South Fulton Jail's abuse of solitary confinement and extreme long-term isolation practices were an unconstitutional violation of our clients' rights, particularly acute for people with mental health challenges, but tantamount to psychological torture for anyone. Following a four-day preliminary injunction hearing, Judge William Ray granted our preliminary injunction and called the conditions repulsive and remarked that the people who ran the jail really ought to have a hard time sleeping at night. This suit is still pending in the monitoring phase. In sum, for, for the last 28 years, we have a history of bringing these suits. The answer now is for actual solutions that are needed, not more bed filling. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Sydney Harbert, and Joya Thornton has ceded her time to me. Thank you. Hello, those of you up there. As I said, my name is Mary Sydney Harbert, and I'm the operations manager for the Southern Center for Human Rights. I began working at the Southern Center in 2002 as an investigator. And I served in that role for 15 years. My work as an investigator spanned the end of the Foster case, the entirety of the Harper case, and the beginning of the current litigation at the South Fulton Jail. So put another way, I've spent 13 of my 15 years as an investigator confronting and working to eliminate human rights abuses in Fulton jails. During that time, Fulton County spent about $1 billion dollars attempting to relieve overcrowding, increase staffing, and end inhumane conditions under court order. Essentially, Fulton County has played a very expensive game of whack-a-mole, and now they are coming to you for help. So let me just provide some details. Under the consent order entered in 2006, Fulton County paid $55 million on repairs to the facility that took three, more than three years. At the end of that project, the cell door locks in all the housing units still did not work. To relieve overcrowding over the next six years, Fulton's sheriff signed contracts with Metro Atlanta counties of Douglas, Gwinnett, Hall, Polk, Cobb, DeKalb, City of Atlanta, and then the distant Pelham City Jail in Mitchell County, as well as the Cobb County Jail, and um, excuse me, Cook County Jail in Adel, to hold people who would not fit in the Fulton County Jail. Between 2007 and 2012, it cost the Fulton Sheriff $49 million to outsource these people. That's a horrible way of, de of describing the situation. We don't really outsource people, but I'll move on. Efforts to reduce the jail popula population over those six years did bear some fruit. And in 2013, Fulton County did not fund the sheriff to outsource any more people. And everyone who had been detained in other district jurisdictions were returned to Fulton County Jail. The sheriff moved the women to the Union City Jail under a long-term lease agreement, and the population was reduced to 2357 with the use of various court programs, programs that received additional funding from the county. For example, $250,000 went toward accountability courts. $650,000 went to the district attorney. $250,000 went to a jail reentry program. $495,000 went to the superior court. Finally, after 10 years and $4.7 million, I know I'm throwing lots of figures out, the cell locks in all of the housing units were finally replaced. And the county moved to terminate 
the lawsuit. The sheriff didn't join the motion to terminate the lawsuit and said it actually the jail is still chronically understaffed. And they were concerned that if the county got out of the lawsuit that there would be no more money to pay for the staffing at the jail. He went on, the sheriff went on to say that while the jail is no longer overcrowded because all the women had been moved to a leased jail in Union City, that the move, quote, created a need for staffing in addition to the need created by the county's refusal to fund positions needed at the main jail, a situation that creates an unsafe atmosphere for the inmates and the sheriff's employees, quote. The only way the sheriff came close to having enough staff was to pay overtime to work extra shifts. In the first quarter of 2015 alone, the sheriff paid $663,644 on overtime staffing, and that didn't even reach compliance with the consent order. I saw the impacts of the inadequate staffing whenever I went to the Fulton Jail. During those visits, I heard of countless missed court dates, missed doctor's appointments, missed medication rounds, missed legal visits, missed meals, mail, church services, nearly all activities ground to a halt. For a time, people were locked in their cells 20 hours a day and served meals in their cells, denied phone calls, regular showers, or exercise because there wasn't enough staff. Even the sheriff did his own internal staffing study and found that they didn't have enough staff. <laughs> While I began documenting evidence in 2002, the foster case was just ending. It was clear where things were already headed. As Christina mentioned, the last court monitor's report for the case was used as evidence in the complaint for the next case that was filed. And when that case was terminated, the sheriff was already citing why the court should remain and provide oversight. We were already receiving complaints from women in the South Fulton Jail almost immediately. I've seen what happens when the county tries to band-aid the problems without getting to the heart of its wounds, and I've recounted to you all what I've witnessed during my 13 years investigating conditions in Fulton's jails. Endless spending, failed attempts to adapt staffing levels to overpopulation, outsourcing people away from their families and lawyers, and a sheriff's office that didn't think it could protect people absent a court order. So today I am forecasting what is to come should the city of Atlanta enter into a lease agreement with Fulton County and the Fulton County Sheriff. One billion dollars spent and they are back where they started. If you enable the county with a lease, the true solutions will be delayed. That is why the city needs to commit itself to the only evidence-based decarceration effort it's not yet tried, root addressing wellness center that the city's been researching for several years. Thank you very much. My name is Caitlin Childs and uh, Victor, I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Do you have six minutes? Debler is uh, ceding time to me. My name is Caitlin Childs. I'm a resident of the city of Atlanta and a senior investigator at the Southern Center for Human Rights. I have served as the investigator on the South Fulton Jail litigation since 2019. I have had the privilege of meeting with and hearing the stories of hundreds of individuals who have been detained and continue to be detained at the jail in Union City. City officials have claimed that moving people from Union City to ACDC will address inhumane conditions in existing county jails. I want to make it crystal clear that the constitutional violations that led to this litigation were not about the location of our clients. They were about the unlawful and unconstitutional practices of the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. The same Sheriff's Office that will continue to be responsible for their custody and care even if they are housed in ACDC. I want you to hear some of our clients' own testimony and statements in this case. 
MJ, a 20-year-old woman with mental illness, was arrested and charged with criminal trespass for failing to leave the West End Mall. She was homeless at the time and could not afford her $500 bond. MJ was kept in her cell 23 to 24 hours a day during her incarceration. MJ said, quote, the isolation at this jail has made me very depressed. It has made me suicidal. I felt like harming myself. I tried to hang myself with a sheet. The police found me with a sheet around my neck. I have been taken to the suicide cell at Rice Street more than once. There I was put in a suicide cell naked and alone. I was in that cell for three to four days. Or SHP, a woman in her late 30s diagnosed with bipolar, complex PTSD, and generalized anxiety, was arrested when she refused to leave the Salvation Army, where she was seeking shelter, but did not have $10 to pay for a place to sleep. She spent 159 days in jail and was only allowed out of her cell a handful of times. She was never offered recreation time outside and was only permitted to shower twice in 159 days. She was forced to wear the same filthy clothing for months on end and was not provided with basic hygiene products or adequate supplies of toilet paper, nor was she provided with her mental health medication, despite repeatedly asking for it. She said, quote, being locked in a cell all day and night caused my mind to break down. After a month or so, I started to have hallucinations, something that has never happened to me in my life. I remember that the walls started to look like they were moving. On overcast days when the small frosted windows let in little light, the days and nights seemed to blend together. I became incredibly anxious, defeated, and in despair. This was all made worse by the fact that I had no idea if I would be, when I would be released. I began to think I would be locked in that cell forever. I have never been so psychologically ill as I was after about a month of being locked in an isolation cell in this jail. Eventually, she was transferred to Georgia Regional, where she received treatment, including her medications, and started to feel better. She returned to the jail six to eight weeks later, was finally able to go to court, and chose to plead guilty to avoid being returned to the jail and to that cell. She received a sentence of time served. After her release, she said, quote, the time I spent in the South Fulton Jail was the most disorienting and frightening period in my life. To this day, I cannot talk about my time in the jail without breaking down. I'm receiving weekly counseling, trauma therapy, to help me put this experience behind me. Or SP, a woman with schizophrenia who was initially taken to Grady for inpatient treatment before she was transported to the jail where she spent 23 to 24 hours a day alone in a cell without any therapeutic services. Quote, I have a very difficult time coping in the mental health pods. I have felt suicidal many times and have had many episodes. I have been placed on suicide watch about every week to two weeks. When describing Suicide Watch, she said, quote, being on Suicide Watch is a horrible experience. When it happens, I am usually forced to go naked into a nasty and completely empty concrete room. The room has a hole in the floor. I am supposed to use the hole in the floor to relieve myself. It is extremely cold in that room. They leave you in there for days sometimes, naked and shivering cold. Or A.S., who was just 17 at the time, has multiple psychiatric disabilities and was incarcerated shortly after being released from a residential treatment program with no community services in place. Quote, being locked in my cell all day is extremely stressful and makes me feel angry and lonely. When you sit in a concrete room all by yourself all day, it feels like you have been kidnapped. I do not get to use the phone very often to call my mother or family, and it makes me feel sad and angry. A.S. was placed on suicide watch at Rice Street approximately 10 times in a five-month period. Quote, I often hurt myself in ways that I know may seriously injure or kill me. I do not want to take my life but I am always so lonely, and going to Suicide Watch is the only way I know how to get in a room around other people. Simply changing the location of where these folks are jailed will have no impact on the horrors that you just heard our clients describe. 
community-based interventions on the front end that actually address root causes and prevent incarceration, such as those that would be provided by a Center for Health and Wellness, are the best solution to these problems. If we truly care about the people incarcerated in Fulton County, we cannot simply hand over yet another jail for Fulton County to fill with our most vulnerable community members. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hannah Riley, and my time was ceded by Dominique Grant, I believe. You have six minutes. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Hannah Riley, and I am the Director of Communications at the Southern Center for Human Rights and a resident of Midtown. It's my understanding that the people I stand before today are perhaps more accustomed to speaking with the jailers and not with the jailed. This is problematic for a few reasons, including the reality that the experience of having lived, however temporarily, in one of the Fulton County Jail facilities is a very common one for your constituents. In fact, the Fulton County Jail system holds so many people in its facilities that, if it were a town instead of a jail, its population would consistently rank in the top half of Georgia cities. You've heard my colleagues talk about our office's nearly three-decade history of litigation. You've heard the words of people formerly incarcerated in the jails. Despite some patchwork improvements to the county jail's four facilities, the conditions today are not dissimilar from the conditions that federal courts found, these are quotes, deplorable in 2000, totally unacceptable in 2002, a crisis in 2011, a significant threat of serious harm in 2013, or repulsive in 2019, or what the AJC called a dilapidating warehouse of bodies in 1998, a disgrace in 2006, or filthy and dangerous in 2012. These buildings, to state the very obvious, are full of people, many of whom are your constituents. I want to make sure that today we talk about them and we lift up the ways in which they have resisted and organized and cared for one another. The ways that they have attempted, literally for decades, to make the Fulton County Jail a less torturous place to live. I could spend much more than the time that I have allotted going through that rich history of resistance that has come out of the hellish jails run by Fulton County. Here are just a few examples. In 1980, 17 people caged at the old Jefferson Street Jail filed a lawsuit, handwritten, that raised the alarm on what they were being subjected to, including traumatic and unnecessary anal cavity searches, cells that regularly flooded with sewage, non-existent medical care, and denial of access to the law library. In April of 1981, Conditions of overcrowding at the jail became so disastrous that people incarcerated there held a press conference. They described, among other things, tripping over bodies on the floor in an attempt to reach the one available toilet. In 1982, people incarcerated in the jail filed the first class action lawsuit against the facility, alleging racist abuse from staff, racial segregation of the jail, denial of medical care and access to the law library, and more. As I'm sure some of you know, one of the very facilities we've been discussing, the Rice Street Jail, was built in 1988 as a direct result of organizing and agitation and eventual litigation brought by people caged in the old jail. In 1994, a man named Sam Stinson filed a pro se case in federal court against the Fulton County Commission because he had been held in the jail for four months without speaking to an attorney or an investigator about his case. In 1998, my office received a letter from an HIV positive man at the Fulton County Jail named Reuben Foster, who described horrendous living conditions and a doctor who would read to people from the Bible and tell them they were sinners instead of giving them their life-saving medications. In 2008, people incarcerated at the jail filed a pro se lawsuit challenging the unnecessary and traumatic strip searches they were constantly subjected to. In 2014, people incarcerated in the jail sued Fulton County successfully after hundreds of people were caged for as long as five days beyond their scheduled release dates. 
Perhaps you've all been told that the Fulton jail facilities are uniquely dangerous in this moment, thereby justifying this lease. But history reminds us that these problems are anything but new, that a new lease will solve nothing, and that the only solution is decarceration. The lawsuits and articles and consent decrees and so on that have had the greatest impact on conditions inside the jails have come about as a result of the resistance and determination of those inside. This kind of resistance takes bravery, risking retaliation, which could come in the form of prolonged solitary confinement, risking the ire of their jailers, some of whom have already shown their willingness to use violence against the people in their care, these are acts of bravery, and to best honor them, Fulton should be shrinking the number of people they cage pre-trial, not expanding it on Atlanta's watch. Thank you. <clears throat> David Franklin, I had time uh, earlier seated to say by Anna Kuhn that I believe you uh, acknowledge. Mr. Franklin. Thank you. Last week, um, I had occasion to actually catch the news. I <laughs> don't watch it as often, um, but I knew there would be a story on that I, I wanted to hear about. And in this particular story, Councilman Bond, you made some comments uh, related to the proposed lease of ACDC. And you essentially tried to articulate that the lease of the ACDC facility to Fulton County was a humanitarian response to a humanitarian issue. Um, thank you. I immediately <laughs> kind of questioned the humanitarian nature of continuing to cage people who were in jail for offenses that did not quite measure up to what you described as very dangerous crimes. And I was curious as to why you would use that language. And I know that although I and Southern Center do not adhere to the pejorative framing of people and their identity based on what they are charged, I know that it's really easy to get public sentiment to think that it's okay to lock up people for certain reasons. But when we know the true reasons that people are locked up, it doesn't quite hit the same way. The comments that you made that day were premised on two false beliefs. One, that overcrowding of Fulton County is because of the number of persons currently incarcerated being charged with these very dangerous crimes as you described them. And two, that one can claim to be acting from a moral high ground, to be acting out of an obligation to, in your words, ameliorate the condition of human beings while also profiting off of their caging, as this IGA agreement would uh, contemplate. In my several comments to this council and to the full council before, I've heard some people today make reference to the number of people, about 300 at the last time that I was in the middle of my research who were in custody for misdemeanors or non-complex felony offenses as defined by Fulton County. Um, and again, that is a distinction made by the county and not one that I personally subscribe to. But I understand that by the definitions that we are working under and the definitions that we are being given, that these charges are not what we would describe as very dangerous crimes. The last time I spoke, and I was again just partially through my research of the persons who were in custody, it was about 300. I completed that research. Um, and I am happy to meet with you and sit with you all to discuss the cases of the more than 650 people who are incarcerated for non-complex offenses and misdemeanors in Fulton County Jail. And what I mean by that are charges such as those that we would contemplate would be resolved if they had a wellness center or equity center to begin receiving treatment. Charges such as possession of small amounts of drugs, uh, theft by shoplifting, 
criminal trespass, criminal damage, those kinds of things. <clears throat> Without a consideration of what a person is charged for, so it could be a non-complex charge and one you would even describe as very dangerous. There are nearly 630 people who have received bonds. That means that their factual allegations, that their criminal histories have been assessed by a judge, arguments have been made by prosecutors and defense counsel, and judges have granted bonds to people. But these people have not been able to make those bonds. 600 people are sitting in jail, not because of they, their uh, alleged risk or their alleged dangerousness. They are sitting in Fulton County jail facilities because they are too poor to purchase their release. They are too indigent to secure their freedom. These numbers are current as of July 20th. This is a snapshot of what the jail looked like on that day. I don't know what the exact numbers are today, um, but I do understand that uh, the commissioner, I believe it was Natalie Hall, uh, came here earlier today and she had some numbers, and I hope that she would be as open with her books as I intend to be with mine now that my research is, is completed. Um, and I'll be requesting those records and hope to sit down with you and her and anyone else to discuss what can actually be done about re relocating, not being an option, but releasing people who otherwise would have their freedoms but for being too poor. Additionally, out of the 3,000 people that were in jail as of June, July 20th, I learned that about a third of those people, 1,095 in fact, were sitting in jail unindicted. Now, if you don't quite understand what that means, that means they're sitting in jail actually waiting to be formally charged. Over a third of the population of the persons in Fulton County custody are not in a position to bargain about their case. They're not in a position to seek a plea deal, receive diversion, go to trial, because the prosecutor has not said that they are ready to go forward with the case. These are people who have spent months, weeks, sometimes even years. In my 12 years of experience as a public defender, I regularly receive cases for people who have sat over a year, sometimes two years before being indicted. There are management issues within the case structure and the, the case system in Fulton County Courts. The burden should not be borne by those persons who are incarcerated. Everything should be done by this body and its capacity and its strength and honor to alleviate the conditions that deny them their due process and their freedom and liberty. Again, I have data. I've completed that data, so I don't have to talk, talk to you all anymore about what I intend on doing. So Councilman Bond, Councilman Norwood, Councilman Hillis, Councilman Warren, Councilman Amos, I will be emailing you all. I hope to receive responses, and I hope to have meaningful genuine conversation about actual options that respect the humanity of human beings and don't see further caging as the only humanitarian response to forces overcrowding. I see the remaining amount of my time to James Woodall. Hello, Mr. Bond. And for those who don't know, when you're, when you're called out by name, you get the opportunity to respond. Because during public comment, counsel is designed to just listen. But if you could, just lean into your mic a little bit. I can barely oh, hear you. Sorry. Yeah, just because I was explaining to the public that when a member is called out by name, they have the opportunity to respond. Most of the time, we, we don't because we're here to sit and listen to the public. But since you called my name out on a particular issue, I'm going to take the opportunity to respond. 
First, I'll say, of course, I'll meet with you any time you like that we could schedule. I'm more than happy to talk about the conditions at the Fulton County Jail, uh, juxtapose what we do with our own facility, and how do we ameliorate the situation for our citizens who are contained therein. And I can give you my number now. Uh, my personal, my city cell phone is 404 274 8111. My personal cell phone, the bat phone, is 678-886-2286. My home phone, yes, I still have one, is 404-589-1452. And of course, my office is 404-330-6770. Just in short, to response to you, those who are charged with the uh, seven deadly sins in Georgia are considered dangerous crimes. And so the, those persons, as I was trained in corrections in August of 1989, correction officers have the responsibility of three C's, care, custody, and control. And so you have to take care of an individual who's, who's held within the facility, uh, not only protect them, uh, from others, but you know, protect others from them. Uh, you have to control uh, the population there uh, within the facility, making sure that people are housed correctly uh, underneath, whether it's a, a demographic housing, a medical housing, mental health housing, and you have to control that population. You've got to have them in a situation where uh, the other two factors don't come into play to harm uh, the individuals. And I will submit to you in, in my response to you that that is not the case in Fulton County. You and your colleagues have done an excellent job making a case for this contract here today to help to ameliorate and relieve the overcrowding at the Fulton County Jail. Uh, sheriff Labatt is not the previous sheriffs that have served <coughs> and have been uh, subject to the lawsuits that you all have so expertly uh, explained. Was he not party to the same types of lawsuit as Chief Jailer at City of Atlanta? Sorry, I didn't interrupt you at all when you were speaking, and I hope that you would give me the same courtesy. Is that all right? Yeah, I asked my question afterwards. Right, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate and it. So he is not the, the sheriff that is was subject to those uh, lawsuits. And what one of the things your, your group's presentations were also missing was the political dynamic that none of those previous sheriffs had the ability to raise the funds to ameliorate the problems that have faced the Fulton County Jail. That uh, constitutional authority, of course, rests with the Board of Commissioners. And so if the Board of Commissioners is not willing uh, to fit the bill for the sheriff, the sheriff very well can't uh, address those concerns, at least not in a financial uh, capacity. Uh, I have worked. I worked in corrections for four and a half years. I was uh, present when the Atlanta, uh, the ACDC was under construction, and I know why it was under construction. Uh, because the ACE, the jail that is now the gateway center uh, for homelessness in Atlanta uh, was the jail that I worked at. It was designed to hold 400 individuals. We had an average daily population of about 1,600. I worked the morning watch on that shift. I was the classification officer, so it was my job to interview every inmate that was going to be housed, uh, discern whether or not they were mentally ill, whether they had communicable disease, you know, male, female, gender neutral, what have you. That was my job, and I assigned people based on that in, underneath, those situ, underneath those circumstances. Uh, because we had an, an average daily population of about 1,600 inmates, that, that was the cause for the building of ACDC. It wasn't the Olympics, it wasn't to drive homeless people out from downtown, none of that. It was to accommodate that so that we wouldn't get sued, the city of Atlanta, uh, for having an overpopulated space. We had some, the gentleman, the architects mentioned, uh, no, sorry, the doctor, mentioned Maynard Jackson, and I want to rehab Maynard's reputation for a minute. He and Michael Lomax, who was chair of Fulton County, actually worked an efficient agreement uh, between the city of Atlanta and Fulton County to help to ameliorate the overcrowding of the Fulton County Jail back in the 80s. 
that agreement stayed until Mayor Franklin uh, was mayor and was she dissolved it for financial reasons because the city was on its heels after the uh, bubble burst in the real estate market. And that, of course, exacerbated uh, the already deplorable conditions that you also articulately outlined and that was going on at Fulton County. And I believe that the city of Atlanta, uh, given the fact that, you know, oh, this is what I want to say about the architect, I'm glad that he acknowledged that the overcrowding at Fulton County is really Atlanta's problem. And it is. In my, my philosophy, as I was raised as a uh, activist and as a politician here, is that all governments that overlap uh, as central <laughs> governments have an obligation to one another, particularly when you serve the same constituency. Almost 90% of Atlanta's in Fulton County at any given moment. The majority of pe persons held there on cases uh, and it goes up and down, it's a wave, uh, roughly from about 60 to about 90 percent are there as a result of the work of the Atlanta Police Department on cases. And so Atlanta contributes greatly to the conditions at Fulton County by way of the operation of our police department. And so I think it is a moral obligation uh, that we do something about the crowding at the facility. If I had it my way, I wouldn't charge them $50 an inmate. I'd give them the building for a dollar. And I'd ask the sheriff to take on our corrections responsibilities. Because I know the difference, as long as we have a police department in Atlanta, we're going to have a need for jail space and detention space. Uh, because there, there are those who are going to need to be arrested, unfortunately. And so this agreement, I think, is a good step in helping to take some of that burden off of Fulton County. Having worked in the old jail, not ACDC, but what is now the Gateway Center, that was four times overcrowded, I saw those same kind of conditions that exist in the present Fulton County Jail. I was injured on the job in that jail. I carried dead bodies off of the floor out of that jail. I dealt with people with HIV, communicable disease. I worked the mental health floor. i have done all of that. I, w I went to Grady, the uh, lobby, uh, when the new members go to tour the new jail. Uh, the name on the lobby over there at ACDC is named for a man who had AIDS, HIV, was dying in a cell. And the supervisor wouldn't allow uh, then Officer Ball to call an ambulance. He went into the quad and called an ambulance uh, from the payphone to get this man some medical attention. I rode in the ambulance with him over to Grady Hospital. Now the lobby over there, the new jail is named after him. Uh, and he smelled like a corpse. He barely made it over there before he died. So I'm very well versed on how human beings ought to be treated uh, in a corrections facility. I saw it firsthand. I worked a shift 11 to 7, which was the uh, lowest uh, populated shift as far as officers were concerned, but it was the busiest and most dangerous shift uh, for four and a half years. I worked the entire time on Morning Watch. So I'm very familiar with the conditions and toured last year uh, when the city council voted to do this a year ago. Uh, when we went and saw the condition of people sleeping on the floor, stacked on top of each other. Now, I believe that, I believe in accountability. I believe Fulton County ought to be accountable. I believe they ought to build another jail. But I also believe that one more minute of any person that sleeps on that floor, when we've got a big empty building right across the street, two miles away, uh, and we don't do anything about it, as I said, is sin. When we had our previous executive officer of the city be, speak in tandem for fo folks on the border 5,000 miles away uh, and say, hey, those conditions are inhuman and we ought to do something about it. And we're a mile and a half from Rice Street and there was silence and obfuscation and, you know, and, and uh, you know, deflection and everything else that uh, to me did, didn't sit well with me. So that's my position. I'm sorry, you know, we'll, I think we can come to an understanding. None of us wants to see what's going on at Fulton County, but to stand by and do nothing is also equally unacceptable to me. 
And so since you called my name, that's my response to what you said. Yeah. And so thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me uh, to respond. Our next speaker. Am I? Am I? So am I clear in understanding that your position is that the release of persons who do not have very dangerous crimes that you described them is not something you would be for? Well, no. I mean, if someone is charged with murder, if they're, if they're okay, if fine. Some, I said, I said, those murder, crimes that are not very if dangerous. If someone is charged with rape, and as I described to you at the beginning of my statement. I said those were considered seven deadly sins, but the majority of those who were held yeah, there. My question was about those who weren't considered seven deadly we're not sins. Have a back and forth here, well, gentlemen. I mean, it's not a debate. I mean, you was not a debate. Name, I, so I asked I a particular the, question, and you answered different. I, I have the obligation to respond, and so those who are held in, with dangerous crimes uh, that are recognized by uh, whether it's seven deadly sins or what have you, they should not be released uh, because they're obvious. They're the charges. <laughs> them as a threat to the community uh, if they don't have a bond we're not talking about set, those charges if they don't have a bond that has been set they should not be released and so but any person who is over in the facility if, those, if there are those who have bonds that are said they haven't been paid I, it, I believe it was someone attached to your organization said or either it was someone else here said that there were nonprofits that were available to bond people out they don't need the sheriff to do that <laughs> They don't need the county commission to do that. They can organize that and go down there and bond those people out now. So, so you're passing the sand on to a nonprofit. Sir, okay. Mr. Franklin, your time is expired. I mean, I'm going to continue to respond to the response I was giving. I mean, gave you I'm, all I'm, eight I of gave his phone number, so number please I give have. him a call. I'm willing to sit down and meet with you. But yeah. I just sent you a text. We'll talk. Well, you know, give me a text. We can call. We can sit down. I'd be more than happy to do so. Mr. Woodall. Chairman Hillis, members of this committee and to the council at large, good afternoon. My name is Reverend James Major Woodall, and I'm a policy associate at the Southern Center for Human Rights, and I rise today in opposition to this lease agreement. And as all of my colleagues have shared, uh, Chairman, or, commi or <laughs> committee, uh, Council Member Bond, um, what we're arguing is that this is not humanitarian, and it's for a number of reasons. One, People are currently in these conditions that we've been talking about that span the course of generations. This is not, uh, in a real sense, a new issue. And as we've talked about and discussed about the priority of transfer and the standards of evaluation of who would be transferred, uh, the people that we heard uh, one of our colleagues, Caitlin Childs, mention, those people would not be transferred under this uh, proposal. Um, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the collaboration between Fulton County and the city of Atlanta. One, the timeline of the center being repurposed isn't clear. And so if we were to say four years down the line, we would be able to see this made into fruition. The reality is it is not clear in the legislation. The dates are not included. And in the spirit of transparency, uh, Member Bond, you said that there's other spaces within the city of Atlanta that we could use. To my knowledge, I don't, I don't recall any legislation being put forth in such fashion that would make that reality uh, similar to this. And so we see efforts to continue to use mass incarceration, as you called it, the sin. The, the sin I recall in the scripture uh, that God would ask Moses to address in four simple words. He says, let my people go. He didn't say, let's find a way to make this work what Pharaoh was doing, he said, just simply let my people go. And that's what we're asking this commission, I mean, this, this council to consider, is to let the people go. And I also want to speak about this timeline because it is apparent to me as someone who works at the Georgia General Assembly, and Member, member Waits, you, you may recall this some time ago, is that there are efforts currently to make every single felony offense in Georgia's code bail restricted, meaning this is not going to be resolved. We say we open the jail and 700 beds will be added. Well, I guarantee you when the Georgia General Assembly, which is led by Republicans, makes every single felony offense, which we have over 600 on the books, every single felony offense requires a bond. Imagine what crisis we will be in in four years. 
And so what we're saying is there's things happening that are beyond the control of the Atlanta City Council that we may not have control over. I get it. But as we work every single day, this is not going to solve the problem. This is not a humanitarian response. This will only lead to more incarceration. This will only lead to more sin. This will only lead to more d disease and destruction. And so I'll also say this. This is not an immediate response either. Because in the agreement, there's no start date. We don't know when staff will be on board and hired and, and allowed to be prepared to serve our community. There's nothing in there. And then there's zero evidence that proves that this effort will be effective at all. And so to suggest that this is the or a solution is just simply misleading and it's wrong. Granted, we all support public safety. I've lived in this community my entire life in English Avenue. And so I get the concern of being able to live in a community that you feel safe. But what we're saying is the data, the research that we've all used. I've used it at the Georgia General Assembly and it worked. And it's concerning to me that we come to Atlanta City Council with people that we've supported who have ignored the data, the research, the work that's been done for generations. I'm new to the game. There's people who have been leading the effort long before I ever was a part of it. And so all I'll say, yeah, he's seated the rest of his, the balance of his time. That's not a, you can't, he can't do that legally. So. All right, thank you, sir. Well, I'll just, I'll just close and say, we ask that you work with us to actually do the work and the platitudes and, 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 the, and the posturing, that's not what we're here for. And so we want to, and I, I thank you for giving us your information because we're going to use it to work together on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Portal. Mr. Bond. Just a quick response to what I was describing in space. I was making a comparison to the work that PAD has done. PAD didn't wait for the jail to be sold or closed to do anything else. They jumped in, they reached out to the administrator, I think now I think it's three administrations, Reed, Bottoms, now Dickens, and they have engaged their program, they, they've set it to work. There are people who are part of the coalition uh, that have represented, at least when they've talked to me, that they say, well, let's defund the jail, let's close the jail, and then use that money to do something else. What I'm suggesting is that if the need is so great, if their ability is so good, why don't they follow the example of PAD and begin their programs now? We have many recreation facilities around uh, the city that are empty. They're in need of programming. Uh, they've got space. They could be active now in helping to uh, divert people from, uh, you know, getting into trouble or a life of crime. And that was my point about that. That's all, but I'm looking forward to talking with you. Definitely. I just want to make mention that Pat is not in support of this legislation for that very reason, that the work needs to be done now, and we agree. And so rather than waiting four years to start that conversation, it's going to take some time to get that repurposing done. And so we're willing to work on that issue, but to suggest that go, this is going to happen tomorrow is just misleading. This is not. And so that transfer place, I mean, takes time. The evaluation of who gets transferred takes time. And at the same time, there is work being done. So what we're just simply saying is this is not going to get us to where we're wanting to go to together. And so what we're trying to do is propose alternative solutions that will address it in the time frame that we know needs to be, uh, be, be experienced. Well, I, I think you're missing my point about PAD. Right now, PAD is paid out of the general fund, out of taxpayer-funded money. And so I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is that PAD started several years ago. They put their program in place. There are those who are part of the coalition that say that they'll do a program one day once X amount of things happen. What I'm suggesting is that if they want to do programs, why not, get, why not start their program now, okay, <laughs> ahead of whatever happens with the jail or whatever happens with Fulton County. If they say they've got a program of uh, diverting people uh, from winding up in the criminal justice system, the city of Atlanta has plenty of space in the recreation centers around in every corner of the city that are empty. Why not get involved and do it now? You know, and that, and that work is being done, done right now. Uh, that, I, mean, I think that's what we're saying, we're saying is the work is being done right now. So we're we're have have that, I don't see any active program. We'll we'll finish up, Mr. Bond. You know, we'll, we'll talk. You know, uh, we can talk.
That concludes that unfinished presentation. Uh, I have Stephanie Diaz listed. I yield my time to Mr. Devin Barrington Ward. He's at his maximum amount of time of 10 minutes. So if you would like to speak, you may, or Mr. Ward, you have 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Southern Center for Human Rights for coming today with the facts, coming today with truth, coming today with that fire. You all stand in the legacy of Marissa Dotson, and I'm proud to stand alongside y'all. Um, my name is Devin Barrington Ward. I'm a proud member of Communities Over Cages ATL and a member of the task force to reimagine the Atlanta City Detention Center. Um, when speaking in support of transforming this center into the John Lewis Center for Equity, Wellness, and Freedom, I think it's appropriate to bring the words of John Lewis into the space. A former council member here, our beloved civil rights leader, and a former congressman. He said that even through the truth, even though the truth can't be denied or erased, it can be systematically obscured, strategically misinterpreted, and hidden from mainstream comprehension. I don't think there's another quote from the congressman that really sums up what is happening here. We have folks on this council that are intentionally misrepresenting the facts, that are trying to obscure what is actually happening at ACDC and Rice Street. So the question that I have for folks is today, what is it that this city is intentionally hiding from the public's mainstream comprehension? Well, I have some answers. The first thing that we are hiding is that the city of Atlanta really has no real plan for proactive public safety. And we continue to see that. We had a mayor come at this podium and brag about crime statistics that are going down over three weeks. I live in Dixie Hills. My neighbors don't feel safe. The other thing that we're hiding is that the fact that the police cannot keep us safe. We had four shootings this weekend. And what did the police do? They responded after the fact. Where was the proactive implementation from the city to prevent these type of harms from happening to our residents? What we're hiding from the public's comprehension is that the mayor has shown a preference for backroom deals with the sheriff rather than meeting with the community who helped write the legislation he sponsored as a member of council. And the other thing that's very interesting with this whole debate is that Fulton County was overcrowded when the legislation was introduced. Fulton County was overcrowded when council member Hillis, when other members of this body voted for that legislation and it passed with 11 votes. What is also being hidden from the public's comprehension is that this proposal by the mayor and the sheriff, there is no guarantees that there won't be a continuance. Let's be clear, if the sheriff is allowed in this building, he will never leave. He views this as his own personal building. There is ego that is attached to it because members of this community did the hard organizing work to depopulate that jail and there was no longer a need for him. What we are hiding from the public's conscience is that we pay lip service and we make businesses the scapegoat for our public safety issues here in the city of Atlanta. Our public safety issues are not grounded in a few nightclubs. Our public safety issues are grounded in the fact that no one has really offered a real strategy for how we get to the root cause of crime in this city, which is poverty. The other thing that we are hiding from the mainstream comprehension of the public is that overcrowding is not new. I am 32 years old. Fulton County was overcrowded when I was in middle school. When are we going to actually systemically address this issue and stop kicking the can down the road? You know, one of the things that I have concluded through this whole process is, is that some of the people that we love in this building, people who have murals and portraits, folks like Dr. King, Frederick Douglass, John Lewis, I really believe, though, that if Dr. King was alive today, many of you all would be in opposition to him. And the reason I believe that is because there are some folks who have shown that you don't like when the public peacefully protests. When we show our disagreement with your public policy, it is viewed as disrespect rather than a part of the democratic process. What has been 
really offensive to me is how council members have tried to lecture me about the conditions at Rice Street. I've been in Rice Street, not on a tour. I was there as an inmate with our beloved Congresswoman Nakima Williams when we were arrested in 2018 for peacefully protesting the mismanagement of the election by the Republicans. I don't need anyone to lecture me about the conditions of Fulton County. I was on those floors. I don't need anyone to lecture me about the conditions of public safety on the west side. I have been a victim of crime. And so with having holding that duality, I can still come up here and demand that we adhere to what we had originally agreed to, what the mayor put his name on when he was a council member back in 2019, what many of you all who were a part of that council voted for. We're about to consider a lease that has no review, no oversight, no terms that are favorable to the city of Atlanta. You all are opening you all up, up to so much liability. It financially, from a business perspective, does not make sense. And so if you won't listen to the lawyers, if you won't listen to the doctors, if you won't listen to the public, if you won't listen to the civil rights leaders, if you won't listen to some of your own colleagues, if you won't listen to the votes that you all made a few years ago, then who will you listen to? Well, maybe you'll listen to the sheriff who said at his, with his own words at the Fulton County Commission meeting that if we got ACDC tomorrow, it would not fix Fulton County's problems. So what are we even talking about? So if you won't listen to any of those people, at least listen to the sheriff who has also concluded that ACDC is a path to nowhere. And so I'd like to close with this. What side of history will you all be on? I know I'm going to be on the right side of history. Where y'all going to be? I'm afraid of your side. I would offer you the invitation to be on that right side of history because we will be right. We have always been right because we have a pulse of the people. We talk to the folks who are incarcerated in that facility. We are the folks who have been incarcerated in that facility. We are the subject matter experts. We are the checks and the balance. John Lewis also said that every generation leaves behind a legacy. What that legacy will be is determined by the people of this generation. And so what legacy do you want to leave behind? Thank you. That concludes our public comment. Time, but you said that he had his time. I can't hear you. Come up to the mic. Excuse me. I had yielded my time, but you advised that Mr. Barrington Ward had already an allotted time. Is it okay if I um, am? I, am I able to say something? I will give you two minutes. Not technically, but go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Stephanie Diaz, and I come to you as a community member and a member of the Fulton County Crisis Coalition, and uh, we have written something to share. Um, the Fulton C Crisis Care Coalition advocates for better services for people experiencing mental health crisis and those seeking to support them. Among us are people who are directly impacted, uh, crisis care workers, community advocates, who have all navigated enormous gaps in the local crisis care system. We, along with mental health professionals, practitioners, and people in mental health recovery in our broader Atlanta community, are um, here to, dis to ask you to oppose the proposed lease of the Atlanta City Detention Center. <laughs> Many of us have worked inside detention centers or experienced incarceration, the overuse of our local jails to address mental health concerns and broader behavioral health and societal issues, such as the lack of mental health services and the inaccessibility of supportive housing for people who experience mental illness. This is a Georgia norm that must change. We know that the needs of people with mental health concerns are not being adequately addressed in these facilities and instead are exacerbated um, and often lead to preventable deaths. An estimated 60 to 80% of individuals incarcerated 
at Fulton County Jail suffer from a mental health concern, and one third of all people incarcerated at Fulton County Jail receive some type of psychotropic medication. So in closing, um, we will also be providing this letter and writing to you all to consider and read further along with the research attached to it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Uh, before we move on to our presentations from our city departments, I do want to take uh, one item uh, under resolutions first uh, because the sponsor is here with us and has um, somewhere else to be. Uh, so with no objection, I will handle, we will handle 22R4030, which is item number six under resolutions. If you could read that in, please. A resolution by Council Member Alex Warren to amend resolution 21R3040, pursuant to which the City of Atlanta Alcohol Technical Advisory Group ATAG 3 was established to conduct a review and to identify recommendations for changes to the City of Atlanta's alcohol beverage licensing process in order to amend the ATAG 3 meeting location requirements in acknowledgement of the return to in-person meetings to extend the time by which ATAG 3 must complete its review and recommendations such that it shall be within 12 months of its first meeting and for other purposes. Council Member Juan, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Chair Hillis, and thank you, my colleagues and uh, members of the Public Safety Committee. Uh, I appreciate. I, I thank you for the indulgence of uh, letting me speak and kind of crash your party today. Uh, wanted to um, ask for your support of this resolution. Um, what it does is, uh, as you know, ATAG 3 has been working all year in terms of looking at and making uh, proposed recommendations uh, to our alcohol code to support both um, communities as well as license holders and industry. Um, the work is progressing well, but the committee has asked uh, for more time. Um, there was a, uh, a natural time limit and sunset uh, in the original legislation that Mr. Bond had put together, uh, and we're asking just for an extension of that. And while we're amending the paper, the law department has asked us to include a provision in there that allows for um, remote meetings uh, in the event that we go back into that state. Um, I have spoken with the author um, just to let him know about this in advance of today's meeting. Um, and I'll entertain any questions, but I, again, ask for your support uh, for this on behalf of the task force. Becca, please spread the vote. The vote is open. Please vote. The vote is closed. 60 yeas, 0 nays. That item is favorable. Thanks again. Council Member Juan. We'll now go back to presentations and thank you to all of our staff and departments for sticking with us today. Uh, first up, we'll have Atlanta Police Department's bi weekly report. Deputy Chief Peak. Good afternoon, Chairman Hillis and all the esteemed members of the Public Safety Council. We certainly thank you and always look forward to the opportunity of standing in front of you and presenting our bi-weekly report um, as we move forward here. A little hesitant here. Yeah. So our first slide, what we find with this, uh, this particular briefing here, when we look at our year-to-date crimes, as we want to focus naturally uh, with the incidents that we've recently had, where the major focus that we've been moving forward with is gangs, illegal guns, and illegal narcotics that are out on our streets. With that, because what we've seen historically is that that has a direct impact on what happens with our violent crime. Um, so we're 4% up from this time last year, year to date. So as we're looking at that, that's a 4% increase. But when we look at our 28%, we've had a significant decrease over the 28-day and 
currently. We're sitting at a 1% decrease for that 28 day. And then, of course, as we look at the actual current week, this is week 30 represented here. Uh, there was a 13% increase, 85 versus 75 as to where we were uh, this time uh, last year. Additionally, with those particular ones, what we're looking at, although this covers the uh, crime data for week 30, uh, as we look between weeks 29 through 31, we've had a significant reduction of about 11% with our violent crime. So we know that we are making gains in the actual community as we're dealing with those issues. Doesn't mean that we still don't have a lot of work to do in the streets as far as trying to partner with all of the entities, particularly with the violent reduction task force that's um, being uh, instituted with the city of Atlanta and of course then all of the other outside resources that we continue, continually partner with to try to drive those numbers down. Uh, we've certainly uh, had a lot of uh, great arrest as it pertains to that and I know you've heard the mayor already speak and state a lot of those those statistics so I don't want to be redundant but the homicide clear up manner that we continually look at the national averages of 54 percent the city of Atlanta right now we're sitting at 64 percent but there are a number of cases that warrants are already in place and we're either waiting to either identify or locate that person or that person is sitting in another jail and we can't clear that warrant until we get them into the Fulton County Justice System. So when we consider those numbers, we're looking at a 94% uh, reduction, or not reduction, but uh, clearance rate for our homicide number. So uh, the men and women of the Atlanta Police Department are doing a great job trying to solve those cases. Additionally, as we look at property crimes, that's our number one driver. Because of the numbers, when we talk about our vehicle break-ins and you, those uh, auto thefts, shoplifting, and other types of issues, we're constantly uh, working trying to drive those numbers down. We're at an 8% reduction for the uh, period of week 30 and then a 2% up for the 28-day. Uh, 8% up for the year to date brings us a total crime number of 7% is where we are right now, which is a much better place than where we were at this time last year. So although that slight increase is there, those numbers are really and truly been um, going in the right direction. So we want to continue to keep our focus to ensure that we're in the right places doing the right things and trying to build a partnership so that when we see things and we get that information that we can act faster on it and really and truly get the people uh, the help that's needed, and then those that need to go to jail, then we will proceed with those particular situations. As we move forward, I just really want to highlight this next case here, and this was a particular case where we uh, served a search warrant in the 3800 block of MLK, I'm sorry, not MLK, Campbellton Road, 3810 Campbellton Road. Uh, in that particular one, we were able to see, as you see, we took off about 159 grams of crack, 52 grams of marijuana, three assault rifles, two handguns, and made two arrests, both of which had significant uh, criminal histories. Uh, the challenge with this location, just to let you know what was happening at that location, we got the information and went over and started that investigation a number of months ago. But after serving that search warrant and clearing that particular location, uh, Probably about two or three hours later, we received a shooting of a male that was shot. We quickly responded back out to that location and dealt with that person, um, got him the medical help that he needed and tried to further his investigation. We left that location. Probably another hour later, there was another shooting that came up at the very same location. So we know that it's a problem location that we're looking at it, trying to really get to the root causes of what's going on. But we know, again, narcotics is that piece that's over there. And so the homicide unit is really looking and trying to do all they can to bring all those that are involved to justice. But that's, those are some of the things that we see when we really and truly put our units out here and have such successes. Additionally, just highlighting uh, some of the uh, work of the men and women, our crime suppression unit that's really assigned to the Zone 6 unit over at Selena Butler Park, really and truly over there trying to get services and get all the things that's needed and further in investigations from a robbery over there. While they're there, they hear gunshots, quickly see vehicle fleeing from the area, and they were able to make a stop on that vehicle and inside that car. Again, what do we see? Assault weapons and other things of like that nature and narcotics. So we know what's happening in the streets. We know that we have the right resources out there dealing with it. It's something that we just have to stay focused. And then when we find those issues, 
deliver those people where they need to go to deal with whatever they're dealing with. And for those that we can help, we'll help. And those that we need to move forward with the criminal justice system, that's exactly what we uh, strive to do, to make our community safe as possible and ultimately to answer the calls and the questions of our communities. Because once we get the calls and people are saying that they really and truly can't come outside, they can't do these things, it's incumbent upon us to respond and go out and investigate and try to restore order to that particular area. Looking here at our next slide, repeat offenders. Uh, as we see, there's not a whole lot of change there. What we really and truly focus on is who are we dealing with when we're having these particular issues. We know that weapon charges are the 21% 20, of those uh, cases. Violent crime for this particular report out was zero, but then property crime, that number is always consistently high at 37%. So then we look at the averages of the number of people that we're dealing with. 49 years old is what we're dealing with with our repeat offenders. We're constantly dealing with people around the 49-year-old range in this particular one and the number of arrests, which are really and truly uh, concerning, 40. Now, these arrests very well may not be representative of a city ordinance or just a simple shoplifting, but it's a myriad of charges with that being narcotics. A lot of it, most of the time, we're looking at assaults and robberies and other types of property crime. Prob property crimes along with some violent. Number of felony convictions is nine. So ultimately trying to look at these cases to figure out what's happening with each individual calling pad, calling those other resources that are out there to see what we can do to try to make those people hold if we can. But again, uh, making sure that we restore justice in the communities where they are actually having the greatest impact. As we look at Connect Atlanta, that's our real-time tracking center, Connect Atlanta, trying to really and truly push the word out, continue to grow our network. Um, it's shown to be beneficial on a number of cases that we've responded to, some homicides, some shootings to where we can actually get that, that footage, really look at it and turn around and put the cases together and present a case to the district attorney's office that would be compelling so that we would make sure that we would get a conviction once those cases are solved. To date, as we're looking at that, um, the registered cameras, I think we're looking at about 45, 43, and then the integrations are 66, 52. So that's slightly over 11,000 uh, cases that we had, well, cameras that we've had um, adopted into this uh, system. So the numbers are heading in the right direction. We thank you for your partnerships and really pushing that information out and ask that you continue to work with us. We'll continue to share that information and particularly with our problem properties to ensure that we uh, go out, have conversations with those property owners, business owners or whatever to see if we can uh, certainly continue to get them to partner with us and put those cameras into the feed and that will really and truly be beneficial for the city of Atlanta for providing a higher level of safety. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that really uh, concludes the presentation here. I don't believe there are any other slides past there. So at this particular point, I'll open up the floor for any questions that you might have. Thank you, Deputy Chief Peake. You mentioned the shooting over at Mechanicsville, the six persons were shot and one was killed. Has, has there been any uh, update or has the person been caught or identified? Or So Homicide Unit is really and truly working those leads as fast as they can and really and truly with the fine tooth comb it's still an active investigation. We have not brought anybody to justice at this point but we are partnering with all of those entities really working closely with Atlanta Public Schools and uh, the actual center itself to go out and do uh, additional knock and talks just to really see who's out there, what's happening. So it's, it's a moving investigation. Were there any cameras in the park? Uh, you know. Not specifically from my recollection of that particular park, but there are some surrounding uh, footages that we're really truly looking at to see if they would be beneficial for us. And just to follow up, uh, the, the shooting that happened over um, I think they were leaving Howard's Barbershop over there on Peter Street when the little boy got shot yes. in the head. Is they got any headway on, on that? Still an active investigation as well on that particular one. We were able to uh, get the footage, and I believe that was already released to the media so that we could really and truly show and put together what happened. Uh, the KUB is going back and really tr tracing the footsteps prior to to figure out if we can make some sense about what happens. But 
that's a case that they have great leads and they're continuing to fo focus on them. Now, I know that uh, when Dep when uh, Acting Chief Sherbaum was here a couple of weeks ago, and I don't want you to put words in his mouth, but I know that uh, he had talked about people kind of intervening uh, before there's a shooting happen. I know he didn't mean for people to get in front of a shooter, but we want to continue to urge people to yes. try to help de-escalate things as much as possible. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, no, we by no means do we ever want anyone to put themselves in harm's way, but to those extent where we have people that are out there who can be a sounding board of some sort to where they can really and truly talk to people prior to things escalating so high, uh, we really and truly uh, look forward to people having that just honest uh, words just to say, hey, it's not worth it. Why are we having gunplay? Because we're having a disagreement. We can agree to disagree and turn around and walk away today and live another day. Um, so that's certainly a concern. And then that's really and truly the um, thought process behind the violence reduction program as I've had the opportunity to really go up to Baltimore and have an in-depth look at that program. Uh, that's exactly what's happening. People who are influential in the community who are having an opportunity to be out there and know that there's specific things that are brewing in the community and how we're able to utilize them and partner with them so that they can say, hey, it's not worth it. Let's squash this and move on and everybody walk away and we don't have incidents that are going to escalate to the uh, level of gun violence. It's really and truly we have to appeal to our people to make better decisions, put the guns down, and, you know, if you had to do something, which we don't condone fighting either, just walk away. If we can't have a conversation and talk, then just walk away because they're, everyone's lives are just really and truly way too valuable for us just to have a simple disagreement to where we start pulling triggers and losing lives. That's just really and truly. We can't continue down that road, so we look forward to those. Okay, just one last point, then I will withdraw. Is this, how is the recruiting of officers uh, going at this point during the year? So, so far, everything is going well. We, we like the direction of where we are. Um, I am happy to report that we'll have about 16 new officers that are coming out of the academy, finishing up their 12-week field training this week, and then will be assigned to all six precincts starting uh, August 11th, if I'm not mistaken, if that's what the Thursday's date is. But to date, so as we're looking at it right now, we've hired about 107, as we're looking right here, and, uh, and then with the fiscal year, we're uh, really on track to continue. Uh, we've sitting at about um, 107 versus 51 last year. So that gives that shows you and truly we're actually having a great number of uh, opportunities for hiring. We've had a number of events and really and truly I think the last major event we had was at Lenox Mall a few weeks ago. Um, focus was sworn people as well as our 911 center. Um, last check, I think the numbers were somewhere around close to 100 people that we were able to process in that particular setting. So those are actually certainly uh, encouraging numbers as well as we look. Uh, for the FY23, we already have 17 people which just started July 1st. So um, looking at the onboarding of September, we plan to onboard already five people that we've already forecast because they're having to get other things in order to prepare to move to Atlanta for these particular jobs. But even here in the month of August, while we're just in the first week, we are projecting about 15 people, and that number could increase based on what's happening with the data that we get back with those packages. So we're certainly having some success with the hiring numbers, and so we're going to continue to look. I think there are a number of, ish, number of places that we're looking for the month of August to go somewhere, probably about 11 or 12 different career fairs or different events throughout the metro area and some that are out of state. So the focus on hiring is serious, and we're having a lot of success um, as we continue to meet with some of our surrounding partners. Um, I'm thankful that because we're really seeing a lot more interest than a lot of our surrounding jurisdictions. So obviously we're doing something right. That's very good. That was draw, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Boone. Thank you. I would just like to again thank Major Jackson and Captain Claxton for um, being hands-on um, last Tuesday night yeah. um, on Wilson Mill Road. They were there personally and also returned the next day to speak with um, the elderly neighbors on that street. Thank you. 
I'll certainly be sure to share that information. And I know uh, to get some other resolutions, they're actually meeting today. They've already met, if I'm not mistaken, with the uh, Parks Commissioner to really strategize and do some other things so that we can ensure that we all work together and present the best product we can for each one of our parks. But uh, naturally, looking at that top 20 number that we had based off the data for crime and what was happening, uh, we've had significant crime reductions with those first top 20. Uh, however, one is too many, so we're still going to go and do all we can to enhance all of our city parks and prioritize them so that we can uh, get the right people in place. Until then, we're utilizing our mounted patrols to really go out there and uh, some of our other external units to get into those places and try to provide a better uh, buffer for safety. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Uh, a few things from me. Number one, the uh, Connect Atlanta. Uh, I would like to see a little more, I guess, promotion and advertising of that. Um, I know it has its own website. However, it, in my opinion, it should be, you know, there should be a link to that website on APD's main page because this is a great program to get people to register and integrate their cameras. And we, <clears throat> we don't, or as far as I can tell, I can't find anything about the Connect Atlanta uh, program on APD's website. <laughs> and like I said, it should be on on the front page um, so I hope, hope to see more about that promoting it because it's as I said it's a great program um, number two I know there have been uh, a few changes at APD including uh, you have a new position so if you could just tell us about those and one of those changes of course was one that we approved in our fiscal year 23 budget and that was bringing in a chief administrative officer uh, that's mr. Peter Amon so mr. Amon if you'd like to come up after uh, deputy chief peak is um, through, I would say introduce yourself, but I believe most of us uh, know you. Uh, but tell us a little bit about your position and what you're hoping to achieve. So, yes, yes, absolutely. And I'll certainly uh, yield so that Mr. Raymond uh, can um, do his presentation as well. So, yes, I moved from Field Operations Division back over to Community Services Division, a division that I've served prior to as well. I think I've served three different divisions within the Atlanta Police Department, Community Services, Field Operations, as well as Criminal Investigations. So uh, wherever, you know, naturally we're trying to put people in place to where we feel as though at the time of whatever's going on, we can address whatever issues. Um, additionally, um, Chief Sensor we dissolved the strategy of special projects and then he's moved over to field operations at this particular point in time. And so Chief Prinzina Span also, we've looked at part of her, um, part of the units that made up her division. Some of those have gone over to uh, Chief Amon as the administrative officer. So we're really and truly just trying to ensure that we align the department with what we need so that we can have the great business continuity piece that can always continue to move and as we move around in the swarm positions that we can be as effective as possible to do what we need to do and uh, with that I, I won't steal any more uh, Peter Amon's uh, thunder will allow him to present so that we can all uh, hear the great things that he has planned for us as well thank you Deputy thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'll be very brief, uh, but uh, as the chief has mentioned on uh, several occasions uh, with the approval of the council and the addition of the chief administrative officer's position, we are trying to add uh, functional expertise and stability to the department, particularly surrounding areas such as fiscal management, uh, human resources, uh, technology, uh, and a number of other uh, departments or, or units of the department uh, which rely heavily upon uh, process and technology. Um, not to exclude, however, the sworn component. Uh, while we will be bringing in uh, some additional uh, professionals, uh, non-sworn individuals into the department in these areas, we will always have a uh, a hybrid uh, and really allow for both the rotation of sworn members into some of these administrative functions uh, perhaps a little earlier on in their career to work with the uh, uh, functional experts and, and professionals and non-sworn individuals um, but also over time provide more stability because as, as many of you have seen over time 
uh, we have a rotation of deputy chiefs and majors uh, and captains and lieutenants, which uh, makes it difficult for areas such as HR and recruiting to really uh, dig in and accomplish what we want them to accomplish. So by adding the functional expertise and the stability, uh, we hope to really drive uh, more performance and professionalism uh, through, the, uh, through the department. Uh, in particular, specifically, I'm looking after the, the areas I mentioned, fiscal management, uh, program management, which are some of our major efforts around facilities, uh, also looking into uh, and, and managing code enforcement, uh, license and permits, uh, fleet, so that's the repair of our vehicles, um, and a number of other areas. So when you think um, uh, of uh, the area of the chief administrative officer, it really is focused on those uh, non-sworn areas of law enforcement, uh, and uh, look forward very much to working with all of you. I've had an opportunity to get to know many of you over time, uh, some I'm looking forward to get to know uh, better, and uh, I'll take any questions, but I'm really only uh, three weeks in, so I, don't, I may not have as many answers just at the moment as you might like. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Amon? Councilmember Boone. I just want to welcome Mr. Amon back. Thank you so much for coming back to help us out. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Bond. Yes, I'd like to piggyback on what Councilwoman Boone said. It is great to have you back uh, and glad to see you here. And we, I know that you will uh, bring so much to our operations and uh, just very, very pleased to see you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Councilmember Amos. Yes, sir. I um, just want to say welcome aboard. Um, glad you're here to look at the processes. Um, our men and women of um, the police department do a spectacular job, but I think what we miss is the process of when they're out there doing their job, they say if this would have happened, then that may not have happened. So I'm glad and I'm hoping I'm talking to the person who's going to find that medium between all the rest of the departments, sworn, not sworn, social services, everybody else to make the city safer. So I'm just welcome aboard and um, if anything I can do to help you, let me know. Thank you, and, and that is in fact absolutely correct. And public safety starts with uh, the 911 call center in many ways, in addition to obviously proactive policing and social services and so many other things. Uh, the 911 center is another area that uh, we're all very concerned about uh, improving our response times and our, our call answer times. So yes, at the end of the day, it's people, process, and technology, but, but you gotta have that process part uh, right. So I'm, I'm here to help, so thank you so much. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. Chief Peak, did you have anything else to add or? Okay. All right. I want to make sure before I just walk away. All right. I think that is it. Thank you very much for thank the uh, bi-weekly update. Thank, thank you. you. Next up, we will have our Atlanta Police Department Code Enforcement Quarterly Report. Director Talley, welcome. Thank you, good evening now. Um, my name is Daphne Talley. I'm the director of the Atlanta Police Department Code Enforcement Section. Let me click here. Is the, wait for the presentation. Thank you. So the last time code enforcement uh, presented before this committee was in January earlier uh, of this year. So today we're going to cover um, FY period 22, focusing on our inspections, our complaint intake versus complaint resolution, which are the complaints that are filed with our office versus our complied cases. We'll also update you on our junk vehicle process. These are the vehicles that we remove or abandoned vehicles that we remove from private property. Compliance resolution, which is our administrative in-rem division, our process improvements, and of course our challenges. So FY22, we conducted over 24,000 inspections. These include our initial inspections. This is the first time that code enforcement is actually accessing the property to confirm violations. Also our re-inspections. This is generally the second time we visited the property as well as our court re-inspections. Court re-inspections, of course, are uh, inspected after a citation has been issued. This is an, uh, a 90% increase from the previous year. Of course, during FY21, our inspectors were not in the field from March of 2020 through July of 2020. So when we returned to the office uh, in August of 2020, we focused on our initial inspections because court was closed 
for a period, but in uh, January of 21, we continue to do our reinspection, so that is the reason for the spike. Also, our compliance or our, uh, the number of complaints that were filed with our office in FY22 uh, was 70, over 7,500 complaints. Uh, this was a 44% increase from the previous year. 27% uh, of those complaints were proactive, so that means that our inspectors continue uh, to um, field generate a lot of those complaints that come in through our office. Our goal each year is try to close out as many complaints that are filed with our office. So of course in FY21, due to the pandemic, we did not close as many of those complaints as we have liked. But FY22, we're back up to our pre-pandemic pre numbers. We complied about 75% of, of those cases that were filed in FY22. Our junk vehicle process. This is something that we started last August of 21. This process allows us to tow vehicles, abandoned vehicles, uh, from private property. Since August of 2021, 20, uh, we've removed 58 junk vehicles. 564 of those vehicles that we placarded uh, came into compliance. Either they were removed or they were registered. We have 44 uh, vehicles that are pending tow. Now, one of the things that we um, wanted to really, really uh, bring to your attention is vehicles that are parked on the street. Those are vehicles uh, that you guys would have to call or the citizens would have to dial 911 for. If those vehicles are abandoned, APD will go out and placard those vehicles. I believe their process is three to five days. If those vehicles remain, they will tow those vehicles off the property. Compliance resolution activity. So for FY21, I'm sorry, FY22, we've demolished uh, 79 properties. That's 30 more properties than we did in FY21 and 21 less properties than we did in uh, FY20. 44 properties are clean and closed. 76 uh, clean and, uh, I'm sorry, clean and cuts were done. These are properties where uh, property owners have abandoned those properties that does not need to go through any type of formal proceedings. These are properties that uh, have overgrowth or trash and debris. The city has authorization to access those properties and clean those lots. That accounted for about 27% of our budget in FY22. We're, we're finding ourselves doing more and more of those. We used to have um, a collaboration with the Department of Public Works as well as the Department of Corrections. Uh, we no longer have those services, so we are electing to go out and um, abate those properties. We have an additional 59 properties that have been awarded to a contractor, uh, either for demolition, cleaning clothes, or cleaning cuts. There are an additional 92 properties uh, that are pending demolition, meaning that we've, we've uh, received a demolition order and they are pending award to a city contractor. There are uh, an additional 1,386 properties that are pending some type of review, either by the administrative in-rem process or clean and cut by a city contractor or through nuisance process. So some of the things that uh, we are working on for FY22, we're looking at revising the 1987 housing code. We want to bring over uh, some of the codes from the International Property Maintenance Code. Uh, a lot of the, the things that are in that 2018 code is kind of redundant, so we went through that code and s selected those things that are missing from the 1987 housing code. More specifically, um, there is a code uh, when, it, when it comes to transferring of ownership, meaning that it is unlawful for anyone to sell a property knowing that there is a code or not disclosing that there is a code violation on that property to the buyer. So we want to bring that over to our code. There's some other things regarding uh, maintenance of swimming pools that's missing from the Atlanta uh, housing code that we would want to adopt and make a part of the uh, 1987 housing code. We also dedicated a, a staff member to train new and existing code enforcement officers. We were using our senior code enforcement officers to train our new and existing officers, but um, 
dedicating that person, that one person, to train those those uh, newcomers as well as those uh, existing officers cuts down on a lot of you know different activity that goes on uh, you know out in the field. So that brings some consistency to the division. Also, we continue to collaborate with our partners. Uh, with the uh, city, city of, uh, I'm sorry, the city solicitor's office uh, regarding the priority uh, blighted properties with the council members, the problem apartment detail. We also uh, collaborated, or uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little cold today, <laughs> but we also participated in the Walk With Me Wednesday with Council Member Amos's office, as well as the cleanup detail with the Department of Public Works. We continue to uh, collaborate with our Fire Rescue Division. They provide us with a copy of the uh, fire report that actually was suggested from the committee during our administrative NVRM work session back in April. And the news collaboration that I really wanted to point it out um, today is with the Fulton County Environmental Health Division. So there's this email that's going around regarding the public storage that I think all of you guys are on. So there is a rodent issue, a huge rodent issue at the uh, public storage facility on Howell Mill. And we partnered with the Fulton County Health Division to go out and do that inspection. And we're going to start doing more of that because what happens is when we get those calls for those, um, those um, storage facilities or even those vacant lots that are overgrown, Fulton County Health Department will go out to the property that is complaining to determine, they would do an interior, I'm sorry, an exterior inspection to determine if there are any holes, how the rodents are getting into that property. They will also provide the rat poisoning or the uh, rodent poisoning to the property owner to put down themselves. So this is a new collaboration that we're excited to be a part of. Also in FY22, we started using drones to assist with code enforcement activity. A lot of times we get these complaints about um, violations that's behind an opaque fencing or uh, a deteriorated roof. So we've been using our drones to do flyovers to confirm these code violations. This is a property on Virginia Avenue that uh, we could not really see from the ground, but the drone assisted and seeing those violations. This is a property on Danforth Avenue. The neighbors for a long time had complained about property issues or violations in the rear yard. We were able to use the drone to confirm that those violations existed in the rear and side yard. Another example, this is on Eisenhower. Uh, storage in the rear yard uh, also saw activity of the uh, property owner working on cars in the backyard. Two challenges that we wanted to point out today is, as I stated earlier, uh, when we returned to the office in August of 2020, we focused on those initial inspections. And so we did not really focus on our reinspections until January of 2021. And so that has caused a little bit of a backlog with serving those criminal citations. Of course, these are the citations that we have to serve personally. So we have a process server that we use as well as our police officers and code enforcement officers assisting in um, serving those citations. So we do have a little bit of a backlog that we're trying to work through. And of course, um, as with City of Atlanta, uh, all department staffing levels for us uh, are a challenge at this time. We have 21 vacancies. Uh, our critical positions that we're working with uh, HR to fill as soon as we can. Uh, we have a code enforcement supervisor vacancy, two code enforcement senior officers, and 10 code enforcement officers uh, that we are missing. Currently, we have 13 officers in the field. Of course, pre-pandemic, we had 21. Uh, so we are in need of those positions. And I think this concludes uh, our presentation today. I thank you for your continued support, and I am available for questions at this time. Well, thank you, Director Talley. <clears throat> A few questions for me. Um, the, so when we speak of criminal citations, 
It says you have a process server, so I can take it. Those can be served by unsworn personnel? That is correct. Um, yes. Have we looked at either, is that, are any of your vacancies process servers, or have we looked at contracting with a process serving service, or? So we have, and so now that we have the new budget, and so we are trying to, um, we, we've reached out to some other process servers who are interested in serving citations for the city of Atlanta. So there are about two or three more that we are entertaining at this time, and we'll be doing a solicitation through uh, the Department of Procurement. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And of the 21 vacancies, how many of those are actively posted right now, if you know that number? <laughs> Uh, the code enforcement officer positions as well as the code enforcement senior officers. So that, how many? And I think the code enforcement supervisor uh, position will be posted this week. Okay. So how many is that total that's posted? Uh, that would be 13. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the, so I kind of wanted to speak. I have legislation on our agenda, but since you're already up here um, and you went over your backlog, mm -hmm. so um, colleagues, I have 2201619, which is item number two on our agenda. Um, this is something that uh, we did last term, and last term we added an additional 1.5 million uh, for code enforcement demos. I sought, uh, given the funds available in that uh, fund, uh, to double that to three million. Um, so just talk about, number one, what's already in your budget in FY23 for funding, uh, what you expect or have currently in CDBG money, and how this $3 million would assist you in addressing the backlog, because even if we just count the 37 plus 92 that have already been awarded or um, okay. have orders, that's roughly probably almost $4 million, if not more. And then we won't even talk about the 990 that's pending in rent service, which all of those will not be demolitions. Um, right. But that's a lot of money, and so speak to us a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, so for FY23, we received $2 million for abatement projects uh, through the general fund. Uh, currently, there's $700,000 uh, from CDBG for abatement projects. Uh, we've well on our way to spending that. Uh, I believe the CDBG, uh, we may have about $500,000 left in that. Uh, the 1,387 uh, projects that are awaiting some type of uh, review. So if a, a demolition project, because we, our de current demolition contract includes asbestos abatements. So the average cost of a single family demolition is around $24,000. And as I stated, we're doing more cleaning and cut than we are cleaning closes. And so that accounted for 27% of our budget. So um, again, every house or of those 300, 1,386 complaints that we have, those are not 1,386 demolitions, but there is some type of abatement that needs to be done to those uh, to those properties. So that additional three million will definitely assist in uh, eliminating a lot of those projects. Not all. Again, the uh, average cost of a demolition is twenty-four thousand right. dollars. Well, that's great to hear. Um, before I yield the floor, I do have one more general request for all of APD. So, Chief Peak or uh, Mr. Amon. Uh, we haven't received one in a while, but if we could get an updated org chart for APD, given the changes, and usually that includes, you know, the name and the contact number, if we could get that, that would be much appreciated. Yes. Colleagues, any questions for Director Talley? Councilmember Amos. Uh, no question. Just basically want to say thank you, and I'm going to say it slowly because I don't want people to think that you did not do it anyway, but every time <laughs> I have sent your email, someone from your office uh, have gotten me the information that was needed, and that's very helpful because now I'm able to talk to the constituent and tell them that although the property seems as if nothing is happening, you have given me dates, times, citations, court numbers, everything we needed to make okay. that constituent feel um, better. So just thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilmember Boone. Yes. yes, Director Talley, do you have any information on the property on Baker's Ferry Road? Yes. So, and, and thank you for uh, sending that information to us. So, 
the one property that you identified, there are actually three properties, and they're owned by uh, family members. And so we sent uh, code enforcement officers as well as sworn officers out there on Friday and spoke to the tenants. I think there's a, a father, a uh, couple of brothers, sisters that all live in, in those properties. And so they were to go back out today. I've not received an update because they were going to issue citations uh, because they were giving us misinformation. But once they came back in and we did the research, we saw that they're all related. And so we'll be issuing citations for those properties. We found several code violations out there on Friday. The altercation at Wilson Mill Park um, apparently started at one of those homes where they congregate and have parties in the yard daily yeah. on Baker's. It's across from 3798 Baker's Ferry. Right. So, so the sworn officer that we sent out there with the code enforcement officer was very familiar with uh, the property. So he was going back out there again today with them to issue those citations for those code violations. Any other questions, comments for Director Talley? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, next we will have our quarterly update from our city solicitor's office. Solicitor Carter. Good evening, Chairman Hillis and all members of the Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee. I am Raines Carter, City Solicitor. I am joined today by Deputy Solicitor Erica Smith. And thank you, as always, for this opportunity to give you an update on our activities for this quarter for FY22. Today we will go over record restriction. We would also talk about our participation with APD in the new recruit training. So we're very, very much in line with getting these officers up to speed so they can get out and protect us as soon as possible. And of course, uh, we'll be talking about the Nuisance Properties Initiative, our collaboration with our district attorney's office, and our community prosecution and outreach. As I always talk about record restriction, what I've added this time is just to give you a little bit of a handoff on the restriction process. Most people call it expungement. Of course, it was changed by state law by the legislature. And so anyone arrested before July 1st, 2013 have to complete an application with the arresting agency, APD or other agencies. If it is after July 1st, 2013, we have set up a process, and, and thank you for the support you all have given us on this, where you can complete your form directly online with the City of Atlanta Solicitor's Office on our website. And the way that process works is that the documentation is submitted uh, including identification and then any certified disposition letter that you may receive from your court proceeding. We have an attorney dedicated to that process that actually reviews the file, checks the histories that are necessary, and then makes a determination under the state law provisions regarding if a person is eligible for that record restriction. Uh, once that is submit it, it comes across my desk personally to take a look at and to sign off on. And we try to have these back to people within four to six weeks. We're going to continue to work on that time to try to get that time down a bit. But we think this is very important in terms of people having a second chance to go on with their lives. And the legislature is working on some provisions, and I think they may come up in the next legislative session to expand those types of things which have been, uh, which can be restricted. And these things are being worked on by uh, prosecutors in the state. On our next slide, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of the ongoing training sessions with the Atlanta Police Department. Now, we've always done in service training where we have officers that come for review and updates. But this year we're 
particularly focusing on the new recruit training. And so we have attorneys in the office, uh, Deputy Solicitor Andrew Taylor and others. They are very active in terms of going out and helping with the new recruits. Uh, we've done uh, training sessions between four to eight hours. And the most recent uh, session was held on May 4th. So we will be working as we are bringing on officers. Ticket writing, of course, writing the citations. Effective police report writing, which can be extremely critical in terms of building an evidentiary basis for cases in court. We also put them through exercises with courtroom testimony and demeanor. It's a lot to be in a police officer and we want to make sure that we cover all the aspects that are needed so we actually set up uh, mock direct and cross-examination uh, of questions so that they won't get rattled in court and they'll be able to properly present the evidence needed and we have other types of interacting uh, learning exercises Let's see and our next slide takes us to our nuisance property initiatives. And I'll ask if Deputy Solicitor Erica Smith will come forward and take us through the rest of the presentation. I remain here for questions. And as always, it's an honor to be before each of you. Good evening, I'm Erica Smith, Deputy Solicitor, and I'm going to talk about the Nuisance Property Initiative. Our office continues with our Nuisance Property Initiative uh, with the administration as well as working with various city departments. We still have our bi-weekly uh, committee meetings for our problem properties, but also we've added a, a, a layer. We actually meet with the uh, mayor's office and um, uh, uh, the members of housing to talk about our multifamily uh, dwellings that are problem properties. Um, we also attend weekly uh, APD meetings, the COBRA meetings, because crime statistics actually uh, puts us in the direction of what property we're going to take in or what property actually makes our list. So uh, the problem properties actually are divided into three different buckets. We have our nightlife uh, problem properties, and those nightlife problems are the clubs, bars, adult entertainment establishment, and restaurants. Uh, we have our uh, multifamily units, which are our apartments, and we have the commercial and residential properties as well. And many of those commercial properties are convenience stores and gas stations. We have our next upcoming nuisance hearing on next Thursday, which is August 18th. In regard to the multifamily dwellings, we have partnered with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office to form a collaboration to identify problem properties that have substandard living conditions. Also, we're able to share information. Certain properties, if you have sexual offenses and crimes or drug offenses, are a nuisance per se. So, if someone is arrested for a drug violation, we can partner with the Fulton County District Attorney's Office to see if that person was indicted and if they were convicted because the conviction will lead to the property being uh, uh, deemed a nuisance per se. We also work together on any misconduct, to work together to uh, find if there's any misconduct or criminal activity that's coming with the property owner, as well as the landlord of those particular properties. Oops. We have been really busy this quarter and over the summer. Uh, the solicitor's office has uh, many partnerships that we work with uh, MPU members, the community, as well as with council members in various city departments to volunteer and get and guest speak at several events throughout the city, including the following. We had our fight against blight in action where many of our uh, uh, office uh, members participated in uh, cleanups throughout the city of Atlanta. We also had uh, on Friday, June 10th and July 15th, we had our third and our fourth senior citizen public safety events. Uh, and those were events were uh, hosted along with Councilmember Bond and Councilmember Boone. So thank you all for your participation and your hosting of those events where we can talk with our seniors and talk to them about crimes that are being perpetrated against them and uh, just talk to them about public safety issues. Also, we've been uh, volunteering at the Mayor's Midnight Basketball Games as well as various food distributions and at uh, 
back to school events. These are just a listing of all of the partnerships and the events that we participated in. And again, we've had uh, various participation in food drives with Councilmember Boone, Councilmember Bond, uh, the mayor's uh, basketball games, midnight basketball. We partnered with Councilmember Amos for his food giveaway at Rodney Cook Park. We also had our fight against blight in action on May 14th at C.T. Martin Recreation Center. And again, uh, our senior citizens public safety events that we held on May 9th, June 10th, and June 15th. And also, we had a senior community health and wellness fair that was held on June 9th. These are just some photos of Fight Against Blight in Action where uh, members of our office volunteered to clean up. Various pictures of the food giveaways that we uh, participated in to help people that were uh, having food insecurities. And again, Midnight Basketball, as well as other community events that the Solicitor's Office has participated in over this quarter. Our partners, and it's this time if you have any questions for myself or Mr. Carter, we'll be happy to answer them. All right, thank you, Solicitor Carter, Deputy Solicitor Smith. I don't know who had their hand up first, but I, ladies first. Councilmember Boone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Carter, Ms. Smith, Mr. Mr. Carter, thank you for your leadership, sir, um, especially you all attending our meeting with um, our district attorney. Um, this issue with the nuisance properties, the negligent landlords has, has really, really, really taken um, our community by storm. We did not realize how many people were living in these horrible, dreadful conditions. So thank you for putting this on your priority list. And also, as far as 3657 ML King Jr. Drive, the Sitco, um, that particular gas station has really, really, really destroyed that part of the Martin Luther King Jr. Drive quarter. So we are looking forward to our day um, in court on August 18th. But again, your presence and your leadership, sir, um, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Bond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to also thank uh, both both of you, Mr. Carter and Mr. Smith, for Holla Carey and uh, the staff that accompany her to our food drives uh, every Wednesday. They're there without fail. <laughs> and they lift a lot of boxes. They do a lot of uh, blue-collar work in the service of uh, Atlanta citizens. And, of course, the uh, senior citizen education seminars that we are doing around the city are tremendously helpful uh, for our seniors. And I hope it's something that once we hit... I believe we've done four so far, and once we hit all six zones, that hopefully next year uh, we, there's something that we can continue. So I just want to give my hats off to you, along with Council Member Boone, on the uh, extemporaneous work that you're doing uh, outside and around your office. You know, I really, really do appreciate it. Any other colleagues? Comments, questions for the solicitor's office? I think I do have one, <clears throat> just to follow up. I would like to, um, I know staffing is an issue across all departments, but would love to, again, do a, um, what I mentioned before, some corridor sweeps. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just thinking of Hollowell uh, in my district. Um, just making sure and educating people at first, giving them notices as to what uh, is wrong, what, how they can improve. And then following up in a, you know, a month or whatever the appropriate time is, because uh, we have tire shops that have mounds of scrap tires out um, that will eventually end up in our creeks and rivers, um, and just a lot of other issues. So uh, if we get together on that uh, soon, that would be great. Okay. All right, colleagues. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Municipal Court quarterly update. Chief Judge Portis. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I'm Chris Portis, the Chief Judge of the Municipal Court of Atlanta, 
and it is a pleasure to be here this afternoon to provide uh, our quarterly presentation. Uh, this one is promised to be brief. Uh, what we did want to do was provide a very quick snapshot of what the caseloads are looking like as we move uh, further into uh, calendar year uh, 2022. Um, looking at the trend of where we started in January, uh, still trailing out of the COVID volume that we were receiving and moving into the spring, uh, which you can see, especially once we get to April, May, and June, uh, the case volume begins to increase, uh, especially with the month of May in particular, uh, and that represents a volume of matters uh, that matches what it would have been in a regular year like 2019. Uh, month over month, uh, at this point, uh, we are averaging about um, a 33% increase over where we were a year ago and especially over 2020 uh, with the new traffic cases that uh, are coming in. Uh, we have been able to work to get our staffing levels um, somewhat replenished. Um, it's almost a shell game in some respects with the number of resignations. So as we hire one, we lose two. Uh, but we've been trying to keep pace with that, which has allowed us to keep pace with the volume of cases. Uh, also, we are back uh, running um, full calendars as we have moved away from COVID into 2022, uh, which has also allowed us to not only uh, handle the volume, but also uh, maintain the clearance rate of at or above 100% when we factor in the number of cases that are aging that are also being disposed over the new caseload. Uh, same type of metric for the criminal case count. Uh, in this case, uh, demographic here takes into account all case types that are designated with a CR case number. That's anything from uh, a disorderly conduct to a drug paraphernalia uh, to even the housing and code violations that are designated with uh, the CR case designation. Uh, looking at these numbers, uh, these numbers are, are yet to return back to the levels that they were uh, in 2019 and are still trending uh, somewhat on the anemic side. Uh, we have a uh, regular flow of the run-of-the-mill basic uh, criminal matters. Uh, we are still running well behind where we typically are uh, with the housing and code-related violations. Uh, we do watch these metrics because it has a lot to do with where we actually uh, target court resources. For instance, right now, there is a dedicated courtroom for housing and code. Uh, where these numbers are trending, however, we are taking a look at that to see if we will be changing that, divesting that subject matter across all courtrooms. The numbers uh, for 2021 and now into 2022 uh, just don't dictate the need for a dedicated courtroom at this time moving forward. So something we'll continue to watch the trend as we move through the end of the year before we make that decision. Uh, looking at the failure to appear rate, there is some good news uh, in this slide, especially in relation to the first slide. Uh, looking at this number at the beginning of the year, it was unseasonably high, especially in relation to the new caseload that we were receiving. Uh, we instituted a zero tolerance policy uh, moving from January into February. You can see that number dip down. Uh, if you look at May, June, and July in particular, you see that number raised back up. But remember, on that first slide, we nearly uh, tripled quadrupled the new case count. So in proportion to the new cases that we're receiving, we're still trending relatively seasonal on where we should be uh, with an FTA rate. Obviously, 5,700 is much too high, uh, but we have uh, instituted policy procedure on the court side that is working to reduce that number and also uh, close out those cases for individuals who do go into FTA status. Uh, just looking at where we are in particular with the FTA walk-in court, which is primarily aimed at individuals whose license have gone in suspension because they have missed that court appearance. Uh, since we started that process into January, early February, that has allowed us to close just short of 12,000 cases. Uh, it is a labor-intensive uh, operation because of the nature of those cases. Uh, we will continue to operate 
uh, a specialty FTA division through the end of this year to handle those cases. Uh, we'll see where we are in December to see whether or not this is something that we specially do moving into January of 23 or if it's something that can be phased out. Uh, but we're obviously keeping an eye on the trend uh, and what it means for the aging case demographic. One of the things that I told this committee in the past, we did not come out of COVID with uh, a typical backlog. The thorn in our side coming out of COVID were the number of cases that were in FTA status and wanting to get those cases in resolved before they aged to a point where it was difficult to get them closed. Uh, that's why this is very important to us as we move uh, through the balance of the year. Also, another piece of good news about this, uh, as we have now moved through the summer, 90% uh, of the cases that are appearing on the FTA court docket now are 2022 cases. So we've moved beyond the cases from 2020 and 2021 that are in FTA status. These are now cases that have gone into that status and that are less than 90 days old from their initial court appearance. And that is it for the quarterly presentation on the demographics. And I'm happy to answer any questions that this committee may have. I thank you, Chief Judge Portis. Colleagues, questions, comments? Councilmember Bond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chief Judge, for your presentation. Uh, I know that you had issued a, uh, I guess, an executive order for operations at the court. It, including your presentation, is that part of the turnaround that we're seeing on the FTAs? In uh, part, some. Uh, the. Uh, strict compliance with state law, especially on the traffic cases for the failure to appears, has been very critical, uh, but also following the Atlanta ordinance, uh, anyone who's already out on bond who fails to appear, that bond is subject to be revoked as well as we've worked with APD to make sure that we can get warrants up for those individuals uh, immediately. So if you have been arrested previously on your case and then you fail to appear, uh, the judge handling that case issues that warrant. Uh, we've worked with F uh, APD to also get those fast-tracked on GCIC so that we can get you back into the system, get you back answering that charge, and we can also see uh, that uh, you were already out on a bond that you did not come back to court on. Uh, follow up with a couple of the conversations that you and I had end of the spring, um, and I think this will be some welcome news to you in particular. Uh, what we've been doing since we've talked is working to ramp up what you formerly knew as our pretrial services department. Uh, we have filled some uh, key positions, and we're going to be working with corrections so that, uh, fingers crossed, as we move into the end of this month, starting in September, the pretrial services department will be reengaged with reviewing individuals and their eligibility for signature bonds to make sure that more individuals not only have the access but the proper cases, proper information is looked at and vetted before an individual um, is released. We've heard uh, a lot of concern from corrections in trying to effectuate that process. Uh, the how do we do this? Uh, what information do we need to take into account beyond the four corners of a citation? and we're looking to supplement some of the work that they're doing uh, in an effort to aid in public safety in general. So uh, I'll keep you posted, but I'm looking towards a soft launch uh, at the end of this month, uh, full engagement at the beginning of September. It's going to be a, a, a tough revamp because this is a 24-hour operation, as you can imagine. Uh, keeping staff in the times that we are in now has just been, been more than a notion. So we're hoping that we'll be able to maintain the crew that we have been able to hire and train, get them mobilized, and bring back a very needed component uh, to, to that evaluation. No, that is very good news. Uh, will that require legislation from us or right now, is that something you all working out? Uh, right now it won't. Uh, but I keep you posted uh, on how it operates and if, I, if we need any uh, assistance on that front. But I'm, I'm expecting that this should be a pretty seamless integration uh, and it should help make a major difference. So that will, I guess, address the, the question between, I know they said that the jail system wasn't talked to the court system. So this is making those connections again directly, right? Right. And, and you know, you know from experience that you can desire to have a, a, a magic program that's going to set off a, a red light or a green light, uh, but the information concerning the individuals has to be reviewed 
every case, every instance. Um, right. If that wasn't the case, then we wouldn't be in a constant business of updating GCIC for aliases, uh, known addresses, tattoos, that type of thing, because so much changes about the dynamic of an individual, especially those who get creative about how to mask identity. Uh, so it's something that has to be done. It's best done uh, by someone who's trained to do it. That's what we are hoping to, to add to this element to make sure that these cases are getting the proper review that they need. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That is good news. Absolutely. I would draw, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Vaughn, colleagues. Any other questions, comments for Chief Judge Portis? Chief Judge, I did have a few items. Um, you stated the court is back, uh, I, don't, I think you said full time or some version of that. Um, what's the appearance policy? Does both the defendant and the victim now have to be in person at the court? Uh, the, appear the appearance policy has been in person since we opened full time back in October of, of 2020. I think the part that you're speaking of, of back full time, is we have increased the calendar capacity to be reminiscent of what it was uh, back in 2019. So the traffic calendars, for instance, have max loads of 100 positions uh, per calendar. Um, a victim or a witness um, is on the honor system to appear unless one of the sides subpoenas them to be present uh, in court. And that's something that either the city or the folks who are representing the defense uh, will handle if that is their prerogative in, in any particular case. Uh, as for individual defendants, yes, uh, it is mandatory appearance. Uh, failure to appear will carry with it uh, whatever penalty uh, can be levied for the run-of-the-mill traffic cases in most instances that starts with the license suspension process for individuals who are previously out on bond because they were initially arrested those individuals have to appear if they do not appear a warrants issued that morning for their arrest understood thank you for that and uh, one follow-up item uh, you'd raise this concern and the budget hearings about the upgrade of the camera system in the court, which we included uh, in the FY23 budget, what is, can you offer an update on that? Uh, we're working on it. Um, you know, we have to get it through procurement, so we have to identify, we've identified a, a vendor. Uh, now it is whether or not we can legally move that vehicle through the procurement process, so that is a work in progress. Um, everything is a go, otherwise uh, the Department of Finance, the Chief Financial Officer, dedicated his attention to it, uh, made the resources available. Uh, so at this point, it's a matter of if we can get the contract through, then we'll be able to, to make the purchase, and that system will be upgraded. Uh, we'll be uh, better for it because it hadn't been upgraded or upgraded at all since it was first installed some 20 years ago. So I'll keep you posted on that. Once we're actually able to get to an implementation phase, then we'll at least know it's just a timeline at that point. Okay. Thank you for that. One last check with my colleagues. Any questions, comments for our Chief Judge? Right, thank you, Chief Judge Portis. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You as well. All right, colleagues. We will now move to our consent agenda. I will make a motion to accept all favorable claims, items 1 through 10. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. Wait, says I am having trouble getting into the system. Please vote. Councilmember Rowe? Vote is closed. Right, six yeas, zero nays. Those items are favorable. I will make a motion to adverse all unfavorable claims, items 11 through 102. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open.
Council Member Bowe? Vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. Those items are adverse. And as a follow-up, uh, thank you for the law, to the law department, a number of items on the consent agenda, so thanks for working through those claims. Moving on to our regular agenda, ordinance for second read, 22 1356 An ordinance by Council Members Dustin Hillis, Jason Dozier, Matt Westmoreland, Jason Winston, Mary Norwood, Howard Shook, Liliana Bakhtiari, Alex Wan, Andrea L. Boone, and Amir Faroki, as substituted by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee to amend Chapter 74, Article 5, Section 74-175 of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances to authorize the Municipal Court to order the abatement of a public nuisance established as a result of violent conduct or crime during with certain properties through the immediate closure of such properties to require the Municipal Court to order the abatement of such a public nuisance through the immediate closure of such properties where the Municipal Court has determined such a public nuisance to have occurred twice regarding the same property within 24 months and for other purposes. All right, and as was discussed uh, when the mayor was with us, uh, we want the Nightlife Advisory Council to review this and some additional conversation has, so I'll make a motion to hold. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is held. Next item is item number two, twenty-two oh sixteen nineteen. 19 an ordinance by Council Member Dustin Hillis authorizing the Chief Financial Officer of the City of Atlanta to amend the FY 2023 budget by transferring funds from the Planning Private Property Demolition Fund and adding funds to the Atlanta Police Department Private Property Demolition Fund in the amount of $3 million and zero cents for the purpose of providing funding for the performance for the performance of the in-rim demolition of dilapidated structures and for other purposes. There is a substitute, Mr. Chair. It does not change the caption. Yes, we do have a substitute, so I'll uh, just add some missing account number, so I'll make a motion to uh, substitute. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. <clears throat> the vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That substitute is before us. I'll make a motion to approve a substitute. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is favorable on substitute. Item number three, 1624 an ordinance by Councilmember Andrea L. Boone to amend Chapter 10, Article 2, Sections 10-92B of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances so as to provide an exemption from the distance requirements listed in Section 10-881 for package stores licensed to sell malt beverages and or wine for an establishment located at 510 Fairburn Road, Southwest Atlanta, Georgia, 30331 and for other purposes. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 68 0 nays. That item is favorable. Item number four is 22 1632. An ordinance by Councilmember Michael Julian Bond to authorize the mayor or his designee on behalf of the city of Atlanta, Georgia to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with the Fulton County Sheriff and Fulton County, Georgia for the temporary housing of adult Fulton County detainees at Atlanta City Detention Center in the custody of Fulton County, which have been charged with or convicted of violating federal, state, or local law or held as a material witness on an as-needed basis where the number of Fulton County detainees so housed in ACDC at one time shall never exceed 700 detainees for a term of a for for a term of a period not to exceed four years with no renewal. No renewal term options with such an agreement to be revenue generating all such revenues to be deposited into the accounts listed herein and for other purposes. 
Understand we have a substitute to, to correct uh, funding streams. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. I'll make a motion to bring the substitute forward. Second by Councilmember Norwood. The vote is open. Please vote. The vote is closed. A zero nays. The substitute is before us. Motion to approve by Councilmember Bond. Second by Councilmember Norwood. We do have some speakers. Councilmember Waits and then Councilmember Bakhtiari. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. While I again support the spirit and intent of the legislation, uh, I think the subject matter experts here today spoke to all the reasons why we should not rush to enter into this agreement. I think we need more time to answer many of the questions that have been asked before us. Uh, in addition to the thousands of emails and phone calls that I believe each of you have also received, I think that there is a strong need for a work session in addition to some type of group uh, that would regulate the populations of individuals who would go to these facilities. It has been brought to my attention by those who actually serve uh, in this area that many of the folks who are housed uh, at the Fulton County Jail facility are actually eligible for pad services and by that I mean these are individuals who are nonviolent some of them uh, these are non felony issues these are often failure to appears uh, in addition to individuals who are waiting for sub specialty supportive housing such as mental health beds drug and alcohol treatment or either a competency evaluation and so for this reason, I, I don't believe that this particular piece of legislation resolves the challenges that are before us. Again, I thank you, Council Member Bunn, uh, for moving and putting the legislation forward. I just believe that a work session would be in order uh, in addition to uh, some type of oversight committee uh, that would vet which individuals would uh, be housed at this facility. And so for that reason, I rise in strong opposition uh, to moving this forward today. Thank you, Councilmember Voigt. Councilmember Bakhtiari. Thank you. Um, so I first want to preface this by saying that um, I have a great deal of respect for our administration, for our mayor, for the for my colleagues that introduced this legislation. I just I believe that good governance is asking a number of questions before we enter into something that has been discussed at this point. I feel like. Uh, for decades, you heard some of the folks say today that overcrowding has been an issue at Fulton County. Um, some have said, you know, for 10 years, we know it's been happening for decades, for far longer than that. But there are a number of questions I still do not, I, f I feel like this conversation has been um, entirely anecdotal and there's been no justifying data. I've toured the facility. I know that it's in terrible, in terrible condition. I understand all that. To me, that does not mean that you add more beds and increase jail size to address an incarceral issue, to address over incarceration. Instead, I mean, I still have not seen evidence um, provided as to how Fulton County has demonstrated that they've attempted to address overcrowding. I still don't know how many cells are being leased at Cobb County and why that hasn't addressed the problem. I still don't understand uh, when people detained at Rice Street would actually be moved because this IGA, after looking at it, if Rice Street is such an issue and overcrowding there is such an issue, then why is priority being given to Union City over Rice Street first? I don't understand if, if overcrowding at Rice Street is such an issue, why are they not first being addressed in the IGA? Um, in in addition, there are multiple other partners in metro areas that could be utilized for this partnership from Cobb, Gwinnett, DeKalb, Clayton, East Point. Um, I still don't understand the full assessment of the people being incarcerated at Fulton and why. Um, how many people are being detained because they are indigent and cannot afford to pay their fines or afford bonds. How many homeless people cannot provide an address and so therefore oftentimes when you're going before a judge an address has to be provided in order for your case to be heard. We know, I know that there is a backlog with judges 
much as hearing these cases. I know that that's a big issue and that is not entirely on Fulton County. But these are some of the questions that have to be answered before entering into such an agreement. I still don't understand how many people are incarcerated on technical violations for missing a meeting with a parole officer. How many people are incarcerated for low-level offenses. How many people are being held because of potential mental illness or developmental disability because I know our familiar faces program isn't being followed, followed to the letter of the law. APD is the highest arresting agency in Fulton County and what percentage of those currently being arrested by APD are not being diverted to PAD. In June there were only 25 diversions from APD to PAD and I know that we're going to say it's because PAD is not 24-7 but it seems as though to address that we shouldn't be moving towards making, we should be doing exactly what Councilmember Waits has put forward in order, I mean this presentation, Councilmember, is beautiful and we can do both. And so anyways, the point is in all of this, I think that to the council member's point, rushing into this, I mean the Justice Policy Board, I think, should be charged with implementing a jail review committee that takes 90 days to assess the people being held so that we know who can be diverted out and who can be held. It's extra work, but we can do all of this. I don't see, I don't see why we can't, I don't understand what the rush is at this point. And Justice Policy Board is co-chaired by our, by our PSLA chair. It's a perfect opportunity to take a deeper dive and to do an assessment of the people being held because I do not think that we have, a, a, I still, we still don't have data, a full data justifying the situation. And also for the fact that the IGA discusses going over the four year mark, and the $150 that would be put up by Fulton County, I think the city needs to put up matching funds because it needs to hurt us too. We need to have, the city will just continue making money off of incarceration, which to me is abhorrent. So if to, to push for there to be, to push for us to get out of this agreement at the end of the four years, the city should also have to put up matching, matching funds from the general fund to ensure we actually exit this agreement if it does go forward. It shouldn't just hurt Fulton, it should hurt us too. So Councilmember Bakhtiari, any other? Councilmember Bach. Well, just briefly, I uh, just want to speak to my <coughs> colleagues, and I appreciate your statements and appreciate your um, comments. Uh, but, you know, this has gone on longer than just the two weeks that this legislation has been introduced. You know, uh, a year ago, more than a year ago, a year and, a, and two months ago, the uh, city council uh, put in a resolution requiring that if the mayor didn't come to an agreement with Fulton County about the overcrowding, uh, that the city of Atlanta 100% contributes to, that the, the council will act and we, we'd have a contract. The mayor asked for, the mayor at that time asked for a couple of more weeks and nothing ever happened. They didn't do anything. They just let it lie while citizens of Atlanta who are accused of crimes, who were arrested uh, by APD, uh, sleep on the floors and exist in abhorrent conditions. Now the, the story of the jail is a long one. Uh, the story of ACDC is a long one. Uh, but as I've remark to those who made this excellent presentation today, they actually made the case for why we need to do this. Because the past sheriffs have not been able to address the issue. They do not control the budget at Fulton County, so they can't, they don't control their own budget. They have to go to the commissioners to control their own budgets. So it's well established that the issues at Fulton County have languished They've not been addressed effectively, or they've been only addressed uh, incompletely. And so those of us who live and exist in Atlanta, which is almost 90% in Fulton County, we're not getting away clean by pointing a finger at Fulton County and saying, hey, you need to solve this problem. We're a part of that problem. You know, we're funding what goes on at Fulton County. We're represented by those past commissioners, or have been represented by those past commissioners that did nothing. And so the, at the end of the day, it is the, the human element that screams out. There is an old African proverb that says, when elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. 
the people who are on the floor in the boats, who are in the system over there at Fulton County, they are the ones who are suffering. Now, of course, uh, there are only about 1,300 beds in ACDC. This is about half of them. Uh, this is not going to solve every problem in Fulton County. But it will, it will provide a bomb for some to get out of those conditions, at least during the periods that the Fulton County can get organized. They can begin to plan and build their facility. Uh, that they, Everyone now agrees that they uh, need and that the commissioners that are there today say that they're going to support. And so delaying it, though there should be more conversation, that, you know, we, we can continue to have conversations with our partners at Fulton County, but we desperately need to act. We're in a position to solve a problem or solve the conditions of some at Fulton County. We should immediately do that. And that's what I'm asking the committee to do today. Any other speakers before I move back to Councilmember Waits? Councilmember Waits? Mr. Chair, I'm not going to belabor the hour tonight. Uh, again, I think many of us have made our decisions. But I also think given the financial implications of this legislation, it would be important to have this legislation vetted by the Finance Committee. And I'm surprised that did not happen. And lastly, there are 108 um, sworn men and women that serve in the current Atlanta Detention Center. I have not seen anything in terms of what the plans are for them and their careers, uh, given the years that they've dedicated to the city of Atlanta. So I would also like hope at least that we would be able to answer many of the questions that were raised here today uh, in terms of how we address the existing staff that serve in that facility, given that the facility will be le leased, uh, to my understanding, to Fulton County. And also, too, uh, to speak to the financial implications. And so for that reason, again, I rise to suggest uh, for a work session uh, to work through some of these challenges. And uh, again, it is my hope at that time some of the questions uh, that Council Member Batiari has raised, or concerns rather, uh, that we'll, we can address those at that time. Thank you, Council Member Waits. Any other speakers? Council Member Batiari? Um, and I'll try to be as quick as possible. One, I want to say there's been a lot of words like humane thrown around. I want us to address the fact that there is no such thing as humanely caging a person. So yes, there are better conditions. They are not humane. Uh, secondly, again, I second Councilmember Waits's what she has put forth. I mean, there are, as I said before, no justifying data, all anecdotal. I understand, I understand, I understand that Rice Street is abhorrent conditions. I get that. But to me, a shortcut is extending and giving more beds to what is already a crisis rather than properly vetting and understanding why people are being incarcerated in the first place. There is a possibility that I don't see a need to rush. We, three months is not four years. Taking three months, Georgia Justice Project has already promised three full-time employees to address this and comb through the jail's logs to find out to address the questions that I have put forth and the concerns that have been brought forth and that my constituents in my district whom I represent have brought to me. So to that point, um, I echo a work session and also uh, confused as to why this was not dual referred, but um, I yield my time. Thank you. All right, any other speakers? All right, we have a motion on the floor for approval from Councilmember Vaughn to second by Councilmember Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Oh. Right, five yeas, one nay. The item is favorable. On substitute. Next is item number five. 22R 
A resolution by Council Member Byron Amos authorizing the mayor or his designee to extend the term of FC-7522 inmate pharmacy services on behalf of the Department of Corrections with Correct RX Pharmacy Services Incorporated on a month-to-month -month basis effective August 11th, 2022 and continuing on a monthly basis for a period not to exceed 12 months in an amount not to exceed $350,000 and zero cents. All costs shall be charged to and paid from the accounts listed herein and for other purposes. There is a request to file this paper. Yes, yeah, my okay. understanding, Department of Law is request to file the paper. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. That item is filed. Moving on to item 7, 22R4034. A resolution by Councilmember Andrea L. Boone authorizing the reemployment of City of Atlanta Department of Corrections employee Stephanie Scruggs, Revenue Collection Supervisor under Section 3-505A of the Charter of the City of Atlanta and for other purposes. Motion approved. Motion to approve by Councilmember Boone. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Vaughn. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 68 0 nays. That item is favorable. We go on to item number eight. A resolution by Council Members Antonio Lewis, Jason H. Winston, Jason Dozier, and Liliana Battiari encouraging youth entrepreneurship by requesting that the mayor or his designee review existing regulations requiring any licensing, permitting, or payment of fees for youth under the age of 14 and a half to legally operate a temporary, temporary vending stand on private property to report findings and recommendations removing burdensome requirements to the city of Atlanta, to the city council within 30 days and for other purposes. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. Please vote. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. That item is favorable. Moving on to item 9, 22R4039. A resolution by council members Antonio Lewis, Keisha Sean Waits, Michael Julian Bond, Jason H. Winston, Jason Dozier, Andrea L. Boone, and Marcy Collier Overstreet, requesting that during the 2023 session of the General Georgia General Assembly, the General Assembly vet local governments, including counties and municipalities, with the specific authority to utilize their police powers in order to enact regulations of retail gas stations, service stations, and convenience stores to require installation of surveillance cameras and to require integration of cameras to the local police departments, public safety program networks, and for other purposes. Make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Boone. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. Item number 10, 22R4043. A resolution by Council Member Keisha Sean Waits requiring the City of Atlanta to commission an independent appraisal of the Atlanta City Detention Center to determine the true market value of the building and property in order to make informed decisions regarding the highest and best use of the asset and funds allocated to operations at the site, and to identify funding for the creation of a center for equity as suggested in the final feasibility report of the re reimagining ACDC task force and for other purposes. Waits. Motion approved by Council Member Waits. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Amos. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Wait, 
three A's, three abstentions. Uh, item has failed for lack of uh, uh, four votes. Um, I will make a motion to, what is your pleasure? First, Council Member Waits, I'll make a motion to hold. I'd, I'd like to speak to the bill, sir. Okay, go ahead. I think given the value of the asset that we're debating today, I think it's worth the public's time to have a conversation surrounding what the building is actually worth and to have a conversation surrounding its best use. And so aside from Council Member Bunn's uh, legislation, uh, which I support the spirit and intent, I think it's reckless and irresponsible to not have a conversation surrounding what the actual commodity is worth uh, with respect to value and its best use, which is what this particular piece of legislation does. It doesn't have anything to do with policy or, or use of the building for an equity center or anything of that nature, or leasing the space, if you will. But I do believe uh, that it is reasonable to uh, make an assessment or at least have determined what this actual piece of property uh, is valued at today, uh, given the market. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councilman Waitson. I was just reminded that it's automatically held since there was a lack of four votes. Yes, sir. Moves us to item number 1122R4044. Mr. Chair, there is an amendment that will remove one of the sponsors. Okay. A resolution uh, by a resolution by Council Members Keisha Sean Waits authorizing the mayor or his designee to repurpose the Atlanta City Detention Center into a separate diversion and crisis support center to include mental health, drug, alcohol treatment services, space for nonprofit service providers, space for a warrant clearing center, space for job training facilities, low barrier shelter, shelter, sheltering, and offer transitional housing, and to name the center the John Robert Lewis Center for Equity and for other purposes. Thank you. And that amendment is to remove sponsor Anto or co-sponsor Antonio Brown, or excuse me, Antonio Lewis. I will make that motion to amend. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Norwood. Please the vote is vote. open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, one nay. It is amended and before us, Council Member Waits. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. So this piece of legislation actually has a conversation surrounding what happens after the lease uh, agreement that's been approved here today. And it's my belief that if there's any sincerity uh, with respect to the administration, then certainly we would have a discussion surrounding what happens next. And I think to wait uh, a period of four years uh, to have that conversation or any period of time, again, would not be in the best interest of the individuals that we uh, speak that we are interested in serving today. And so for that reason, I ask for your favorable support to repurpose this facility uh, into its intent, into uh, the previous legislation that's been supported by our previous administrations, including uh, the mayor uh, of the city who previously held the post three seats. So for that reason, I ask for your favorable support. Thank you. Right. Any other comments? Do I can make a council member bond? Well, I'm just going to speak briefly. I've mentioned this in my comments earlier today. But the previous administration has already studied what would happen with this building. It would, they estimated in January of 2018 that it would take $120 million to convert this building into anything else. They set up citizens on a mission to fail uh, with a study group six months later. Those citizens came back with four recommendations to turn this building into anything else, each one ever increasingly back up to $120 million uh, for any type of uh, revisions. You know, it was built to be a jail. You know, it's a jail. And I, I understand the symbolism of trying to convert it. That idea came from New York uh, when they had the hurricane in New York and it damaged the women's prison in New York. Uh, but that building was deemed, it couldn't, you couldn't put human beings in that, be in that building anymore because of the damage. Uh, but then New York 
turn that building into something else, uh, another uh, some type of service center. But New York still turned around and built four more jails. Uh, you know, as long as the Atlanta Police Department exists, we're going to have a need for a jail. Uh, the Reed administration did a study on uh, and calculated how many arrests are made uh, by a standing police force. And at that time, it was 1,500 officers. Uh, this current mayor's uh, goal is to bring on 300 or 250 by the end of the year. Uh, experts have said within the last 20 years that we really need over 2,300 police officers. If we don't at least avail ourselves of some of the space that we already own, uh, if we get to the goal of hiring 2,000 police officers again, uh, we'll go from owning uh, our own facility and saving money to having to pay someone else to hold our arrestees. And you don't want a sheriff of a county uh, being responsible to hold all those detainees because a sheriff could refuse to take our municipal arrestees. And if they refuse to take our municipal arrestees, that means that every person who gets arrested in our jurisdiction gets a state charge. So I'm not going to vote against you. I'm going to abstain, you know. But I just want to put it out there that when people think that Atlanta could, quote, unquote, go out of the jail business, I mean, unless you're going to go out of the police business, you know, that's just never going to happen. And, you know, you have a jail, you know, in much the same logic that you have a fire station. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the lowest fire rate uh, in the history of the city of Atlanta. You have fire stations just in case, you know, there's a fire or emergency. The, the jail follows the same logic. You have a place to detain people who break the law, uh, and don't subject to the jurisdiction of the court, just in case. And you know you're going to have police, they're going to arrest people. You know, you're going to always have to have some place to put them. Councilmember Bond, uh, any others uh, before we go back to Councilmember Waits? Uh, I will speak, um, and then we'll get to Councilmember Waits, but I, you know, support the, the intent of the legislation, but I don't support much to Councilmember Bond's points converting a jail into this type of facility. Uh, we're doing doing that somewhat right now with, you know, the Justice Policy Board was mentioned earlier, which I co-chair with Judge McBurney, the Fulton County Superior Court. Uh, but it's my belief that, you know, as Councilmember Bond stated, the city is always going to need a jail. And number two, uh, our former planning commissioner, Keene, evaluated this facility because what could it be repurposed for and the conclusion was it could be a jail um, council member waits and i uh, visited with the justice policy board tucson and they built an awesome facility which i would love to have here in atlanta for these services but they issued a bond for that it's uh, many hundreds of millions of dollars uh, of a facility and that's what these services uh, and these people that need those services deserve is their own facility uh, that's built specifically for them because most of the people that this uh, type institution would serve is people that have been in this jail before. And I just feel that that's, you know, there's some stigma tied to that when they're going back into the facility that jailed them and they're supposed to get, you know, helpful services there. So um, definitely support, again, the chair of the Justice Policy Board as being the chair of this committee and support these services and expanding those services. But I want to move in a direction of working with Fulton County uh, to uh, look into building uh, our own facility dedicated to these uh, very special and needed services. Thank you. Council Member Waits, back to you. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Final thought. I think that the, the whole purpose of the Equity Center is to address some of the needs uh, that create and lead to violent crime. And I think uh, 
this particular proposal will lead in that direction. And finally, I want to speak to the funding piece. We've had a number of businesses and corporations that have signed on that agree uh, that locking up and detaining people clearly is not working, nor is it effective. And lastly, Mr. Chair, I, I want to call a point of order. I, I remember very early on trying to abstain from several pieces of legislation to which I was advised that that was not possible. So can you explain to me the process for abstaining uh, with respect to a vote? At committee, you can abstain for anything you want to and not have to give a reason for it. If you abstain in full counsel, okay. you have to have a either a personal uh, tie or a financial uh, tie to the legislation to be able to abstain and you have to fill out a form for that. But in committee, you can abstain from anything for any reason and not state that reason. Thank you, sir. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Amos. Just want to speak to the legislation and be clear so there, there's no missed messages. I believe the city of Atlanta need a jail, but I also believe in this legislation and this legislation I believe starts a conversation a conversation that we can attempt to find money I know it'll be massive but it at least starts a conversation so uh, I will be supporting this but I want to be clear and I even asked the sponsor of this legislation um, at the end of the day um, will there still be some type of detention space in this building that we're envisioning for these services so I just want to Put that on the record so I see different votes taking place so my constituents will be clear where I stand. So I just want to say that. Thank you, Councilmember Ramos. Councilmember Bond. And just to follow up on the point that you made and uh, the, the earlier legislation about that was held about the value of the building, you know, this building is used as collateral for bond issuance. It was used as collateral to build the uh, police and fire headquarters. So there is a path to float a bond uh, to build a facility to have these services. I've said from day one when the conversation came up to convert the jail to something else that I support all those services. I support that mission. I just don't support it at the jail. And so, I mean, there is a way to float a bond. I think it's called, what is it, the... Uh, the public safety, there's a commission that we appoint people to. There's an authority that oversees and issues the bonds that built uh, the Atlanta, the, the fire and police headquarters, and I think they're going to be a part of the bond issuance for uh, the training center down on Key Road. So there is a path to build a facility through a public bond uh, using those buildings, or this building in particular, as collateral. And, of course, you'd have to know the value of it to use it as collateral. Are there any other questions or comments? All right, we have a motion to approve on the floor. Made by Councilmember Boyce, and I believe it was seconded by Councilmember Amos. Is that correct, Councilmember Amos? Please prepare the vote. The vote is out there. The vote is closed. Right. Motion is not carried. Two yeas, one nay, three abstentions. That item will be held automatically in committee. Next is 22R4045, item number 12. Okay. A, resol a resolution by Councilmember Dustin Hillis amending resolution 21R3869 adopted by the Atlanta City Council on October 4th, 2021, establishing the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center Community Stakeholder Advisory Committee to amend the manner in which members may be appointed to the committee to allow for future appointees to be submitted in the form of a communication and confirmed by the Atlanta City Council and for other purposes. Well, thank you, colleagues. This is just a paper to make it easier uh, to appoint members of this committee by doing it as a communication instead of an ordinance. And so I'll make a motion to approve. Second by Councilmember Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. The A zero nays. That item is favorable. Moving on to item 13, 22R. 
a resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the City of Atlanta to enter into an agreement for IFB S1220215 on call post certified officers with Cloverhurst, Aaron JV, and Metropolitan Security Associates on behalf of the Department of Parks and Recreation in an amount not to exceed $750,000.00 annually and for other purposes. Make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Boone. Please prepare the vote. Mr. Chair, we need to make a motion to hold this paper. There is supposed to be an IPRO attached to it. Okay. I'll make a motion to hold then. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Bond. Please prepare the vote to hold. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Yeah, zero nays, I'm um, held. We will take items 14 through 18 and item number 20. As a block, as their settlements. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against defendant City of Atlanta in the case of Eddie Hewley versus City of Atlanta. Civil action file number 2021 CV 348903 pending in the Superior Court of Fulton County, Georgia in the amount of $22,500 dollars and zero cents authorizing the settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the accounts listed herein authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes a resolution by public safety and legal administration committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against defendant in the case of sandra lanier and james lanier versus city of atlanta civil action file number 19 ev 001407 pending in the state of the State Court of Fulton County of Georgia in the amount of $50,000.00, authorizing the settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the accounts listed herein, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against defendant in the case of Bernita Miller and Bianca Pache versus City of Atlanta City Action File Number 16 EV002636, pending in the State Court of Fulton County of Georgia, in the amount of $245,000.00, authorizing the settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the accounts listed herein, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against defendants in the case of Carlton Scott versus City of Atlanta, civil action file number 22MS161848, pending in the Magistrate Court of Fulton County of Georgia in the amount of $4,000.00, authorizing the settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the account numbers listed herein, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against defendant City of Atlanta in the case of John Vera versus City of Atlanta, civil action file number 19 EV005750, pending in the State Court of Fulton County, Georgia, in the amount of $9,500.00, authorizing the settlement amount to be charged to and paid from the account numbers listed herein the chief financial officer to distribute the settlement amount and for other purposes a resolution by public safety and legal administration committee authorizing the settlement of all claims against the defendants in the case of lewis osborne versus city of atlanta civil action file number 20 ev 002111 fulton state court in the amount of three hundred and fifty thousand dollars authorizing said amount to be paid from the account numbers listed herein authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the total settlement amount and for other purposes make a motion to approve those items is there a second Second by Council Member Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open.
The vote is closed. Yeah, zero nays. Those items are favorable. That brings us to item 19, which is 22R4154. If you go ahead and read that in. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of FMLA claims against the City of Atlanta in the case of Tamara Baines versus City of Atlanta, Georgia, and Robin Shahar in her individual capacity. Civil action file number 119CV00279, United States District Court, Northern District of Georgia, in the amount of $65,000, authorizing said amount to be paid to and from the account numbers listed herein, authorizing the chief financial officer to distribute the total settlement amount and for other purposes. All right. The Department of Law has requested an executive session on this. So, Ms. Robinson or Ms. Hickson, if you could state the reason for an executive session. Yes, the um, executive session is for the purpose to dis of discussing um, pending litigation. Thank you. I'll make a motion to enter into an executive session to discuss pending litigation. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Boone. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. 68, zero nays. We will enter into executive session in committee room two. Is that okay? Good. Um, and given the late hour, we have coordinated dinners, box dinners, so feel free to grab uh, some food on your way to executive session.
right. I will make a motion to come out of executive session. Is there a second? No. Second by Councilmember Norwood. Please prepare the vote. <clears throat> the vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. That item is approved. Colleagues, we're going to go back to the park security paper. If you can remind me what item number that is. Item number 13. Okay. Um, I'm going to make a motion to reconsider that as we have received the IPRO report, so we're going to consider it, amend, attach the IPRO, and uh, go from there. So I'll make a motion to reconsider. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. For you. Five yeas, zero nays. Item is reconsidered and before us, I will make a motion to amend to attach the IPRO report. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Bond. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. IBA zero nays. Item is amended to attach the IPRO. I'll make a motion to approve as amended. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Norwood. Please prepare the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Mr. Chair, this will also be referred to CDHS. Say that one more time. This will be referred to CDHS. This okay, item. thank you. Yes, five yeas, zero nays. That item is approved as amended. Is it, was it already referred to CDHS or do we need to make that motion? It was already referred. Okay. Well, colleagues, I believe that completes our legislative agenda. Oh, I thought we... Number 19, item number 19. Okay, I thought we had already... Never mind. <clears throat> I still have to approve item number 19, which we have the executive session on, 22R4154. Uh, just go ahead and read that back in for the record, please. A resolution by Public Safety and Legal Administration Committee authorizing the settlement of FMLA claims against the City of Atlanta in the case of Tamara Baines versus City of Atlanta, Georgia, and Robin Shahar in her individual capacity. Civil action file number 119CV00279, United States District Court, Northern District of Georgia, in the amount of $65,000, authorizing said amount to be paid from the account numbers listed herein, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to distribute the total settlement amount and for other purposes. Make a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second by Council Member Boone. Please provide the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. IBA zero nays, that item is favorable. Now I've carefully looked over my agenda and I believe that now completes our legislative items. Anyone with any general comments? Good Council night. Member Bond. <laughs> Just one announcement. The Hello Fresh Grab and Go this week will take place August the 10th at 3 p.m. at the Harriet G. Darnell Senior Center in West Atlanta at 677. Fairburn Road in partnership with us will be Commissioner Natalie Hall and Sheriff Pat Labot. Uh, yeah, I have a, a, a digital flyer I can send to you. Yeah, I'll send it to you. All right, so thank you, Councilman Labot. No prerequisite to get the help. See you there on 3 p.m. on, on uh, Wednesday. Thank you, Councilman Labot. All with right. That, that completes our committee meeting. We are adjourned by unanimous consent of members present. <laughs>